A Ring for Christmas, written by Josephine Bintema, narrated by Josephine Bintema. A Ring for Christmas, written by Josephine Bintema, narrated by Josephine Bintema. Chapter One. Elle wiped whipped cream off her blouse and wished she had taken the time to put on an apron. She twisted the bag again and this time piped the cream perfectly onto the dessert. A little cinnamon was added and the rice pudding was ready. A bell was going off and a voice cried out in heavy Spanish, Table four. This was ridiculous. It was too busy and they could use another server to help out. She pushed her raven hair that had fallen out of her bun back behind her ears, grabbed the puddings and pie, distributing them among table eight. She promised refills on coffee and then raced back to the kitchen. There was a moment of confusion as she had to separate table four's order from table one's. This was a waste of time. She had no idea how her parents dealt with this. Of course, there was two of them, and only one of her. Plus, she was out of practice. She hadn't worked at her parents' diner in years. She served tables four and one in a rush, accidentally bumping into someone. He grabbed her shoulders to steady her. Elle looked up into brown eyes, curly black hair in need of a cut, a trim black beard, and a mesmerizing smile. He was a heartbreaker for sure. Sorry, I didn't mean to bump into you. That's okay. He had a sexy voice to match. No harm done. She edged around him and acknowledged that the coffee pot was coming to table eight. She needed help. Elle burst into the kitchen. Polly, is there any way you can help out front? I know you have some waiting experience. Who will bust tables and do the dishes? Polly asked. Did Aurora ever say when she was going to be back? She asked in exasperation. Aurora was one of the waitresses. She tended to be unreliable. Elle wondered when her parents would get around to firing the girl. Polly rolled his eyes. Your guess is as good as mine. Elle turned to Ramos. Me put his head here? Ramos shook his head and explained in Spanish that he was just a cook. Elle threw her hands in the air and grabbed the coffee pot. She began making the rounds. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw the stranger that she had bumped into perusing the job board that her parents kept up at the back of the diner. It was a great way to get customers in and it helped out the community. Maybe she should advertise for a waiter on it. She looked at the guy and thought that she had seen him before. He must have been in to check the board multiple times. Miss, could we see your dessert menu? An elderly lady tugged down her sleeve. Elle forced a smile. Sure, I'll have it to you in just a moment. Forget advertising. She needed someone now, before she lost her mind. Elle marched up to the handsome stranger and put out her hand in greeting. Hi, I'm Elle, and we're hiring. Do you have any experience bussing tables and doing dishes? Can you start immediately? I'm Max, he said as he took her hand. He had a nice handshake. Yes, to starting immediately. No, I have no experience in bussing or dishes, but I promise I learn very quickly. If you don't like my work, you can always fire me. Elle decided to take a chance. She liked his smile. Too bad, when she shook his hand, she didn't feel a single thing. No thrill, no desire, not even a twinge that said that he could be the one. Her mother always told her to wait for the man who made her heart sing. She was still waiting. You're hired. You can start now. Elle walked briskly to the kitchen. Polly will show you what to do. Polly, this is Max. Start him on dishes, then you can bus and help me. Once he has the hang of that, we'll put him on bussing tables. If Polly or Ramos had any reservations about the idea, they didn't say. Polly began training with Max, intently listening. Al had a good feeling about this. Hopefully, in the next couple of days, things would calm down with an extra person to help. Ma'am, could we get the bill, please? Al nodded and promised it would be coming right up. Fifty-eight days until her parents returned from their trip back to the old country. Fifty-eight days to try and hold on to her sanity before her life returned to normal. Miss, the coffee? Elle gritted her teeth. She was not meant to be running a restaurant. Her parents had named the place after her, hoping one day she would take over. Instead, she worked hard to get a degree at the local college. She was now a nutritionist at the local hospital. She had a good job. However, to help out her parents, she was using up all her vacation, plus a few weeks of extra leave, to cover for them while they were on a vacation. It was their first vacation in twenty years, so Elle felt that she had to fill in the gap. Running a restaurant was more than just a full-time job. 
The next time she went into the kitchen, she found Ramos laughing at Max. She asked the cook what he found so funny. Ramos replied in Spanish that the new hire was just learning that things have to be woman-clean, not man-clean, before they go into the dishwasher. Otherwise the food became like cement on the pots and pans. Yeah, well, who knew dishwashers didn't really wash dishes, Max replied in Spanish. He was hunched over the sink and scrubbing a pan. They wash dishes just fine, Polly dumped another tote full of dishes and cutlery from the restaurant. He exchanged his dirty rag for a clean one, slinging it over his shoulder. Just make sure you get all the food off. I promise I have learned that lesson. Max scrubbed harder. The dishwasher chimed, and he put the pot back in to soak before unloading and reloading the dishwasher. At least he had time management skills, El thought. Ramos dished up table seven, and El balanced the pellets on her arms and headed out into the restaurant. Even with the new help, it was still too much. They were behind. She could use another set of hands for food prep. El hurried her steps and did the best she could. Fortunately, they were going to make great tips. El, dearie. Thelma, an elderly regular, grabbed her by the sleeve. Who is the hunky guy you brought into the kitchen? El laughed. The seniors were always her favorite. They had reached a point in life where they just said what they thought. That's Max. He's learning how to wash dishes. Well, he can wash dishes at my house any day, Thelma tittered. I'll tell him that, El grinned. Oh, don't you dare. Thelma blushed and tittered some more. You bad girl. El winked and then returned to working. Maybe there were some things about working at the diner that she did miss. However, her sore feet was not one of them. By the end of the night, it looked like their new employee had managed to master the dishwasher. He no longer burned his hands or did a half-job at pre-washing. Al was relieved. Bussing tables was the easy part as long as he continued to have good time management skills. Things should be easier tomorrow, which was good because her feet were killing her. She counted out the bank deposit for the night as Polly and Max wiped down tables and chairs, refilled napkins, checked salt and pepper shakers. Ramos cleaned the kitchen, shining it to perfection as always. As they wrapped it up, Ramos and Polly left. Max lingered. Did you need anything else? I think we're done here, Elf said. Payday is Thursdays. You'll get your first check next week. If you can be here for the meal rushes, you've got the job. She outlined the times and gave him some paperwork to fill out. Thank you, El, Max said. I really appreciate this chance. I should warn you, it's probably only temporary. I don't actually run the diner. It's my parents' business. When they come back from their trip abroad, they'll determine for certain if you stay. When do they come back? Max asked. Two months, just in time for Christmas, El said. Well, I'll just have to do what I can to make sure you give me a good reference, Max smiled. Good night, El. Good night, Max. El watched him leave. It was too bad he didn't cause any sparks for her. Of course, she hadn't kissed him yet, so there was still a chance, El reflected. She finished locking up and took the bank deposit to drop off on her way home. Noah finally had a lead on his brother Max. For the past year, he googled, called hospitals, checked with all the friends his brother had, and more. His brother had been gone for three years. Three years was a long time. He thought Max would have stopped being angry and reached out to him a while ago. He'd given his younger brother time to cool off. However, when Max didn't call, Noah decided he would reach out to him. The whole estrangement had started when the family company, Ramsley Pharmaceuticals, had released a drug that was supposed to help diabetic children metabolize food sugars, thus lessening the need for insulin. Instead, the drug had been fast-tracked through some clinical trials and had serious side effects, including permanently damaging livers and kidneys. The children who had been on the drug were irreparably damaged. Noah, thankfully, hadn't been involved in the testing of that particular drug. He worked as a scientist at Ramsley Pharma. Max had worked lobbying the FDA and politicians to gain approval to push marketing and production forward on a wide variety of products that Ramsley Pharma produced. He had helped get the drug to market, unknowing of its side effects, until it was too late. When the parents of the children effect came together to create a class action lawsuit against Ramsley Pharmaceuticals, Michael, their older brother, and the legal team had fought against the lawsuit and won. Max had accused David, their father and head of the company, of falsifying evidence, changing clinical trial results, and bribing the judge. Noah wouldn't have put it past his father to have done so. 
As it was, Max cashed in all of his stocks and started a fund to help pay for the medical care of all the children who had been affected by the Ramsley Pharma's bad drug. He had felt responsible. More than that, it was personal since their cousin Dylan's girl Shannon had been on the drug and was experiencing the same devastating side effects that the other children had. Dylan and Max had been friends for a long time. When David found out about the fund, he flipped. He had been adamant that Max dissolved the fund as it left the company open to possible liability. Max refused. David fired Max and made sure he was blacklisted by every company Ramsley Pharma had influence in. He refused to speak to Max, cutting him off and doing everything just short of denying his last-born son's existence. Noah could still remember the long argument between father and sons. Max had stormed out that day, and none of the Ramsleys had seen him since. Now Noah finally had a lead on his brother. He sat across from Michael, in Michael's office, waiting to hear his response for what he had found out. Noah, Max is thirty-five years old. He's quite capable of taking care of himself, Michael admonished quietly. Really? Because I found out he's living at a men's shelter, Noah said angrily. He sat heavily in the chair across from Michael and glared at him balefully across the large desk. Sometimes I wonder if you even care. Michael looked at his brother in surprise. Why would you even say that? Of course I care. You never ask about Max. You've never bothered to even search for him. I come here to tell you what I've found out, and you just mildly tell me to mind my own business, Noah explained with a little sarcasm. I wonder how I might think your feelings to be lacking. Michael sighed. He was getting a headache. He got up and grabbed an envelope out of his safe, tossing it on the desk in front of Noah. I know exactly where Max is, and what he's up to. I've known the entire time. I knew when he sold the condo, the jag, and that he sold everything except the season tickets to the Yankees. You would have been better off to find him there had you merely thought about it. Noah took the envelope. It had numerous pictures of their brother over the last three years. Dates and locations were written on the back. There were short reports of what Max was up to. You've had him followed? Private investigator, Michael clarified. You're as bad as Dad, Noah declared. Michael was startled. He had no idea that Noah knew that their father was constantly spying on nearly everyone with private investigators. You know? <laughs> that Dad spies on us? Yes, Noah said darkly. How do you think he convinced me to work as a scientist here at Ramsley Pharma when I had a chance to have my own lab at Yale? He blackmailed you. What with? Michael asked grimly. Noah shook his head. Doesn't matter. Besides, working here has turned out better than I thought it would. You know that he wants you to take over the entire laboratory division, Michael asked. I'm okay with taking over the laboratory division. Granted, it's not the career that I would normally choose for myself, but if I can prevent another bad drug from being pushed out for profit, I will, Noah declared firmly. Steps have been taken to try to ensure that it doesn't happen again. It's up to you if you want the position or not. Michael put the envelope back in the safe. As for Max, I'm not worried about him. He camped on the dunes in the Sahara. He's backpacked in the Andes. He stayed in hostels in Europe. He'll be fine in a shelter. He's chosen to put every dime he has into that fund of his rather than use it on himself. It's rather noble. It's foolhardy. Noah ran a hand through his hair. Who knows what sort of people are in that shelter? There could be a sociopath or two. Michael sat back down, mildly remarking, It's quite likely. Noah gave him an incredulous look. You're not exactly making me feel better. It's also likely that we currently employ at least eight sociopaths right here at corporate headquarters. They make up 2% of the population. However, not all sociopaths are killers, so I'm sure we'll be fine. Privately, Michael thought that their father could be one of them. Is that your idea of a joke? Noah asked. It's not funny. You worry too much. I know that you and Max are very close since you're only two years apart, but he's a grown man. He's okay, Michael tried to reassure him. Noah threw his hands up in the air. I don't know what to do with you. I'm going to see Max, really see him and talk to him, not just spy on him. Good, Michael said. I think you should. What about you? Are you coming with? Noah asked pointedly. Not yet, Michael responded. Anne, Michael's secretary, knocked on the glass office door. 
At Michael's nod, she came in. Your father would like you to go to his office, Michael. Thank you, Anne, Michael replied. She came forward and laid a couple of files on his desk. I thought he might want to talk to you about the Desmond lawsuit. I pulled the files just in case, she said. Michael gave her a small smile, and she left. Noah stood abruptly. He'd had enough of this. I'm really disappointed in you, Michael. He walked towards the door, but Michael's voice stopped him. Noah, wait. Michael pinched the bridge of his nose, then rubbed his eyes against the headache that was blooming. He sighed and lowered his hand. Max probably thinks that I sided with Dad. I wanted to pull the drug in a much slower, press-friendly way that would keep the company's reputation intact. Max wanted everything done immediately at the time. If I show up with you, he's likely to turn both of us away. If you go, the two of you have always been closer. You played together. You were nearly the same age, had similar interests. He'll be angry, but he'll accept you. It's not that I don't want to talk to him, to see him, to make sure he's all right. I just don't think that he's going to want to see me. It's best if you go alone. Noah nodded and folded his arms. He didn't like it, but he understood Michael's reasoning. There's a restaurant near the shelter. It's called L's Place. The private investigator thinks he's recently gotten a job there. A job? At a restaurant? Noah asked. It was a far step down from what their brother had been previously doing, lobbying the FDA and politicians on behalf of Ramsey Pharmaceuticals. You're kidding. You know that Dad had Max blacklisted from a number of career positions with his colleagues, Michael asked. He didn't agree with what his father had done, but as head of Ramsey Pharma, the old man had wielded a lot of power and did things that sometimes Michael couldn't undo. I know, but a restaurant? Noah shook his head. Surely there was something better he could do. It's a tough job market, and since it's nearly winter, he was laid off from the demolition job he had, Michael said simply. Go see him. Don't offer him any money, though. Noah was surprised at Michael's warning. He's my brother. He's working at a restaurant and living in a men's shelter. If you don't think that I'm going to offer him money, you're out of your mind. Noah, every man has his pride. If you want him to talk to you ever again, you'll leave your wallet at home. Michael shrugged. Make a contribution to his fund, but not to him. Noah grimaced. They both knew that the fund was underfunded. Max was channeling every penny that he earned into it, but those kids needed expensive medical care. Fine. Have you made any contributions lately? The company that bought Max's shares donates every three months, Michael said mildly. I asked if you did, not some company that profiteered off of Max's bad decision to sell his shares, Noah glared at his brother. Noah, I put the money under the company that bought out Max. If anyone had bothered to check, it's a dummy company in Max's name, so that he still retains ownership of his shares. Noah was surprised was a lot of money, and Michael had basically just contributed a huge amount to Max's benefit fund while protecting Max's stock in the company. I'm sorry, Michael, I didn't know. No one does, Michael sighed. It's better that they don't. For both our sakes, please don't tell Dad. I won't, Noah quickly agreed. He could imagine the repercussions that might happen. Thank you, Michael said. He grabbed the files and stood. You'll tell me how Max is? Yeah. Noah nodded. I will. I had better go before Dad gets impatient, Michael grimaced. You know how he can be. Noah nodded. Their father was not the most patient in men. He watched Michael leave the office and debated on the approach he should take to contact Max. He decided it wasn't much of a patient man either. He would just confront Max directly and see what happened. It didn't take long to get to the restaurant that Michael had mentioned Max might be working at. It was in a crowded downtown area with limited parking. The place was small, but had a lot of customers. Noah was lucky to find a table, and he ordered a coffee. It was obvious that he annoyed the waitress by taking up an entire table for one cup of coffee, but now that he was here, he had no intention of giving up his seat. There was no sign of Max, but Noah intended to wait and see what happened. He took out his phone and began sorting through emails while waiting. If nothing happened, then he'd talk to the waitress, asking if she had seen Max. He had some old photos still on the phone with his brother that he could show her to help identify who he was looking for. Max grabbed a tote in the kitchen and headed into the restaurant. He started clearing off tables, but abruptly stopped as he spied who was sitting at table five. 
He dumped the toad on an empty table, too, and stood, glaring down at his brother, arms crossed on top of his crisp white apron. Really, Noah? Noah looked up from his phone and set down his coffee, feigning surprise. Max! Max put up a hand to stop Noah. If you think, for one moment, that I am going to believe that this is a coincidence, you're out of your mind. You don't respond to my calls. You won't visit. I barely even found where you were. Noah complained, dropping the surprised act. I miss you, okay? You're my brother, and I'd like to be able to talk to you once in a while. Maybe catch a game or something. I don't have time for this. I'm working, Max said. He turned and grabbed the toad again, rubbing down the table with a rag. Hey, we can meet later, Noah said. I'm willing to meet you whenever you want. I just want to talk to you again. Max ignored him and picked up empty dishes from table seven. Come on, Max. You can't stay mad at me forever. I took your side, remember? Noah followed him around. I didn't see you leave the company, Max muttered. Noah ran a hand through his hair, frustrated. There was a reason for that. Maybe if you talked to me, I could explain. Is this guy bothering you? A woman asked Max. She had an apron on and a pen stuck in the bun in her hair. She was beautiful in an exotic way, with rich dark hair, deeply tanned skin, and eyes that slanted at the end. Noah recalled that she was the irritated waitress who had served him coffee. Him? Max scoffed. I'd have to care for him to annoy me. Max, that's not fair, Noah protested. I'm your brother. You care. I could have Ramos and Polly throw him out, she offered, eyeing Noah. Nah, I can take care of him, Max said. Seriously? Noah eyed Max. He had gained some muscle since they'd last met. In all our years, you haven't managed to best me yet. As I recall, you haven't been around for a couple of years. I've got new moves, Max declared. You're right. I haven't been around for a couple of years, Noah put out a hand. Come on, Max. Forgive me? Why did it take you this long? Max asked, ignoring the proffered hand. Hey, I'm not the one who changed my number. You could have called me at any time, Noah protested. Plus, you weren't exactly easy to track down. Max hesitated. You know you miss me too, Noah cajoled. That's not the point. You're supposed to have my back, and yet you still work for him. Max grabbed his tote and headed into the kitchen. Noah made to follow, but the raven-haired beauty stepped in front of him. Hi, my name is Elle. By health board regulations, you can't go into my kitchen since you are not in my employ. Please go back to your coffee and leave my employee alone. Hire me. Excuse me? Elle blinked in surprise. Look, lady. Noah fished out his wallet. I'll give you a thousand dollars to hire me. I'm not going to let my brother hide from me in the kitchen. Who carries a thousand dollars in their wallet? Elle wondered. She grabbed the cash. Done. You start tonight. Grab an apron. Pardon me? You're hired. I need a waiter, she smiled brilliantly at him. You can now bother Max every single break you get, but not during working hours, as I expect you to pull your weight. You work the same hours he does. It'll be great. I hope you wore comfortable shoes. I quit. She handed him back the money. I thought so. What does that mean? Noah demanded. You think you can just walk in, spread some cash, and get what you want? Elle tossed over her shoulder as she went into the kitchen. Everything worth having is much harder to get than that. Noah followed her into the kitchen. You don't know the situation. You're in my kitchen. Elle put her hands on her hips and glared at him. Get out before I call the police. <laughs> really, what are you going to ask them to charge me with? Noah rolled his eyes. Harassing my employee. Elle pointed to Max, who was loading the dishwasher, firmly ignoring them. Fine. Noah grabbed Elle's hand, causing it to tingle. He slapped the thousand into it. Show me where the aprons are. What do you mean, show you where the aprons are? Max asked suspiciously. I just got a job, Noah replied. No, Max said angrily. That is not happening. Tell me, you are not letting him work here. Elf smiled grimly. I need another person. If your brother can prove he's up for the challenge and master the job, then he can have it. If not, I'll fire him like any other employee. That's all I ask, Noah said. Tell me you're joking. You already have a job, Max growled. I won't talk to you, so what, now you're going to become my stalker? Whatever it takes, little brother, Noah looked at Elle. Aprons? Elle pushed her way out of the kitchen. 
Part of her thought she was out of her mind, getting between two brothers like this. It would probably backfire and she'd be out two workers in a dramatic fashion. Another part of her wanted to help reunite them. She always thought that family should stick together. She loved her parents and had hated being an only child. If she did get married, she'd have at least three children, maybe even four. She could imagine a rough and tumble boy with a couple of girls to dress up for church. Elle pulled herself away from her musings, giving Noah an apron. She showed him where he could store his suit jacket, then gave him a pen and order pad. She grabbed some menus, and he trailed her to a table. Hi, my name is Elle. While you look at the menu, what can I get for you to drink? Elle jotted down their drinks, found out if everything went on separate or the same bill, then put a number at the top of the order pad. She brought Noah back to the counter. The number is the table number. You'll find them tape on the corners of each table. Always start from the left to the right, then you remember who ordered what and give them the correct food. I'll give you a sheet of shorthand to memorize tonight. In the meanwhile, you'll just have to get a cramp in your hand from writing, Elle said crisply. Drinks are over there. She pulled out the cash that he had given her and put it into a large jar. This is the tip jar. It gets split between all staff at the end of the night. Your job is to be a good enough waiter that the customers like you and tip well. If not, Ramos isn't going to be very happy. He has a wife and seven kids to feed. Seven? Noah arched a brow. Hasn't he ever heard of birth control? They wanted a big family. Elle made a tray of drinks for table three. Here, you get to deliver this to table three. I hope you were paying attention to who gets what. Remember to take the tray back here. Yes, ma'am. Noah gingerly took the tray and made his way to the table. It was easy to see that this was not something he was used to doing. Elf shook her head. She had probably made a mistake. Well, if he didn't work out, she would fire him. She quickly went on to another table and got their order. She smiled as a customer asked her about her newest employee. I'm afraid I don't know his name yet, Gladys. But it's just temporary until Aurora comes back. Gladys peered at her through her cataracts. You think there's something wrong with the economy? All these men taking women's jobs? Probably, Elle agreed and left as quickly as she could. Gladys was a lovely lady, but she could talk for hours, and Elle simply did not have the time. She joined Noah behind the counter. Your name? Excuse me? What is your name? I can't keep going, hey you, all night long. Elle pointed to the coffee pot. You can go around and give refills. Noah, he grabbed the coffee pot. Are refills free? That doesn't seem very economical. Refills are free because we charge a good price for the first one. Plus, most people who linger over a second coffee purchase dessert, Elle explained. Now go before they start turning into zombies because they don't have their caffeine. Elle entered the kitchen and gave Ramos the next order slip. She loaded up her arms with plates again. Elle, could we talk about this? Max asked. Nope. No time right now. She deftly moved around him and went into the diner. She served the appropriate table, then showed Noah how to make coffee and where to find the tea. She made Noah serve the next table their orders, explaining from her shorthand who got what plate. He was able to balance three plates. It was a minor miracle in her books. He also had a decent memory. Another minor miracle. Maybe he was teachable after all. Strangely enough, he didn't even look ridiculous in the black half-apron worn by the waitstaff. Elle sighed. She had two gorgeous brothers under her employ. One ruggedly handsome, one preppy handsome with short hair and a clean shave. Too bad they were fighting. She wondered if they were both single. She hadn't seen any wedding rings, but that didn't always mean anything. "'What's the deal between you and Max?' Elle asked during a lull. She had Noah pre-filling coffee filters behind the counter. Noah made a face. Max is mad because I didn't support him as much as he hoped a few years ago. Should you have? Elle tilted her head to have a look at Noah. He was slightly shorter than his younger brother and leaner. Not by much, though. Yes, but there are a few things that Max doesn't know about. If you should have helped him, then you should have. The rest are just excuses. Elle changed the paper in the debit machine. You don't know what happened, Noah sighed. Some things get really complicated. Another excuse, Elle said. You either do something or you don't, and you live with the consequences. Look, lady, this is between me and my brother, Noah said angrily. My name is Elle, she put her hands on her hips, and since both of you are working for me, anything that affects my diner is my business. Polly plunked down a couple of plates of salad. If you two are done flirting, here's the food for table six. 
I'm going to mix up some extra egg salad. You need some mayo. We're nearly out. I've got this. Noah grabbed the plates. He didn't appreciate Elle sticking her nose where it wasn't wanted. Elle rolled her eyes and added mayonnaise to her list of things to get. She wondered when she was going to have the time to go shopping. The delivery service only gave certain products, and some of them were overpriced compared to purchasing them in bulk at a grocery store. When the restaurant business, it was important to pinch every penny. Finally, things wound down, and they were able to do the closing routine. As Ramos and Polly left, Elle asked Max to stay back a moment. "'If you don't mind, I'd like to have a word with you,' Elle said. She eyed a displeased Noah. "'You can bother him tomorrow, or the next day. You've got time. Rome wasn't built in a day.' "'I'm coming back tomorrow,' Noah said to Max. Max just shrugged and crossed his arms. Elle waited until Noah was out the door before asking Max, "'Is this going to be a problem, the two of you working together?' "'As long as he doesn't talk to me,' Max said, pulling out a chair. "'Stop sulking,' Elle said sharply. At Max's surprised look, she said dryly, "'You're practically pulling a muscle, putting your lower lip out like that.' "'I'm sorry,' Max sighed. "'I'm glad he's making the effort, but I'm still mad at him.' <laughs> "'Basically, you want to make him sweat more before you forgive him.' "'Something like that,' he said ruefully. "'It's been three years. I've missed Noah.' He and I used to be really close. He was pretty much my best friend. What happened? she asked, taking a seat. Ever heard of Ramsley Pharmaceuticals? Max asked. At her nod, he continued, I used to work there. In fact, the owner is our dad. There was a drug that we released that hurt a lot of kids. I've been trying to help those kids by providing for their hospital care. Because I did that, my dad basically threw me out of the company and doesn't speak to me. In fact, this is the first time I've seen Noah since it all happened. Why would they not speak to you? Elle was confused. You are just trying to help. It opened the company up to liability. Like I was admitting there was something wrong with the drug. Max ran a hand through his hair. There is something wrong with the drug. They've since pulled it, but it's too late for those kids. Elle was sympathetic. Did Noah side with your father? No, he argued that we should pull the drug, just like I did. Only he didn't walk away from the company. He shrugged. I thought he would. That way we could push Dad's hand, maybe make him do the right thing. It was the first time Noah's ever let me down. He said he wants to explain. Maybe he has a reason why, El said gently. Perhaps you should listen to him. I will. Just not yet, Max said. I'm going to make him work for it. Elle laughed. Is that what brothers do? He grinned at her. Absolutely. Don't you have any siblings? No. I always wish I did, though. Well, I have two brothers, Noah and Michael. Noah and I were the closest. We did almost everything together, and I could always count on him. And Michael is older than us, but he taught me how to ride a bike, how to swim. Max laughed. He almost taught me how to sail a boat, but I capsized his, and that was the end of the lessons. Sounds like a lot of fun, she smiled. You must miss them. I do, he sighed. We were really close, and then this whole thing broke us up. Then make sure you don't throw the opportunity to reconcile away. I won't, Max nodded. Thank you, Elle, for both the job and the talk. You're welcome. Elle smiled as they closed up the restaurant. Despite her protests, Max walked her to her car. She liked that. It made her feel special. She wondered if his brother would have done the same. Chapter 2 The next morning Noah was knocking at his father's office door first thing. He needed to get some things settled before he went to work for Elle. "'To what do I owe the pleasure?' David asked. Despite the gray hair and the fact that he was now in his mid-seventies, David was sharp and intelligent as ever. He continued to run Ramsley Pharmaceuticals, a billion-dollar company with a firm hand. "'I need a month or two off,' Noah cut right to the point." As you probably already know, I'm back in contact with Max, and I'd like some time to reconcile with him. David put down his pen in a slow and deliberate fashion. I thought I was quite clear on my expectations for this family regarding Maxwell. He's my brother, and I intend to see him, Noah said. Unacceptable. 
You'll break off all contact immediately. The old man's eyes were steel. I won't repeat myself. What if we bargain over it? Noah suggested. What could you possibly have that I would want? David snorted. The head of the laboratory's position. I'll fill it. Noah wasn't about to let his father know that he actually wanted the position. He was going to use it to make sure that Ramsley Pharmaceuticals never repeated its previous mistake of rushing a drug to market. You're slated to go into that position anyways. David waved his hand in annoyance. Three or four years and I'd have you in it. Haddon wants to retire. He's thinking about this January because his wife is talking about going south during the winters for her arthritis, Noah informed him. When I come back from repairing my relationship with Max, I could take over the position immediately. It would save you from having to find someone in the interim. You're going to have to do better than that, David said. Noah grimaced. He had an inkling of what would make his father change his mind. However, as much as he didn't want to do it, he needed the time to try to reconcile with Max. He also needed his father to allow him to have contact with Max. If he didn't, Noah would be forced to cut off his brother. David wielded the power to make that happen. I'll date Bethany Searson. Noah played his trump card. It was no secret that the patrons of the Ramsley and Searson families wanted to unite the two families with a marriage. Money and prestige meets more money and prestige. David laughed. Now you're talking. I said date. I didn't say I was proposing, Noah warned. His father smiled, but it didn't reach his eyes. I could just keep blackmailing you with that mistake of yours. You could try. Then I could just not date Bethany, not take the head of laboratory's position, not have to work for you anymore, and get to see my brother any time I felt like it, Noah said evenly. You'd have to get a job permanently at that diner, David remarked. No respectable lab would have you if I let that little fact about you go public. Noah shouldn't have been surprised that David knew that he had put a few hours at L's. The man kept a number of private investigators on staff and knew everything that happened, even in his own family. I might have to. They both knew that Noah loved his work as a scientist. Ruining his career would be a devastating blow. All right. You can have until Christmas holidays. Afterward, I expect you back and ready to take over for Hayden. David picked up his pen and began working through forms again. Noah got up. He was not going to thank his father. Just as he came to the office door, he could hear David speak behind him again. You'll take her on two dates, minimum a week. If she invites you to a family function, you'll go. Try to woo the poor girl, David remarked lightly. We do have a reputation to uphold. Noah jerked open the door and left. Talking to his father always made him angry, so he usually avoided doing so whenever he could. However, this time he'd managed to get what he wanted. He had no desire to date Bethany, but he would get the position he wanted, and he would get to talk to Max without his father putting up a fight over it. It should have been a win, but it felt hollow. He wondered how Michael put up with the old man since he had to deal with him on a weekly basis. At least Noah could avoid him unless it was a family gathering. When he reached the laboratories, he went to his office and cleaned up his desk, putting away materials. He liked a tidy office and a tidy workplace. Any sensitive materials would go in a safe in his condo. He did not trust the file cabinet locks to keep out his father's prying eyes. Once he'd gotten over the shock that his own father would blackmail him, he understood why Michael was a veritable monk with no social life. It was easier not to give the old man new material to use against him. Max was the sort of man who owned his mistakes. He made plenty, but he also carried them with some pride. Their father couldn't do anything to his youngest son. He also couldn't make him toe the line. Noah admired that in his little brother, and wished he had the guts to do the same. If only he hadn't made that mistake years ago. If only he had fixed it when he had the chance. Then again, he'd never known that it would come to this. Such a little thing that could threaten his entire career. Noah sighed. He was going to be absent for two months. He should get together with his colleagues and go over what needed to be done in his absence. They could email him any results, and he would oversee what he could from home and occasional visits to the lab. 
He was going to be very busy for the next two months by the schedule L had given him. Part of him still couldn't believe that he'd agreed to work as a waiter. He'd never worked in retail or service job in his life. He hoped Max appreciated the effort he was putting in to try to repair their relationship. Noah couldn't believe that he was doing all this for nothing. He quickly finished in the lab. He gathered up his small team of scientists and technicians, explaining that he was going to be away for the next two months. They probably thought he was going away on a vacation. He purposely neglected telling them that he was going to be working as a waiter during that time. He gave them instructions on how to reach him, and left his very capable colleague and assistant in charge. Even with keeping it brief, he knew that he was cutting it close for his shift at the diner. Thankfully, El had not expected him to be there for breakfast today. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had the time to take care of everything. What he hadn't counted on was bad traffic. It took extra time and a detour before he could finally pull into the alley behind the diner. He entered through the kitchen. "'You're late!' Polly yelled as he grabbed food from Ramos and headed into the restaurant. "'No kidding!' Noah replied as he followed him into the restaurant. He grabbed an apron and wound it around his waist. "'You're late,' El said. She grabbed the coffee pot. "'I noticed.' Noah grabbed an order pad and pen. "'Do it again, and you're fired,' El left, threading her way amongst the tables, offering coffee. She really did have the most gorgeous backside. Noah pulled his thoughts away from her and pushed a hand through his hair. He would not be late again. He needed this opportunity to talk to Max. Polly handed him his order pad. These are the orders for tables seven and ten. You've got tables one through ten. Ramos should have the order for table two shortly. Table one should be on a dessert in a couple of minutes. Spread some coffee. Did you memorize the shorthand last night? Uh, yeah. Noah struggled to keep up with what Polly had just said. I did. Good. Then you'll understand what I wrote. Polly tossed his pen in the container under the counter. I'm back to sandwiches, salads, and desserts. Okay, he could do this. Noah took a deep breath and brought Ramos the tickets for the orders. First things first, get the food going. Then he picked up a pot of coffee and served his section of patrons. Noah eyed everything to make sure he knew what was happening at each table. He put on a new pot of coffee and started the food for table two. At table one, he asked about dessert. "'What do you have for pie today?' a little old lady blinked at him. He hadn't looked at the display case. Noah mentally kicked himself. "'One moment, I'll be right back.' The old ladies tittered, and he could hear one of them say, "'He's handsome, but he's not that smart.' "'He had a Ph.D. in science, for pity's sake!' Noah gritted his teeth. He was not going to make the same mistake again. Next time, he would be prepared. He might only be here for two months, but he was going to do a good job during that time. He prided himself on his work ethic. He smiled at the patrons, he worked hard to make sure he got the orders right, and he was glad that he had chosen to wear black sneakers, which were much more comfortable than the loafers he had worn yesterday. He didn't know how Elle did it in those pumps of hers. They couldn't possibly be comfortable. On his break, he approached Max. Talking to me yet? Nope. Max leaned against the alley wall since he was on break at the same time. Afterward, Polly and Ramos would take their breaks. It seemed like El never took one. There's a pickup basketball game on Saturday if you want to go, Noah offered. I'm working. Max scrolled through his phone, ignoring Noah. I'm trying here, Noah said in frustration, running a hand through his hair. You could have at least asked what time the game was before you shot it down. "'What time is the game?' Max asked. Nine at night?' "'I'm working,' Max replied. "'That's funny. I thought the diner shut down at eight. Max shrugged. "'Look, I love you, but you are being seriously stubborn right now.' Noah leaned against the wall and closed his eyes. "'Is that your car parked at the end of the alley?' Max asked. "'Yeah, why?' Max laughed. <laughs> "'They're towing it.' "'What?' Noah's eyes snapped open, and he looked to see a tow truck slowly taking it out of the alley. Why? Max just laughed some more. Hey! Noah waved his arms and walked a few feet, before giving up as the tow truck turned a corner. Max laughed harder. This is not funny, Noah glowered at Max. Max made an effort to be somber. Tell you what, I'll go play basketball with you, but I'm gonna need a ride. Shut up. 
Noah went back into the kitchen, ignoring Max's howls of amusement from the alley. He went into the diner to find Elle. Do you know what company tows cars in the area? Mm, usually Henderson. Why? Elle asked as she set out desserts for a table. I've been towed, Noah said bitterly. Where did you park? Elle gave Noah her full attention. In the alley, near the back. Noah sighed. There wasn't any signs that I couldn't park there. There are no signs saying that you can park there. That's a delivery alley, which means 30-minute parking maximum, Elle explained. You'll have to call and find out when you can get your car back. It better not damage it, Nova said tersely. A thousand dollars to the tip jar, and now his car was being towed. This job was starting to add up in costs to him. Next time, don't park in the alley, Elle said. You do, Noah pointed out. Only for short periods of times, and never on Tuesdays or Thursdays, which is when Henderson tends to scope out the area for easy pickings, Elle shrugged. You can park in the customer lot. Just make sure you stay near the back so the customers park close to the building. Thanks. Noah wished she'd explain that before he'd parked his car in the alley. What do you drive? she asked as she put a tray away and tallied up a couple of bills. Is it expensive? It's just a BMW, Noah said. Why? <laughs> That's an expensive car. It's going to cost you extra to get that out of the impound lot, Elle warned. They can't jack up the price based on the model of the car. Noah was pretty sure that sort of thing would be illegal. If it wasn't, it should be. Are you kidding? They'll call it some sort of extra handling fee to prevent damage or marks on the car. Elf shrugged as she grabbed the coffee pot. Happens all the time. That's not right, Noah said. Next time, you won't park there. Elf smiled as she went to serve her customers. She was secretly pleased that Noah had gotten towed. He was a bit of a snob and deserved a small reminder that he was just like anyone else. L, who's the new guy? Dominic, another regular asked from the seniors' table. The group regularly came in for coffee and treats, then ended up staying for a meal because they weren't done gossiping for the day. Noah is waiting on tables. His brother Max is in the kitchen, L replied as she distributed coffee among the table. Wearing pretty fancy clothes for a waiter, Dominic remarked. I used to work at a men's suit store. That's too expensive for a place like this. Well, he's just temporary, Elle said. She didn't really know what Noah did at his other place of employment. Max might stick around, though. They're both very handsome, Gladys said. Someone must have filled her in on what the brothers looked like, since she refused to get her eyes operated on for her cataracts. They are, Elle agreed. Does anyone need anything else? The group of seniors proclaimed themselves good, and Elle went on to the kitchen to discuss tonight's dinner with Polly and Ramos. She was just about to ask Max what exactly Noah did at Ramsley Pharmaceuticals when a red-faced Noah came into the kitchen. "'From now on, you get to serve Minnie,' he declared to Elle. Max hooted. He got pinched. "'Old ladies should not be doing that,' Noah growled as he put up a food order ticket for Ramos. "'I'll go talk to her,' Elle frowned. "'This is the second time in a month.' "'Who was the first? Noah asked. Max, Polly grinned. Hey, she's a nice old lady. Be good to her, Max laughed. She appreciates a backside. Still, she can't just keep doing this, Elle rolled her eyes. The only guy she hasn't pinched is Ramos because he won't come out of the kitchen, Polly motioned to the cook. Ramos responded that it was safe in the kitchen. It's not a big deal. She only does it once, like an initiation, Polly explained. You're totally safe now. I'm not comforted by that fact, Noah said dryly. Oh, come on. Stop being such a wuss about it. Max shook his head as he loaded the dishwasher. The old lady thinks you're hot. Take it as a compliment. Noah rolled his eyes and left the kitchen. He went to see how his customers were faring, and Dominic waved him over to order dessert. Blueberry pie with a scoop of ice cream. Gladys peered at him through her cataracts. I'll have the same. "'You're supposed to be watching your calories. The doctor said so,' Dominic protested. "'She's not going to have the ice cream.' "'I am so. You mind your own business or I'll start your underwear,' Gladys threatened. Noah decided retreat was in order. "'I'll get your desserts.' He went to the display case to grab the pie. "'What is with everyone today?' Al looked at him. "'What? They're bickering, pinching, my car is towed?' 
Noah grabbed the ice cream. It's like everyone is on each other's nerves today. Full moon, Al nodded wisely. Excuse me? he asked, confused by her answer. Full moon. When you work in health care, there is this old wives' tale about how on the full moon the craziness comes out of people due to the magnetic pull or the tides or something. Al shrugs. It's pretty true in my experience. You're not serious, Noah looked at her in surprise. There's absolutely no scientific basis behind that reasoning. Maybe not, but when you work in health care, let me know what you think. Elle tallied some bills. You work in health care? Noah inquired. I'm a dietitian at the local hospital. I'm just helping out here until Mama and Pop come back. She grabbed a rag and started cleaning behind the counter. Mercy Hospital? He guessed at a nearby hospital. The very one, Elf smiled. I love my job here. What do you do? I work with chemical compounds and biology in the lab at Ramsley Pharmaceuticals, Noah said. We try to improve on medications in our division. Do you like your job? Elle was curious. I can't imagine doing anything else, Noah stated firmly. It's interesting to work here for a break, but I really will enjoy going back. Good, Elle said. Everyone should love what they do. Noah nodded and put the ice cream on both pies. He loved what he did at Ramsley Pharma. It was why he would be complying with his father's demand that he go out with Bethany Searson. Of course, he'd have to get his par out of the impound lot first. Chapter 3 Noah barely remembered Bethany Searson from his childhood. She had been a bit of a brat, as he recalled, from the few times he and Max had been forced to look after her during summer holidays at the beach house when the Searsons came to visit. She was eight years younger than him, and when he googled her, it came up that she was part of the local orchestra, playing both the cello and piano. Other than that, he really didn't know much about her. There was no picture, and no other information. He wondered if there was a particular reason she was available, and the Searsons were so anxious to get her off their hands. Maybe she'd turned out ugly, or with an oddly shaped head or something. Or perhaps she was a major drama queen. Too late now, he admonished himself as he knocked on her door. He had picked up a couple of tickets to the ballet. Not something he particularly enjoyed, but after talking to his mother, she made the suggestion. Mom had been a bit hesitant about Bethany saying that she was a lovely young woman who played music professionally and volunteered to teach dance to disadvantaged kids. He wondered what made his mother not exactly fond of Bethany. The door opened, and there was a beautiful woman standing before him. She had platinum blonde hair and pale blue eyes with a tall, willowy figure. She gave a small smile, and air kissed his cheek. "'Hello, Noah.' "'Bethany,' he offered his arm. "'It's very good to see you.' She took his arm, and they headed to the elevator. "'May I ask what you have planned for tonight?' "'I have a dinner reservation, and then tickets to the ballet,' Noah said. "'The Nutcracker. It's getting close to Christmas, so something a little festive.' "'That sounds nice,' Bethany replied. As they waited for the elevator car to arrive, she turned to face him. "'I know that this date is more for the benefit of our parents than us. I hardly even remember you from childhood.' Noah, I was wondering if we might work on being friends first. Noah was relieved. I'd like that. We can just get to know each other. No pressure. Good, she smiled. They entered the elevator and chatted a little about their respective jobs. He learned that she had a pet fish. He had no pets as he tended to keep long hours at the lab. Her brother was doing well. He was living in Taiwan with his new wife. Noah responded that Michael was doing well and continued to excel at work. Max was still Max, a bit adventurous. By the time they made it through dinner and arrived at the theater, the small talk was exhausted. Noah refused to discuss the weather. Thankfully, they could greet people they knew. Noah escorted her around. They were separated for a short time while she discussed decorating with a couple of ladies and an old friend of Noah's from college asked about the work he was doing in the lab. Noah was surprised when a couple of men from the country club joined them. Escorting Bethany around? Dan Wards asked, looking at her with the group of ladies. Noah nodded. He remembered that Dan's brother had been dating Bethany for a while. Yes, we're seeing a little of each other lately. 
"'What did they offer you to deet the Ice Queen?' Dan questioned as he took a swallow of his drink. "'Excuse me?' Noah had never really liked Dan and found his question distasteful now, especially since it rang a little too close to the truth. "'She's a little off, you know. Her parents are trying to unload her,' Dan explained. "'I hope they gave you a sweet deal.' "'She's perfectly fine,' Noah said shortly. "'Early days yet. You'll find out soon enough.' Dan took another large swallow of his whiskey. "'My brother got away from her pretty quick. Don't expect any action out of her either, if you know what I mean. She's buttoned up tighter than a nun.' "'Okay, you've had too much to drink.' Noah turned away, looking for Bethany. She was standing there, not two feet away. She had probably heard every word. "'You'll see. I'm right. She's a cold one and an odd one.' "'Not right in the head,' Dan persisted not seeing Bethany around Noah. Bethany drew herself up a little taller. She fixed a pleasant smile on her face. "'Could we go inside to the theater? I think we should find our seats.' Noah nodded and offered his arm. "'Please, let's go.' She threaded her arm through his, and they walked to the nearly empty theater. "'Bethany,' Noah sighed. "'I'm sorry about that. I think Dan had too much to drink. It's no excuse for his behavior.' What he said was unforgivable. She was silent for a moment. He's right. I am a little odd. Noah stopped and turned to face her so that he could see her face. Something happened a long time ago, and since then I don't feel emotions like other people. While most women would be very upset about what Dan said, I feel mild disgust. Bethany's brow furrowed just a little. I don't have strong emotions. When people are happy, I feel slightly pleasant. When people are devastated, I just feel a little hollow. I don't know why I'm different, but I am. So Dan is right in a way. I might seem like a cold and unfeeling person. He was still wrong to say it. Noah wasn't sure what to do with this revelation. Yes, he was, Bethany shrugged. I can understand if you would prefer that we not continue to see each other. I'm sure our parents were less than forthcoming with my condition. Noah knew he could use the information to his advantage against his father, claiming that he hadn't been honest on their deal. He also knew his father wouldn't care, and would in the end probably force him to continue to see Bethany anyways. He also didn't like that other people in their social circle were discussing her this way behind her back. It wasn't right. I thought we were trying to be friends, Noah said gently. Friends stand by each other. Thank you, Bethany gave him a small smile. She really was beautiful, a classic, almost untouchable beauty, not like the vibrancy of Elle. Noah shoved the thought out of his head. He was here to date, or at least give the appearance of dating Bethany. Shall we take our seats and wait for the show? Maybe you could explain the finer points to me before it begins. Noah waited for her to nod and escorted her to the appropriate seats. He asked her questions, which really wasn't difficult since he knew practically nothing about ballet or the story itself. Do you like ballet? she suddenly asked. Noah decided to be honest. She had been with him, so it was the least he could do. It's not something that I would expect to enjoy, no. This would be my first time to see one. She seemed to digest that for a moment. What do you like? I'm more of a sports fan. I like the occasional movie. Good food. Nerdy, sciencey stuff, as Max would say. What do you like? He asked in return. I like my music. I like the feel of dancing. I like teaching dance. It makes me feel useful. Bethany tilted her head as she looked at Noah. I don't really do much. Well, if you want to try anything new, we can he offered. "'What sports do you go to see?' she questioned. "'In the summers I go to some of the Yankees' games. Right now I have season tickets to the Jets and the Rangers. The Jets are football and the Rangers are hockey,' he explained. "'Could we go to a football game? I've never been to one.' "'Sure,' Noah said. "'I'll introduce you to the sport. Who knows, maybe you'll like it.' "'Maybe,' she rewarded him with a small smile again. Noah decided he could like getting to know her. The lights dimmed, then returned to normal, indicating that people were to take their seats. 
They watched as the crowd slowly sauntered in, finding their respective spots. The show was better than Noah expected. During the intermission, he asked Bethany questions about it, and she obligingly filled him in on what was happening. He found that she was very easy to talk to. Afterward, he confided it wasn't as bad as he assumed it was going to be, and if she wanted to go to another, he wouldn't mind. He'd been pleasantly surprised by Bethany. When he walked her back to her apartment, they agreed to another outing, and she gave him that small smile as she said good night. Noah reflected that the date had gone pretty well as he made his way back to his car. He was actually looking forward to another one. Noah could get tickets for the Saturday's Jets game, but it would have to be during the afternoon. He didn't like asking for a day off so soon after starting at the restaurant, but it would be an easy second date for him and Bethany, which would keep his dad happy. Noah asked about the possibility of taking the day off and wasn't surprised at Elle's response. "'No one gets Fridays or Saturdays off. It's too busy,' Elle explained. "'You think tonight was a madhouse? Wait until the weekend.' Noah grimaced. "'Then I'll have to rearrange my plans.' "'Going out with someone?' Max asked as he unloaded a tote of dishes. "'I thought you weren't talking to me,' Noah replied. "'I'm not. I just feel bad for the girl. "'Not that you have to cancel on her, but rather that she's even going out with you,' Max clarified. "'Right,' Noah clipped the order slips to a bar for Ramos to see. "'So who is she?' Max asked. He couldn't help himself. Even if he wasn't supposedly talking to Noah— he was curious as to the mystery woman in his brother's life. Beth, Noah supplied. Beth. Bethany Searson? Max grimaced as he recalled the only Beth he knew. The wild child who used to have to be dragged out of the ocean and screamed bloody murder? She's grown up, Noah frowned. I don't remember her like that. That's because you got to go to space camp that year and I stayed home, Max complained. Noah thought about it for a moment. That must have been the year Max jumped off the roof with the blanket for a parachute. Broken collarbone. Yup. Bethany just kept going on about how she was going to be a dancer. I had to sit through numerous shows. Max grabbed a pot to scrub. Lucky you. Like I said, she's grown up now. Noah leaned on a counter while he waited for Ramos. Noah had a girlfriend. Elle found that thought depressing. She didn't know why. He was the most infuriating, knuckle-headed man she had yet met. He also made her heart skip a beat every time he stood too close to her. She had been hopeful of finding out if he was the one who made her heart sing, and now he was off limits. Besides, we're not actually dating, Noah shrugged. We're going out, as friends. Does she know that? Polly asked. Because some women, they say just friends, but that ain't what they mean. She suggested it, Noah said firmly. Then it ain't just friends. Polly shook his head and grabbed some lettuce out of the fridge to wash. Please me, I got caught in one of those. That's not like that, Noah protested. Although part of him wasn't too sure. How well did he know her anyhow? Hell, you're a woman. Would you like to weigh in? Max asked innocently. If she says it's just friends, she wishes it was more. Elle sighed, agreeing with Polly. Women tend to be that way. Noah grimaced. Really? If you don't want to date her, then why are you? Elle questioned. It's complicated, Noah said. A lot of things seem to be complicated with you. Elle grabbed the food for her table. She was disappointed in Noah. Why were men always so clueless? Either you want to date her, or you don't. It's not that difficult. Why are you people even trying to be involved in this? This is my life, not yours. Noah asked defensively as El headed into the restaurant. Ramos laughed as he said something. What did he say? Noah wanted to know. He said you work in a restaurant. Gossip and food are the only two things that happen here, Polly replied. He continued to prep for salad and sandwiches. Noah shook his head and grabbed his order. He was about to head out of the kitchen when a very thin brunette walked in the back door. She let a stream of language follow her, and Polly replied, both of them nearly yelling, as she went out into the restaurant. Noah looked at Max, who shrugged and raised an eyebrow. By that gesture, Noah knew that Max had understood most of what had been said, but didn't want to comment on it. Ramos was paying particular attention to the stove. 
The cook might not understand the language, but he certainly knew the tone of the two employees who were arguing. "'Polly, care to share?' Noah asked with little satisfaction at the other man's discomfort. He felt he had the right to pry, since they had just been poking into his personal business a moment ago. The woman came back in, tying an apron around her tiny waist, yelling again at Polly, who pointed a dull knife with mayonnaise on it at her and shouted back. Max put a hand on Noah's shoulder. "'You do not want to go there. There are some serious accusations going on in that mess of language.' "'Eastern European?' Noah wondered. "'Romanian, Ukrainian, and maybe some Russian thrown in,' Max affirmed. His extensive travels before and during college had shown a rare gift for picking up languages. "'It's not easy to follow. They're going so fast and switching languages too often. I think there's some serious history there.' "'Maybe we should get back to work.' Noah grabbed the last plate of food that he had been waiting for. "'Good idea!' Max grabbed a tote, and they both exited into the restaurant. Elf stood, staring at the kitchen with her hands on her hips. There was a sound of a plate breaking. "'Wasn't us!' Max automatically said, and Noah snorted in amusement as he remembered how many times they had stood beside each other as kids, automatically claiming that the damage done wasn't them. They shared a conspiratorial look. "'Don't the two of you have work to do?' An annoyed L asked. Yes, ma'am, two brothers replied together before quickly returning to their duties. The arguing woman came out of the kitchen, glowering at L. She pointed to Noah. You give my job to him? No, you gave your job to him since you didn't bother to show up for work, L said firmly. I fired? she asked, hands on hips, mirroring L. You not boss, parents boss, they fire. You're not fired, Aurora. I have a better idea, El said as she unwound her own apron. Today, you run the floor by yourself. Tomorrow, if you show up, you can run half, like always. What you do? What he do? Aurora gestured Noah. He and I are going shopping for the Christmas tree. Noah, El gestured to him, we're going on a food run and a Christmas run. This place needs to start looking festive for the holidays. "'Uh, who's going to wait on the customers?' Noah questioned. "'Aurora is,' El said sweetly with some steel in her eyes. "'And everything had better be in the tip jar when I get back.' "'I not thief!' Aurora exclaimed. "'Good! If you can be bothered to show up for work on your scheduled days, you can keep your job. "'Miss one more day, and then don't bother coming back.' El stashed her apron away and grabbed her coat. "'Let's go, Noah!' Noah quickly put his apron under the counter and grabbed his coat, following L. They went through the kitchen, and this time Max raised an eyebrow and Noah shrugged. L grabbed the shopping list and headed for her car. So that was the elusive Aurora, Noah asked. L unlocked the SUV so they could both get in. Yes. Noah waited expectantly for L to elaborate as he put on his seatbelt. L sighed as she pulled into traffic. She's a great waitress. She's fast, she makes good tips, she does a good job. However, every so often she just up and disappears for weeks at a time. No one knows where she goes or what she does. Then she comes back like nothing happened and expects to just be able to work again. She's unreliable. Then why do you keep letting her work at the restaurant? Noah looked at the shopping list. It's my parents' restaurant. I don't actually have a say on who they hire and fire. For some reason they keep giving her a chance. L merged and waited for a left turn signal. What happens if she does show up tomorrow? Noah questioned. Does that mean I'm out of a job? No. With Christmas coming, we're just going to get busier. There's the bazaar coming up and the parade, plus there's an entire week of night shopping on our street. L pulled a face. I think the theme is Victorian this year. There's a theme to shopping? Noah asked. All the shops are going to dress up like an old-fashioned Christmas, including employees, Elle sighed. I'll have to see if I can find costumes or something. Noah laughed. Costumes? Elle rolled her eyes. It's not my idea of fun. I love Christmas, but wearing a costume can be hot and uncomfortable in the restaurant industry. She pulled into a parking spot at a big bulk grocery store chain. Noah followed her and got a cart as instructed. She ripped the list in half and told him to meet her at the front in twenty minutes. Noah watched her disappear into a crowd of shoppers before perusing his half of the list. He could do this. People grocery shopped every day. It couldn't be that hard. 
Noah began wandering down the aisles, looking for items that he needed. People got in his way. No one seemed to care about the rules of the roadway. They just went willy-nilly wherever they pleased. There was a child eating out of a box of animal-shaped cookies. Was that even allowed? "'Excuse me, sir,' a tiny old lady gazed up at him. "'Would you get me a couple of those cream of chicken soups? You're so tall.' "'Um, sure.' Noah easily got the cans of soup for her, then showed her the list. You wouldn't know where any of these are. Your wife must be so happy having you do the shopping for her. The lady tilted her glasses and peered at the list. She pointed to an item. Those are at the end of the aisle, right over there. Thank you, Noah said with a smile. He could do this. He'd just keep asking random people until he managed to get what he needed. Thirty minutes later... He was still trying to find ketchup when Elle caught up to him. "'What is taking you so long?' Elle asked. She had her cart full. "'This store needs a map,' Noah muttered. "'It'd also help if they grouped like things together.' Elle raised an eyebrow. "'What do you need yet?' He showed her his list. "'You're only half done,' she said, rolling her eyes. "'Ketchup is in the condiment aisle.' "'And how am I supposed to know that?' he asked, a little annoyed." Ketchup, mustard, mayo, they're all condiments, she pointed to the signs hanging in from the ceiling of the every aisle. Condiments. Noah followed her. He wished someone had pointed that out earlier. Those signs could have been really helpful had he known they were there. I don't grocery shop. I noticed, El said dryly. Neither did Max know how to do dishes or even cook basic meals. What kind of childhood do the two of you have that you're lacking such basic skills? We had a housekeeper growing up. Noah watched her put items in his cart. What about now? Do you even know how to do laundry? El picked out a bag of frozen mushrooms. The list says fresh. These are going to have to go back. Noah shrugged. Mushrooms were mushrooms. I have a maid who comes in twice a week. How do you get groceries? There's a delivery service. It's very economical. Why don't you get your items delivered to the restaurant, he asked. Because it's not economical. Every penny counts, and the margin is so thin in the restaurant business. Elle grabbed fresh mushrooms. Some things we can get at a discount, through a service if we buy enough, but they charge more than a store like this for other items, which is why I make weekly runs to get what we need. Isn't your time worth something? Noah tried to understand. If you were to work in your hourly wage, then I'm not sure this is the most cost-effective solution. Getting away from the restaurant once in a while saves my sanity. I'm willing to pay a few pennies for that. Elle pushed her cart into a long lineup. What's this? Noah saw piles of people waiting. The cashier's line. Elle grabbed a magazine, flipping through it. When it's busy, it takes a while. Shouldn't they open more tills? Well, that would be nice, Elle remarked as she paused over an article in the magazine. What about those tills over there? Noah motioned to the self-scanning ones. L had a quick look where he was pointing. I don't use them. Why not? It looks like one's available. L sighed. Because they take away jobs, Noah. For every scanner, there is a cashier that used to have a job. Now it's one person looking after ten machines. It seems more efficient, Noah's brow furrowed as he tried to understand her reasoning. It might be. But when it's a tight job market like it is right now, people need every chance they can have to earn a wage. Those machines might be easier and faster, but they mean one more family that has a harder Christmas, Elle explained. Noah supposed he hadn't thought of it that way before. He loved robotics and the advances science was making. He'd never thought of the people that used to do the jobs that machines were doing. Surely they found other work. Elle put the magazine back as they cashed out. She taught Noah how to bag groceries with like items so that things like bananas wouldn't get squished. She had a pile of reusable bags, and Noah could see the wisdom in not using plastic when it would likely only get used once. He helped her put everything away in the SUV. How was your first trip to the grocery store? Elle asked, amused that a man who was in his thirties had never stepped foot inside one before. Noah shrugged. It went okay, I guess. What are we doing next? After we bring the groceries back to the restaurant... We'll go and pick out a Christmas tree. Elle's eyes lit up. There's the quaint little farm on the edge of the city. We go there every year to pick one out. You enjoy Christmas? Noah asked dryly. It was obvious from her excitement that the holiday was one of her favorites. 
I love it. The lights, the music, everyone going out of their way to be happy with their families. Elle smiled. My parents emigrated to this country, and they wanted me to experience all things American. They were determined to assimilate. Christmas has become our favorite holiday. We spend the morning in church, and then have a nice meal followed by a gift exchange, one present per person. Then we'd play a board game. After supper, we'd join the group that goes caroling. Christmas was the one day that my parents took off from the restaurant, and I had them all to myself. Elle pulled into the alley behind the restaurant. Sounds nice, Noah said as they grabbed their groceries. What do you do for the holidays? Elle asked. Mm, not much. Usually we gather at Mom and Dad's for an evening meal. Noah shrugged. It's not the same without Max there. Don't you do gifts? Elle decided to leave the topic of Max's estrangement alone. Noah was trying, and she could appreciate wanting a family to get along. I bring wine and scotch for Dad and Mom. Michael, Max, and I never exchanged gifts. Noah shrugged and unloaded his bags in the busy kitchen, following Elle. When we were kids, we'd get gifts from Mom. In the afternoons, we'd go tobogganing, if we were at the house in Vermont, since there was a hill nearby. If we were at the beach house, we'd play road hockey with some of the other kids on the street. You didn't spend the afternoon together as a family? Elle asked as she put items away. Three boys. I think Mom and Dad were happy to let us get rid of some of our energy outside, Noah explained. I don't think you could really count Michael as one of the boys, Max said as he unloaded the dishwasher. He's ten years older than Noah. He still came, Noah said. I think he enjoyed it as much as we did. Elle smiled. She could imagine them out sledding. It was something she wanted for her own family when she had kids. What's Michael like? Quiet, said Max. Reserved, Noah grimaced, even more so now. I used to bug him deliberately to make him have some fun in life. Max grabbed some of the groceries, putting the mushrooms into their assigned bin. He's too serious. Elle thought she would like this mysterious Michael. Ten years older and having to deal with the two of you as boys? He must have had a lot of patience. Aurora came in and slapped down three order tickets for Ramos. She glared at Polly and the two of them jabbered at each other in another language. Elle raised an eyebrow. Have they been arguing the whole time? Just every time she comes in the kitchen, Max said. Been around the world and met some pretty interesting people, but some of the things she says could make a me blush. Noah reflected that with Max's playboy history, it would take a lot to do that. He rolled up the extra empty shopping bags and put them inside of one. Whatever was going between the two, it was none of his business. Aurora yelled something, and Max burst out laughing. A red-faced Polly turned on him, raising a finger. Don't you dare say anything! Max held up his hands in surrender, still chuckling. He understand? Aurora demanded of Polly. He understand what I say to you? Lady, I've understood about most of what you've been yelling the whole time, Max said sheepishly. Aurora put her hands on her hips and glared at Max. And who knows who else has understood, overhearing your shouting while they're trying to eat in the restaurant, Elle added. Maybe you should think about being quieter. Or better yet, wait until after work to sort out whatever is going on between you two. Aurora threw her hands in the air and grabbed some plates of food before exiting into the restaurant. How's she been doing with the customers? Al asked. No complaints from them. Everyone's getting their stuff. Polly angrily sliced through a tomato. Some of the regulars are happy to see her back, but are wondering if Noah's going to get canned. Al put a hand on his arm. If you can't work with her, I need to know. I need this job, Elle. I work all the hours you give me, and I do my best. I know, and I appreciate that, Elle said. I ain't losing this job just because she come through the door, Polly snorted. In a month she'll be gone again anyways. Don't worry, I'd fire her before I'd fire you, Elle said dryly. Privately, she wondered if Aurora would last a month before disappearing again. Shall I bring back some cider from the farm for all of us to enjoy? Ramos nodded his appreciation of such an offer. Polly agreed. Sounds good. Max was still grinning when Noah and Elle left to go to pick out a Christmas tree. Noah sighed. Sometimes I envy him a little. Who? Your brother? Elle asked as she drove. Wherever he does, wherever he goes, whoever he meets, he makes friends and fits in so easily. He's got a knack for it, Noah explained. Right now, scrubbing dishes, he's having the time of his life. I guess whatever life hands him, he's just making the best of it, 
Elf shrugged. It's a good thing. I suppose so, Noah said. He wondered if he was getting too serious like Michael. He missed Max. His brother always lightened things up. He wondered what he was going to do when he had to go back to work after Christmas and couldn't spend as much time with him. He hoped Max would finally want him back in his life. "'Give him a little time, Noah,' El said sympathetically. "'He'll come around.' "'I hope so.' Noah looked at the passing scenery of the city. "'I know that Dad will never get past it, but it would be nice to see Max regularly. Maybe even bring Mom to see him.' "'What about Michael?' El asked, remembering the older brother. Michael's worried Max won't forgive him for winning against the class lawsuit that was brought against the company by the parents of the kids who were affected, Noah explained. That's why he wouldn't come. He wanted me to have the best chance to talk to Max. That's sad, Al thought out loud. Noah shrugged. The thing is, Michael has done a lot of stuff for Max that he doesn't even know about. When Max left the company, he sold his shares to help pay for the family's hospital bills. Michael bought out the shares under a false name. He contributes quarterly to Max's fund. Sometimes I wonder... What? El questioned. I wonder what Dad has on Michael, Noah murmured. What do you mean? El was confused by the turn that the conversation had taken. Nothing. It's fine. Noah took a deep breath. He didn't need to be confiding this sort of stuff to El, no matter how easy it was to talk to her. He barely knew her. El had the feeling it wasn't fine. He'd turned so serious. However, she thought that now wasn't necessarily the time to pry. The more she learned about Max and Noah, the more she liked the brothers and hoped the family would resolve their issues. She turned on the radio, and they argued good-naturedly over stations, until El found one with Christmas music and insisted it stay on. After all, they were going to get a Christmas tree. "'Why don't you just have an artificial one?' Noah asked abruptly. "'We've always had a live tree. It's like a tradition,' El replied. "'What kind of tree did you have?' "'A real one. Noah had never really seen the appeal. A fake tree would have been fine for the five days that they had it. Mom had it delivered, and then after Christmas some sort of recycling company would come and take it away. The designer would take care of decorating and undecorating the living room and foyer. It was only up for a few days.' Seems strange to cut down a tree just for five days of celebrating when we hardly even looked at it. You didn't decorate your own tree? El questioned. No. Noah looked at El. She really was beautiful. He wondered if she happened to be seeing anyone. It looked nice, I guess, but I never really understood the point of it. It's just something fun to do. A fresh tree smells wonderful. I enjoy putting up the ornaments. Each ornament we have has a memory attached to it. This will be the first year that I do it without my parents, El explained. I love Christmas. She pulled onto a country road, and it wasn't long before they were at a small farm, surrounded by trees. El greeted the owners by name. She retrieved an axe and a small saw from them. Noah watched her with some trepidation. An axe? What, did you think the tree was just going to jump into the car all by itself? El laughed. We have to go cut it down. Noah had never handled an axe. He hoped dragging the tree was his job. It seemed a lot better than playing the woodsman. Knowing his tendency, he might end up with a severed thumb or something if he handled the saw. We'll also grab some greenery and a couple of pre-made bows, El said happily. Her cheeks had reddened a little from the cold, and her eyes sparkled when she led him into the woods to find the tree. Don't let me forget up the apple cider. Everyone looks forward to it. Noah nodded absently. She really was beautiful when she was happy like this. What about that tree? Are you kidding? El smiled to take the sting out of her words. We need something that is about seven feet tall and is even. I like symmetry. No bare spots, and it needs to be fluffy. This was going to be harder than he thought. Noah gazed around the trees, which all looked about the same to him. El was a picky tree shopper. He walked through the crisp air with her and thought that this was a nice place could understand why she enjoyed coming here each year. It kind of reminded him of the few times he'd been camping. He'd enjoyed camping and wondered why he didn't do it anymore. Well, he'd enjoyed everything except for canoeing with Max part. His brother had decided it was a good practice for dragon boat racing. Noah had gotten seasick. The camp counselors hadn't been amused. What about this one? he asked. El eyed it critically. Almost. You're getting better at picking them. He'd actually just pointed at random. 
Noah decided to just let her at it and be the grunt muscle. It was probably the best idea. This one. Her eyes lit up and she practically danced around it. Oh, it's beautiful. Noah looked at the tree. It was a tree. He looked at Elle and decided she was beautiful. Do you want to cut it down? She asked, offering the axe. No, Noah said. I've been officially banned from all sharp objects years ago. What? Elle questioned, puzzled by what he had said. Eighty-six stitches. I currently hold the record of all of us brothers, Noah shrugged. I try to stay away from all knives, pointy things, or in this case, an axe. Although I do believe that Max was responsible for a fair share of those stitches. You're joking, Elle raised an eyebrow. I'm not, Noah said dryly. Oh, come on, Elle laughed. You can't be that bad. It's a gift, he shrugged. Here, she thrust the axe into his hands. You hold it with both hands like it's a baseball bat. Hit the tree near the base, three or four inches off the ground as we want to get as much trunk as possible so that we don't need to trim off too many of the bottom branches. You sure about this? Noah raised an eyebrow. You've played baseball, right? She asked. Yes. Noah set down the axe and took off his coat. I warned you about this, so if we end up in the hospital for stitches, I'm entirely blaming you. Elle laughed as he picked up the axe. He'll be fine. Noah hefted the axe and began swinging. Once he got into a bit of a rhythm, it wasn't bad. He was making real progress. He was actually enjoying the woodsman thing. Until it happened. Noah had changed direction, coming from the other side of the tree. He didn't want the thing to fall on him, so he thought if he just propped his foot against the trunk while he did the last few strokes, it would fall away in the other direction. He was careful, but on the fourth strike with the axe, he misjudged. Or his coordination was off. Or something, because the axe went where it wasn't supposed to. Elle had started gathering up some greenery, using a small saw. When she didn't hear the axe anymore, she turned around, expecting Noah to have succeeded and have a falling tree for them to carry to the car. Instead, the tree was still standing and Noah was leaning on the axe handle like a cane. What happened? she asked as she came back to him. What always happens? Noah ground out. He pulled off his scarf. I'm going to take off my shoe. If you could wrap my foot with the scarf, that would be great. How did you do that? El cried out as he pulled his foot out of the sneaker. She blanched at the blood and quickly wrapped the wound. I'm brilliantly talented, Noah winced should be wrapped tighter. Are you sure? El looked at the foot. It was bleeding a lot. She swallowed thickly and blinked rapidly. Yep. Noah had enough experience to know. Okay. El adjusted the bandage, trying not to notice how much blood there was. Noah cringed while taking a deep breath. Hospital? Please. Do you need some help? She looked up at him. He nodded and put an arm around her shoulder, leaning on her. He let go of the offending axe, and she put her arm around his waist. Slowly, Noah hopped his way with her through the woods, which weren't exactly feeling as magical as before. "'What about your coat and shoe?' El asked. Later, Noah would like to have his coat back, but the shoe was useless with a big hole in it. The trees were a bit confusing. "'Are we going the right way?' "'Yes,' El said with forced calm. She hated the sight of blood." She felt woozy, but tried to ignore it by concentrating on breathing evenly. It's just up ahead. Good, Noah said grimly. He was sure he wasn't going to bleed to death, but it really did hurt. Finally, they emerged from the trees to the farm and parking area. The owners were alarmed and offered a free tree, greenery, and delivery. El thanked them, and Noah promised he had no intention of suing. He urged El to the car. It didn't take long for El to get him to the hospital. He opted to hop in rather than wait for her to get a wheelchair. It didn't take long for him to get put in a bed once they saw the bloody scarf around his foot. A cheerful little nurse came in to clean his wound. Hi, I'm Kelly and I'll be your nurse. She looked a little more than a teenager that hadn't even graduated high school, let alone having a nursing degree. Let's just have a look at this. As she began to unwrap it, Elle got really pale. I think I'll just sit in the waiting room a moment. Noah gave her a look of concern. Are you okay? I'm not big on blood, El said, feeling a little lightheaded. Then you should definitely go to the waiting area and sit down. Maybe have a coffee, even, Kelly suggested. 
I'll get you after he's all stitched and bandaged up. That would be great, El said quickly and left. She seems nice, but when you have kids, you'll be the one dealing with the boo-boos. Kelly pulled out a pair of scissors and began to cut off his sock. We're not together, Noel explained. What kind of nurse said boo-boos? He wasn't feeling too confident about her abilities. Oh, I'm sorry. I just thought the two of you made such a nice couple. Kelly peeled off the last of the sock and examined the wound. That's not too bad. When it said axe on the chart, I was thinking severed foot. She grinned at him, and he wondered if she was even a nurse or just an escapee from the psych ward. She had a name tag, but those could be faked. He'd watched movies where that happened. Ten or twelve stitches, and you should be good to go. I doubt the doctor will even want an x-ray. She squirted a solution into the wound, and he jerked, hissing in pain. I should have warned you. It'll sting a little. No kidding, Noah gritted out between his teeth. Just once more, and then the doctor will be here to stitch you up she said cheerily and squirted the bottle again. Is your tetanus shot up to date? Noah managed better this time now that he knew what to expect from the cold and stinging liquid. Yes. Aren't you going to do the stitches? No, nope, that's a doctor thing. Or in your case, you get an intern. Don't worry, he's really good, she chirped and disposed of the bottle. She wrapped some gauze around his foot. This is just for while you're waiting. It won't be too long. Thanks, Noah said dryly. How old are you? Twenty-four, she grinned. I bet you never would have guessed correctly. No, he allowed. He thought she was lying, even now. That's okay. People think I'm young all the time. Some day, I'll be a grateful eighty who looks sixty. It'll be fantastic, Kelly smiled. I'll check how long the doctor's going to be. That would be great, Noah agreed. She was far too cheery. Forty minutes later, and he was stitched and bandaged. He limped to the waiting room after being discharged. L was sitting with a coffee. She looked up at him guiltily. "'I'm sorry. I just couldn't stay any longer,' she explained. "'I don't do blood very well.' "'It's okay,' Noah had a tired smile. "'My mom is the same way. She often wonders how she made it through all three of us. Although, to be fair, it's mainly Max and I that were in need of doctoring.' "'You did warn me,' Elf smiled back. "'Ready to go?' We should pick up my coat in your tree, Noah said. Everything has already been delivered to the restaurant, she said. The owners called and made sure we got everything. He was very apologetic and concerned for you. I'll be fine. I've done worse, Noah shrugged. You should take some time off, El said as they got to her car. The doctor said I can work, Noah clarified for her. I just have to be a bit careful. You're taking the rest of today off, at least, she was firm about it. We'll see how you feel tomorrow. Fine. Noah was not going to argue with her. It was easier this way, and it would be nice to have the rest of the day for himself. Plus, the freezing was starting to wear off in the stitches, and it was a little painful. When they got to the restaurant, Polly informed them that the tree had been set up in its usual corner. There was a case of cider in the kitchen, and Griff's certificate from the owner of the tree farm. Noah picked up his shoe from atop his coat, and decided as he might as well put it on. It would be better than walking around with just a bandage on his foot. He sat on the kitchen stool and started undoing the laces when Max came in with a tote full of dishes. Don't start, Noah warned his brother, who ignored his warning. Did he warn you that he's not allowed to have sharp objects? Max asked El as he put the tote down. He did, but it was just an axe, El protested. He's a grown man, and I honestly thought he was joking. Not joking, Noah said at the same time Max did. Really? Elf shrugged. What grown man is banned from sharp things? He is, Max motioned to his brother. Every time he gets involved with tools, knives, or anything like that, it's like he has the moment where rational thought goes away, and he ends up needing a trip to the hospital. Hey, it wasn't quite like that, Noah protested. Really? Max questioned as he looked at Noah in disbelief. At what point did you think it was a good idea to put your foot in the way of an axe? I just wanted to make sure the tree didn't fall on me, Noah muttered as he put his shoe on very carefully. Max nodded, satisfied with the answer. See? Rational judgment went out the window. Everyone else would just think, Hmm, if I put my foot here, will the axe end up in my foot? Yup, bad idea. Noah just has a, this should work, along with a hold my beer moment. 
hold my beer? Noel raised an eyebrow as he loosely laced the sneaker. It was not a hold my beer moment. What's a hold my beer moment? El asked, uncertain where the conversation was going. That's when the drunk guy gets a stupid idea that is usually going to hurt and asks someone to hold his beer so he can show them all how it's done. Max shook his head and pointed to Noah's foot. He usually ends up with a trip to the hospital. I wasn't drunk. I had no beer, Noah said dryly. You got the foot in a bandage. What was so point proven? You're lucky it's not in a cast, Max said. How many stitches? Twelve, he muttered. What's that make your total now? Max folded his arms. Ninety-eight, Noah shrugged. It's not a big deal. No power tools, no knives, no knitting needles, no arrows or darts, no scissors, and you can add axes to that list, Max said grimly, marking each item off his fingers. If I could ban you from pens, I would. Come on, Noah protested. That was one time. What happened with the pen? Polly asked curiously. He leaned back to watch the brothers. It ended up through my hand, Noah shrugged. It was part of a science experiment. He built a mini cannon to launch a small items like a missile. However, he put his hand over the mouth of the cannon when he was checking it, Max explained. It wasn't launching, so I wanted to check to see if there was a crack or something affecting it. Noah tried to play it down. It really wasn't a big deal. It was a slow launch, which worked perfectly, except that your hand was in the way. Max shook his head, remembering. He had the pen, one of those thick ones, sticking through the middle of his palm. Mom fainted. There was a bit of blood, Noah admitted. His hand still had the scar. How old were you when you did this? El asked. Thirteen, Noah replied. See, he just doesn't think in the moment. Max tapped his head with a finger. He just does and then bleeds. I promised no more axes, okay? Noah rolled his eyes. It was an axe and a tree. It looked like fun. Max just shook his head. You're one to talk, Noah said. Just how many broken bones haven't you had? That's like comparing apples to oranges, Max protested. I did some stupid stunts growing up, but I've recognized that I should stop doing certain things. You just keep going. You got stuck down the chimney, and they had to remove the bricks to get you out, Noah remembered. That was when you broke your arm in two places. I was a kid. I wanted to see how Santa would fit, Max explained patiently. Now I'm an adult and I weigh the risks before I do things. Like the time you tried to free climb in Yosemite Park? Noah asked pointedly. I was still pretty young and stupid when I did that, Max allowed. How many bones did you break in that fall? Noah questioned, trying to make a point. Eight, Max sighed. The point is, we've both grown up, and I don't do dangerous stuff anymore, while you still think that you can handle sharp things that your experience in life has taught you that you shouldn't. You don't do dangerous stuff anymore. Noah raised an eyebrow. You're living in a men's shelter, and when you can't live there, you admit to living on the streets. That's not dangerous? We're not talking about this. Max began to rinse out the plates and load the dishwasher. You don't want to understand anyways. Understand? Noah limped over to Max. Please, let me understand why you're punishing yourself for something you didn't do. It's Shannon, Noah. Max glared at his brother. I'm her godparent, and I'm supposed to help protect her and guide her through life, but she's not going to have one for much longer because of what our company did. Don't you get that? I held her when she was a baby. I made those promises, and I was an instrument in her eventual death. You tell me how I'm not guilty for that. You didn't know, Noah exclaimed. I didn't know. Michael didn't know. No one knew except for the lab technicians who skewed the results and whoever gave them the orders to do so. It's not your fault. It is. There is no justice in this. No one was found responsible. No one paid for these deaths, all because our father made sure that Ramsley Farmer was found not guilty at the trial. Max shrugged. Well, I'm going to make sure that those families get help for what we did. If that means my going without so that they don't worry about the bills while their kid is dying, then so be it. You don't need to go without, Noah pleaded. You can live with me, or I can get you a place. It wouldn't cost you anything. Noah, you don't get it. It's Shannon. I held her in my arms at her baptism. I've been there for all the birthdays. She's an awesome kid, and I feel like I failed her. Max wiped his hands on a towel. Maybe I do feel like I need to be punished for what happened. 
Max, it wasn't your fault. Noah protested, putting a hand on Max's shoulder. Just lay off, Noah. Max shrugged away from his brother. I'm going to take a break. Let him go. I'll put a hand on Noah's arm. He needs to be alone right now. Why don't you go home? Take tomorrow off to give Max a little space and help your foot heal. Aurora's back, so we'll manage for a day. Noah nodded. He didn't like leaving things unresolved, but El was right. It would be better to give Max a little time. Chapter 4 Noah tried not to be too critical of the men's shelter as he entered it. It was in a worn-down neighborhood, in a worn-down building. Someone had bought on-sale green three decades back to put on the walls. Homeless and other assorted peoples littered the streets outside. The clerk, an overweight middle-aged woman, looked him over from behind a glass window. She had a clipboard and a pen. Her name tag said Mindy. She looked to be in charge of buzzing people in. It was obvious she was certain he didn't need their services. Are you looking for someone? Yes, Max Ramsley, Noah said. We don't let out the names of the people who stay here, she warned. Noah sighed. That's fine. If you could just let Max know that his brother Noah is here and would like to speak to him, I would appreciate it. He may not be here, Mindy advised tersely. If he's not, or if he would prefer not to see me, I'll understand, Noah said evenly. He really did not like her attitude, but he wasn't in a position to argue with her. She gave him a look of suspicion, but got off her stool and waddled through a door. Noah waited patiently for ten minutes before she returned. She stuck a clipboard under the glass opening. Fill this out. Noah refrained from pointing out that he could have filled out the form while she was searching for Max. He scribbled in his details and signed a waiver. She gave him a visitor's pass in exchange for the clipboard. You are not authorized to use any of the facilities such as showers, cots, or to get food from the cafeteria. You are not to abuse or threaten either verbally or physically any residents or staff. If you are found to be in violation of any of these rules, you will be removed from the premises and banned for a total of 30 days for the first offense. Subsequent offenses may involve a lifetime ban or police involvement. You have 30 minutes of visiting time. To go beyond that is to lose further visiting privileges. Do you understand the rules, Mr. Ramsley? Mindy droned. Yes. Noah wondered if she had formally run a prison. He clipped the visitor pass to his shirt. I'll buzz you in. She proceeded to do so. Noah stepped through the door to find Max waiting for him. Thought I'd come for a visit. Are you sure you're not here to judge? Max asked guardedly. He had his arms crossed and wasn't looking forward to Noah looking over the shelter. No judging, Noah said, despite the fact that he already didn't like the place. I just want to see that you're safe. Max rolled his eyes. I'm not twelve any more. I didn't say you were, Noah sighed. Look, I'm sorry. I'm your brother, and I automatically worry about you. Michael says you're okay, you've camped in worse places around the world, and he's probably right. But I just still need to know you're okay. You always were the mother hen, Max said, sighing. Hey, not cool, Noah remarked. Come on, I'll give you the tour. Max led the way through. He showed Noah the sleeping area, full of cots, the shower and restrooms, the cafeteria full of tables and chairs. All the furniture was old. The green paint carried throughout the shelter. It was clean, but depressing. The cafeteria served three meals a day. Some people were gathered at the tables playing cards. They all looked tired and a little hardened by life. Noah gritted his teeth and did his best not to say anything disparaging. He hoped Max appreciated the effort. They sat down at a table. "'So, how long do you get to be here?' Noah was curious. Thirty days. Then you can't come back for another month,' Max explained. "'There's another shelter on Johnson Street that allows people to stay for two weeks at a time. Of course, there has to be openings at the shelter, which is more difficult in the winter because everyone is trying to stay warm.' "'What happens if you run out of days at both shelters or can't get in?' Noah questioned. Max shrugged. "'You go on to another shelter. "'Or if it's summer and then there's a place under the bridge by Wolseley "'or in one of the park areas. "'Not the nice parks. "'The police will tell you to move on out of those. "'There's decent enough parks around Elm.' 
and in winter. It was November now, and Noah wondered what Max would do in the harsh cold. There's a rooming house on Delaware Street, but it's costly. Some people live in some of the abandoned buildings around here, but that's a bit dangerous. Druggies tend to hang out in those places, and they can get raided by the police. Most people end up on the sewer vents to stay warm. If you got a sleeping bag, you're usually okay. Max didn't look at Noah. Sometimes you can get away with staying in the subway area. Noah reined in his temper. It wouldn't help if all he did was yell at Max for how stubbornly stupid he was being. Max, what if I paid for an apartment for you, just for the winter? No, Max shook his head. I'd rather you spent that money for the kids. I'll match it to the fund, Noah insisted. Then you should put that doubled amount in the fund. Max ran a hand through his hair. It's underfunded. I'm getting behind in payments because I'm not making as much money since I got laid off in the demolition company. I can't justify living in comfort when families could go bankrupt paying for palliative care for their kids. Care their kids wouldn't need if it weren't for Ramsey Pharma. How much are you underfunded by? Noah asked quietly. He hated that Max was putting himself through, but he could understand his brother's motivation. This month it's 150000 alone. Max swallowed thickly. I'm drowning in it. I promised these families that I would figure out how to pay for this. Maybe we could run a fundraiser, Noah thought out loud. A Christmas benefit. I'll put up the initial costs. You do that? Max asked. You're my brother, Max. I'm going to help you however I can, Noah pledged. I know Michael will give. Michael? Max scoffed. Why would he give? He sided with Dad. He's the one who eventually got the drug pulled, Max. He had to do a lot of work behind the scenes to make that happen. Noah wondered how much he should disclose of Michael's efforts on Max's behalf. He didn't know how much Max was ready to hear. He didn't want to side with Dad, but he didn't see an alternative at the time. There was an alternative. We all could have walked and sent a message to Dad, the company and the business world, that we won't accept corruption. We could have forced Dad to accept responsibility and take care of those families like he should have, Max insisted. Noah sighed. Part of him liked that Max still had that idealism, the naive attitude that was just simple action. He could change things. It's not that simple. Why? Why couldn't it have been that simple? Max wanted to know. He still didn't understand why Noah hadn't followed him out of Ramsley Pharma. If all three of us had gone at once... There's no way that he could have covered up what was going on. He wouldn't have been able to blacklist all of us without looking like a vindictive loser. How wouldn't it have worked? Because he would have ruined my career, Noah said. Do you remember Brianna Tully? How could I not? What does that have to do with anything? Max asked. He'd been young, maybe 19, and involved with Brianna. Thankfully, the paternity test had come back negative. He'd learned to be a lot more careful after that experience. I had a psychology test coming up, and I'd been putting it off studying. I hated that course. When you called me that night, I was supposed to be studying for that test, which was scheduled for the next morning. Instead, I went to see you, and we talked through the whole situation about Brianna, and celebrated after you found out the results. Noah rubbed his face, frustrated. I should have just failed the test the next day and retaken it for a lower score. Instead, I knew a friend of a friend who, for a fee, would give out the answers. I cheated, Max. I don't understand. What has that got to do with anything? Max asked. If it gets out that I cheated on the test, it puts the rest of my academic career under suspicion. The university will pull my degrees. All my work becomes suspect. No one will want to employ me in the field of science, Noah explained. Dad knows. He's threatened to expose my mistake. He personally would ruin me. That's why I couldn't follow you, Max. I would never work as a scientist again. Over one test? Max could hardly believe it. It's a matter of reputation. My work is only as good as my credibility. So I screwed up your life, too, Max remarked quietly. What? No. I chose to cheat, Max. I didn't have to, yet I did. Noah reached out and squeezed Max's shoulder. It's not your fault, and it wasn't your fault about getting the diabetic drug through early. The results from the laboratory were skewed from the beginning. There was no way that you could have known. I feel like I'm responsible, Max said. You're not, Noah tried to assure him. 
Is he blackmailing Michael? Max wanted to know. No matter the hard feelings he had for his oldest brother, he still loved him. Noah heaved a sigh. I don't know what the old man has on Michael, but he toes the line better than anyone I know. He's practically Dad's shadow. He does what he can to mitigate what Dad does sometimes, but mostly he is a yes-man, which makes me think that whatever Dad is blackmailing him with, it's pretty big. Max took a deep breath. I had no idea. How could you know? We didn't tell you, Noah reflected. We won the lottery on parents. One wonderful mom and one nasty dad. Michael has never confided in you? Max asked. No, Michael doesn't confide in anyone, Noah said. Privately, he thought that Michael had a very lonely life. He didn't envy him. Now I know you and Michael aren't speaking right now, but I hope some day you'll forgive him, Max. He does miss you. Max nodded. I'm still mad at him, but I miss him. Are you still mad at me? Noah wanted to know. He wanted to repair the damage that had been done and have his brother's respect back. A little, Max admitted. Not as much as before. Cool. Noah stretched out his injured foot and looked around. You could move in with me. I have an extra room in the condo. Will you give it up? Max shook his head and smiled. I'm fine. Noah shrugged. If you hit a tight spot, you know where I live. I'd rather you come over than get frostbite or something. I'll give you a key. Just count it as an option, okay? Fine. If it makes you happy, I'll take the key. But that doesn't mean I'm sleeping over, Max warned. It's just an option, Noah said mildly. He felt just getting Max to agree to take a key was a small victory. Now, let's talk details on this fundraiser thing. The sooner he got Max solvent, the sooner his brother would go back to living a normal life. Chapter 5 Elle came into the diner with the bag of costumes over her shoulder. It was heavy. She'd gone to see Carrie down the street at her store, the Fabric House, because she was a local member of the Commerce for Business. Carrie had been full of good information. Also, a little bit of bad information. This year's theme was not a Victorian Christmas, as Elle had rather hoped, but instead Santa's workshop. This meant an entire change of costumes. Instead of quaint, old-fashioned dress for the waitstaff, it meant elf gear. Santa and Mrs. Claus were all sold out at this time of the year. Elle loved Christmas, but she had the feeling she was going to be pushing it a little far with the costumes. She put them on an unused table and sat down. The mall had been a madhouse. It had taken far too much time out of her day. "'You get costume?' Aurora pawed through the bag. She raised an eyebrow and pulled out green tights. This not pretty dress. Nope, it's Santa's workshop this year. Elle sighed and pulled out a pair of shoe covers that had little round bells on them. It was her compromise to the actual elf slippers that the store had been selling, which were highly impractical for a restaurant. You're kidding me, Noah said flatly as he looked at the items Aurora was holding up. Elves? It's what the store had. Santa and Mrs. Claus are sold out, Elle smiled hopefully. We'll all make cute elves. The customers will love it. I'm not wearing that, Noah said. Nowhere when I was hired did you stipulate that we would have to wear costumes. It's Christmas. The entire block is participating, and we are as well, because it's good for business, Elle insisted. She grabbed a complete costume for herself. I'm going to get changed, and you'll see that it's not so bad. You will look cute as an elf. I will look like an overgrown idiot, Noah said darkly. I will wear, Aurora declared. I will be sexy elf. Elle and Aurora went to the restroom and tried on the costumes. After a few adjustments, they were passable elves. Elle sighed into the mirror. It wasn't great, but the outfits were easy to wear, and it wouldn't be too hot in the busy restaurant, which was a good thing. Last thing everyone wanted was a sweaty waiter. She tugged at her elf skirt. It was a little short. Aurora put on another layer of lip gloss and pulled on the skirt trying to adjust it to her liking. Not very sexy. No, Elle agreed. I don't think these ones are supposed to be. I have red sweater. We'll wear with it, Aurora said as she eyed herself in the mirror. Is there a reason you want to be sexy? Elle asked dryly. Why not be sexy? Aurora winked. 
Three sexy men work here. All available. L frowned. Noah is dating someone. Dating. Aurora shrugged. Not married yet. L ignored Aurora and left the restroom. She didn't like the idea of Aurora chasing after Noah. She hoped that he would have more sense than to get involved with his fellow employee. L wondered for a moment why she wasn't as concerned for Max, or even Polly, who had an obvious history with Aurora. Pushing the thought aside, she presented herself to Noah. See? It's comfortable. Not on your life, Noah declared. He retreated to the kitchen with L following. Come on, she pleaded. It's for Christmas. The old folks and the kids will adore you as an elf. The kitchen staff stopped working and stared at L. Max burst out laughing. Ramos's mouth twitched and Polly grinned. No, reiterated Noah. Please, oh please, oh please, Max cried as he laughed. Make him an elf. Shut up, Max, Noah glared. Real men wear tights, Max advised cheekily. It's for the kids. Not happening. Noah, I would really appreciate it if you would join us in wearing the costumes. It's just for the week before Christmas during the business night block event. It will look odd if one of the wait staff isn't an elf when the others are, Elle reasoned. Dude, I will forgive you everything past, present, and future if you will wear that, Max chuckled, as long as I get to have a picture. Why don't you wear it? We'll trade jobs for the week, Noah offered. It's for the kids, Max. Nope, Max grinned. You're the waiter. Don't even look at me, Polly put up his hands to ward off any entreaties for him to wear the outfit. It's all you, Noah. Please, El said as Aurora entered the kitchen. The waitress had already changed back to her regular clothing. Noah shook his head and sighed. He's caving, Max crowed. This is all your fault, Noah glared at Max. If you weren't working here, I wouldn't be forced into doing this. Nobody asked you to follow me, Max said repentantly as he grinned. No picture, growled Noah. Then I'm still not talking to you, Max shrugged. I think... At this point, I'm the one who's not talking to you, Noah glowered at Max. They are like children, Aurora said mildly to Polly. Yeah, kind of entertaining to watch, Polly replied. Aurora shrugged. You think children entertaining? Sometimes. Polly gave her an odd look, wondering what she was driving at. Aurora shrugged again. Elle rolled her eyes at the pair before turning to Noah. Thank you, Noah. I really appreciate it. The customers will love it. Noah shook his head. I can't believe I'm agreeing to this. Sucker, Max smirked. Don't you have dishes to do? Noah asked darkly. Yep, Max said happily. Let's get some of the decorations up while it's not so busy. Elle decided to separate the brothers. Max can help Ramos do some extra cleaning in the kitchen. Aurora and Polly can help us in the restaurant. I'm going to get changed. Polly, can you grab the tree and decorations out of storage? Sure thing, boss, Polly said. Come on, elves, we got work to do. Not funny, Noah muttered as he and Aurora followed Polly. Very funny, Max called after them. You should stop giving him such a hard time, Elv replied dryly. Where would be the fun in that? Max asked as he grinned. We always push each other a little. It's a brother thing. He's trying. You've made him work for this long enough. Al leaned on the dishwashing counter. Have you forgiven him yet? Sure, he just doesn't know it yet, Max said easily. Maybe you should tell him, Al advised. And miss out on all of the fun of making him work here? No way. He grabbed a scour pad and pot. Well, I hope you know what you're doing, Al said. There comes a point when people sometimes give up if they feel they aren't making any progress. He's concerned about you and only wants what is best for you. He wants what is best on his terms, Max clarified. I'd just appreciate it if he would lay off about how I'm choosing to live. He doesn't understand. No, he doesn't. And neither do I, Elf said. She laid a hand on his arm. He just wants to feel like you're safe and okay. That's hard to do when you're living out of shelter and who knows where else. No one loves you. Family is important, Max, no matter how much they irritate us. Max blew out a breath in weary frustration. They turned their backs on me, Al. I did the right thing, and I'm the one who got punished for it. I know it's not Noah's fault, but I'm having a bit of a hard time letting go of that. That is hard, Al sympathized. Sometimes we need to forgive, though. 
not for their sakes, but for our own. It's hard to carry around unhappiness. It eats at the soul. Max nodded reluctantly. I'm not really mad at Noah anymore. I'm still angry at Michael and definitely at Dad. Have you tried talking to either of them? Elle asked. No. Maybe you should, she said. I don't think that's a good idea at this point, Max sighed. I don't know if Dad and I will ever repair our relationship. Maybe, someday, Michael and I can talk. I know you probably won't be celebrating Christmas with your family, so if you'd like, you can celebrate with mine. We put on a nice meal and play board games, Elle offered. She felt for him and wished she could do more. Thanks, Elle. I like that. Max was moved by her offer. Elle gave him a hug. She felt bad about Max's situation and hoped that giving him this job and providing holiday memory would help him. She would hate to be alone for Christmas. Noah cleared his throat. Polly wants to know if you want the entire village taken out of storage as well. Yes, Elle let go of Max and went out of the kitchen. Noah looked at his brother a moment before following Elle. He wasn't comfortable with seeing Elle in Max's arms. He wasn't sure what he had interrupted. It couldn't be that big of a deal with Ramos in the kitchen with the two of them, but he still didn't like it. Noah helped to unpack boxes of ornaments, carefully laying them out on an empty table. He tried to analyze his emotions and found that he might be a little jealous, which was silly, because it was his brother and Elle. Elle, who looked beautiful even as an elf. The green tights had showed off her curvy legs. Noah scowled. Max had always been a bit of a charmer with the ladies. He hoped that Max wasn't putting any moves on Elle. A knot coiled in his stomach. He had feelings for her, and that wasn't good. He was supposed to be dating Bethany. Beth, who was sweet and a good friend. Beth, who deserved a guy who was faithful and protective of her. He looked up to see Elle come back, dressed in her regular black slacks and white blouse. She smiled as she saw Polly and Aurora arguing over where to put the two kissing bows, and her smile took his breath away. He felt a pull of desire for her and knew that was a bad idea. He wasn't like some guys who tried to juggle two women at once. While he and Bethany were just going out as friends, he wouldn't feel right denning Elle at the same time. And he couldn't stop seeing Beth for now, since that was part of the bargain that he had with his father. Better to try to put the idea of Elle from his mind, he resolved. Elle started poking through the boxes beside him, unwrapping little snowing buildings that would light up when plugged in. We got this when I was six. I had the chicken pox and it was entirely miserable. Mama let me pick it out that year. This one we got when I was eight. It was my father's turn to pick out the building and he liked this church. Noah listened to her happy chatter. Is there one for each year? One building for each year since they moved to America. Two ornaments for each year since I was born. Then it was three each year. One for each of us. The tree is starting to get full, but there's still room for plenty more, Elf said. When I was young, the tree was pretty bare, but it was a tradition, and I really liked it since every year it builds on the last year. Each ornament has a special memory attached to it. What about this one? Noah asked, holding up a frosted glass pine cone. The pine cones are from my thirteenth year. We all chose a different color pine cone. Elf smiled happily at the recollection. I'm sad that I won't be able to shop with them for ornaments this year, since they won't be back until just before Christmas Eve. That's a nice tradition, Noah commented. He wondered if maybe some day, when he had kids, if he would do something similar. It certainly seemed to give a lot more meaning to the holiday season than what he had grown up with. He watched Polly set up a step ladder by the kitchen door. Aurora was holding the kissing bow while Polly climbed the rickety contraption. By the kitchen door? Elle made a face. Better than by the till. One year it was there, and every customer insisted on having a kiss while paying their bill. Better than the till. Noah agreed, thinking about Minnie and all the other elderly customers. He continued to unwrap ornaments, setting the cushioning papers in his pile. "'How's your foot doing?' she asked. "'It's fine,' Noah lied. It was throbbing a little, but he would throw some ice on it when he got back to the condo. "'Are you sure?' El raised an eyebrow. "'I noticed you started limping in the past hour. If you need to take the rest of the night off or need to sit down, you can.' "'It's okay,' Noah said. "'Thanks.' Chapter 6 Noah came to see Michael to let him know how things were going with Max, 
but was surprised when Michael barely let him get in the door before asking about Beth. "'What are you doing with Bethany Searson? Last I understood, the two of you barely knew each other, and now you're dating?' Michael asked as he set down a tabloid, open to a picture of Noah and Bethany at a football game. "'I didn't think you read those things,' Noah said. He quickly scanned the small article. It wasn't a big deal, but he wished these people had better things to do than photograph and write about other people who were just trying to go about their daily lives. "'I don't,' Michael said shortly. "'Someone else brought it to my attention. Would you like to explain?' "'I don't have to explain who I date, Michael.' He looked at his brother in surprise. What's really going on here? I have a hunch, and I'm hoping I'm wrong. Michael crossed his arms. Is Dad involved with this? Michael, we're just dating. Noah sat down, trying for a casual pose. Is Dad involved? Michael repeated his question, and Noah knew he wasn't going to let it go. It's a favor to Dad. Noah shrugged as he admitted it. Dad doesn't ask for favors. He demands them. What's really going on, Noah? Michael didn't normally pry into his brother's life, but this wasn't ringing true, and Michael felt concerned. It's not a big deal. Beth and I are hanging out, Noah said nonchalantly. He picked up a pen from Michael's desk and began fiddling with it. He's blackmailing you, Michael said flatly. What is it? For a moment, Michael thought that Noah wasn't going to answer. I cheated on a test. It was college. It was the only time I did it. Instead of studying, I got the answers from a friend of a friend, and I cheated on the test. Psychology class. Never liked that class, but it was a requirement. Noah looked at Michael's framed diplomas on the wall. This gets out. I'm ruined. My career goes in the toilet. They'll take back my degrees. I wouldn't be allowed in a lab. All my published work would be suspect. Just one test that can ruin my life, he sighed. There is one good thing. Dad will never be able to hold it over my head again. I'm doing what he wants, and it should be over. It's never over, Noah, Michael told him. He'll just keep blackmailing you with it to get whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Are you sure you want to do this? He's letting me talk to Max, Noah shrugged. I'm a grown man, and my father is pulling the strings. You don't have to do this, Michael said. I can talk to Dad. It's okay. Bethany's a really nice person. We're taking things slow and working on being friends. Noah tried to forget his feelings for Elle. If he hadn't met Elle, then Bethany might have suited him fine. Don't worry about it, Michael. Don't let Dad make you do anything you don't want to. If you need help, let me know. Michael was worried about it. Any time their father got involved in their lives, it was never for the better. It's fine. Noah got up and tossed the pen back on Michael's desk. Don't even worry about it. How's Max doing? Michael asked quietly. Good. Noah gave a half laugh. He always seems to land on his feet. Michael nodded. It was true that their brother, no matter his circumstances, always seemed to lead a charmed life. There is one thing, though. His funds for the kids is massively short. I was hoping to help him set up a fundraiser for it. I could use your help, Noah said. How soon does he need the funds? Michael asked. Sooner the better. It's short hundred and fifty grand this month alone. Noah frowned. With it being Christmas and so many fundraisers going on already, I'm not sure I can pull it off. What if instead we called around and asked for pledges? There would be less cost involved, and if we just target people we know, they'll be more likely to give, Michael said. We can put a list of people together. That's a good idea, Noah agreed. The sooner Max gets out from under these hospital bills, the sooner he can start over. Do you need to get back to the restaurant right away? Or do you have time to sit and brainstorm? Noah checked his watch. I should get going. Then message me people as you think of them. I'll put together a list. We'll divide it up and see how much we can get for Max. Max should get a third of the list. It's his charity, Noah said dryly. Plus, it'll make him feel like we aren't interfering as much as helping him. Good point. Tell him it's a competition. Whoever gets the least has to pay out for something. Michael remembered how they had always made things into competitions when they were younger to get Max to finish things. <laughs> Steak dinners at Lafrito's. Noah named one of the brother's favorite restaurants. 
Sounds good, Michael said. As long as Max is willing to sit down with me. He might be. Noah didn't want to get Michael's hopes up, but he had faith that Max would recognize the effort they were putting in for him. We'll leave it up to him. Michael nodded. You'd better get going. I wouldn't want you to get in trouble with your new boss. L? Noah shrugged, trying to be nonchalant. She's okay. Michael raised an eyebrow. Noah decided to leave before his observant brother could start questioning him about L. I'll see you later. Anne caught him as he was exiting the office. Noah, your father wants to see you. How did he even know I was here? Noah asked in surprise. Honestly, I think he gets an update from security every fifteen minutes as to where everyone is, Anne said dryly. It's a bit spooky. Noah sighed. I don't expect much ever slips past his notice. Anne grimaced and chose not to comment. She had never really liked the senior Mr. Ramsley. Michael said you've been talking to Max. How is he? Good. He keeps surprising me, Noah smiled. No matter what he does, he seems happy. Well, that's good, Anne said. I'm glad he's okay and you guys are talking again. Me too, Noah sobered. I had better go see Dad. Anne nodded and went back to work as Noah left. It didn't take long for Noah to reach his father's office. He knocked on the door, waiting for David's summons for him to enter. "'You wanted to see me?' Noah asked as he took a seat. He settled back in the expensive leather chair, waiting to see what his father wanted. David folded his hands and set them on the rich mahogany desk. "'You've been dating Bethany for a while now.' "'A few weeks,' Noah clarified. "'It's going well.' David nodded. It's time for you to buy a ring. Excuse me? Noah sat straight up. I agreed to date her, not to marry her. I didn't say to pop the question yet. I said to buy a ring. David settled back in his chair, his eyes narrowing as he watched his middle son. I'll let you know when the time is right to propose. Dad, we agreed I would date her. I'm holding up my end of the bargain, Noah said. I'm not marrying Beth. We barely know each other. Your mother and I were wed six months after we met. David waved away Noah's concerns. Is there something wrong with the girl? No. However, I never agreed to marry her, Noah stated firmly. I don't care. David shrugged. You will buy a ring, and when I tell you to propose to the girl, you will. If you don't, you can kiss your life here at Ramsley Farm a goodbye. Dad, you can only push me so far, Noah warned. No career. You'll never speak to your mother or Michael again. No university degree. No university that will ever let you enroll to get another degree. I'll revoke your shares in the company. I'll sue you for everything you own for the damage that your mistake will have done to my company. And you know I will win. You'll be bankrupt. Friendless and blacklisted. David ticked off his threats on his fingers. I think I can push you a long way. I'd be free of you. No, I'd never felt such dislike for another person in his life. It would be worth it to walk out on his father. It would be a hard life, but it was looking more appealing every moment. I'd start over just like Max has. <laughs> we both know that's not going to happen. You like the condo, the BMW, the bank account, the career. David smiled. Now go buy a ring. Something worthy of a Ramsley. Like I said, you don't need to propose yet. Just get used to the feel of it. The idea of it. I'll let you know when it's time to get down on one knee. It was just a ring. It wasn't an irreversible commitment yet. He knew David was leading him the way he wanted him to go in baby steps. He resented every one of those steps. I'll buy the ring. But if I propose, it'll be to whoever I want, when I want. Sure, David agreed easily, and Noah felt a moment of nervousness at the old man's easy agreement. You do that, son. Noah stood. He wasn't going to sit here any longer. He didn't think he could without exploding in anger. He let himself out of the office and heard David's laughter following him. Noah gritted his jaw and kept walking. He was being played, and there was little he could do about it except either buckle down and do what his father wanted, or simply leave. Leaving was looking like the better option all the time. It was just a ring. He could buy a simple ring and keep it hidden away. 
When the time came, he could tell David it wasn't going to happen. His father could not force him to do this. Noah tried to reassure himself with the thought. He wasn't very reassured. He thought about Michael's offer to help and wondered if he should take it. Noah wondered if that would be even worse. While Michael wanted to help, what would he have to trade or do to attain Noah's freedom? Nothing was free with David. No, it would be better to leave Michael out of this. Noah rubbed his face and got in his car. He slumped in the seat. He was late for work again. L wasn't going to be happy. He wasn't too happy himself. With a sigh of resignation, he started the BMW and drove to the restaurant. He was careful to park in the back of the lot and made his way through the alley to enter by the kitchen. "'You're late!' Polly yelled as he grabbed a couple of salads and put them on the counter, ready to be served to the customers. "'Really? I hadn't noticed.' Noah pointed to his watch. He shrugged out of his coat, hanging it up. "'What's up with that?' Max asked as he squirted dish soap into the sink. "'Is this a new thing with you?' "'Not getting to work any faster if I have to stand here talking to you.' Noah went into the restaurant. He wondered how serious El had been about firing him if he was late again. He supposed he'd find out. She gave him a look that promised to talk as he wound the apron around his waist and tied the strings. Noah took over his section of the restaurant. He was starting to be a pro at this job. He might need it. For a moment he allowed himself to imagine living on a reduced income and just doing a job much like this one. It wasn't something he wanted to do. He had to admit he liked his lifestyle and couldn't see himself struggling paycheck to paycheck. He knew that millions of people did it every single day, and he had a new respect for them, because he didn't want to go there. Maybe Max was braver than he was, Noah thought. Being broke and just surviving while deliberately choosing that lifestyle for a better cause, that took a lot of guts. Noah sighed. Maybe he was a coward. The thought hurt. He diligently served his customers, trying to be pleasant. When he got a moment, he went to L. L, I'm sorry I was late. I understand if you want to let me go, but I'd really appreciate keeping the job. L sighed. What's going on, Noah? Are you okay? I'm okay, he said, fiddling with his pen. I'm just sorry that I put you in this position. You're not fired. L tilted her head as she studied him. If you need anything, just let me know. I will. He lied the promise, knowing that he wouldn't go to her. She wasn't in a position to fix what was wrong anyways. Thanks. After his shift at the restaurant, Noah found himself at Beth's condo, talking on the phone. Noah and Michael had made up the list, then divided it out. They made certain Max got the most likely donors, so that he wouldn't have to shell out for the expensive steak dinners. It was cheating, but it was in their brother's favor, so neither one felt any guilt about it. Since Noah knew that Michael would likely get Anne involved in helping him, Noah didn't feel bad about enlisting Bethany to help him. It was a competition between Michael and him. He intended to win and have Michael pay for the dinner. One, because he hated to lose to either of his brothers. And two, because he wanted Max to come to the dinner to see Michael. And the best way to have that happen was to have Michael pay, making it a win for Max. He hoped they would both come. He was pretty confident Michael would, since it was his idea. Now he and Bethany were both on their phones trying to cajole money out of their relatives, friends, co-workers, and the people on the list that Michael had given them. Bethany's parents had already donated a tidy sum, and they were steadily working down their expanded list that the two of them had put together. It was nice, Noah decided, just sitting in the living room with her, both working together on a common goal. He delayed starting his next call and just listened to her gently discuss the benefits of the fund to a potential donor. Part of him was glad that they were getting along so well, and that they were becoming friends. Another part was dreading buying a ring for her. He supposed there were lots of nice evenings with Beth in his future. It shouldn't be such a depressing thought. Bethany hung up on her collar, writing down an amount beside the name. She looked up at Noah curiously. Everything okay? Fine. I was just thinking how lucky I am to have you help me, he lied. He was becoming a good liar lately, something else he detested. Noah glanced at his watch. We should get going. Bethany put aside the paperwork, and they both got dressed warmly. Tonight's excursion was going to be a bit cold, and the forecast called for a light dusting of snow overnight. What did you manage? 
Thirty-two thousand. Noah waited as she locked her door, then extended his arm for her to take. You? Bethany smiled. Thirty-four and a half. You're beating me, Noah grinned. I'll have to step up my game. I think, between the both of us, we might manage to raise nearly one hundred thousand for Max's fund, Bethany mused. How are you going to be certain that Max doesn't lose the bet? Michael put in a dummy company and gave it to Max. I don't know who he's going to get to pick up the phone, but hopefully it's the last company Max calls. Then we'll guesstimate what he's cleared and top it up with our own cash. All we need to do is make sure that he makes a little more than either Michael or I, Noah explained. And if it's not the last number he contacts, Bethany wondered, then what? We'll make sure he tells us his numbers first, Noah shrugged. I don't like to do it, but one of us will lie and just happen to be short a few hundred or so. What if he checks the deposits? Bethany thought about their tactic. Is there a way that you can check his deposits into the fund? Noah laughed. Not without criminal charges against us. It's his fund. We don't have access. That's a shame. Bethany snuggled up to him a little closer in the cold as they walked. It would have made things more certain. I suppose if the deposits don't add up, we could always say it was an accounting error on our part. I'm not sure Max would believe that, since we're all good at math. But as long as it's in the favor of the winner and not the loser, that's okay, Noah shrugged. I like that you're doing this for him, she said. I wish my family was closer. Your parents seem pretty close to you, he looked down at her in surprise. They are, but my brother lives in Taiwan. I hardly ever see him or talk to him, she sighed. It's a different dynamic between you and your brothers. You're all very involved in each other's lives. I envied that a little. That's a good thing that we decided to be friends, Noah said. I suppose I could let you borrow my brothers once in a while, when I'm annoyed by them especially. Bethany smiled at that. I don't know if you want to do that. They might like me better than you. Ouch, Noah remarked at her joke. He was actually pleased that she felt comfortable enough to tease him. It took them only a few minutes to reach the outdoor rink that had been set up for the holidays. There was a large crowd there enjoying the Christmas lights, skating, and hot treats for sale. Finding an empty bench, they put it on their skates and took to the rink. Both were competent skaters, and it was easy to just hold hands and glide on the ice, watching and commenting on other couples and children. Noah was getting to know Bethany, and he realized that while she might express herself much more mildly than anyone else, the feelings were there. It was obvious she adored children as much as most women. He knew it wouldn't be a hardship to be married to her and have kids. He just didn't want to. Yet he was supposed to buy a ring. Noah swallowed down the thought. He supposed it had better be time to up his game in the relationship also. Otherwise it would look odd if he suddenly presented Beth with a ring when he had even yet to kiss her. He wasn't sure if she was ready for that. He guessed he would find out soon enough. He bought them both hot chocolate. He asked her what she would like to do on their next outing. They tossed around ideas and eventually settled on tobogganing or a hockey game. Depending on when he could get tickets would depend on which came first. Both things he had done before, but she hadn't, so the outing after these would be something new to both of them. Horseback riding. Noah wasn't all that keen on the idea since he wasn't really an animal person. However, he supposed he could manage it once just for Beth. Afterwards, he walked her back to her condo. He gave her a gentle kiss before bidding her good night. It was a nice kiss, but that was it. He had no desire to repeat it. Noah decided to stall on the ring for as long as he could. Chapter 7 Noah yawned. It was too early. The sun wasn't even up yet, and here he was, winding an apron around his waist. He wandered into the kitchen. Where's Max? Elle was putting an egg on toast. She took a bite out of it. He's late. I hope this isn't going to be a trend. I need him here on time. Noah frowned. It wasn't like Max to be late. Despite his easygoing attitude, he was punctual. Breakfast? Elle asked as she crunched through another bite. No, I already had mine, Noah said. I'll take a coffee if I could. Help yourself. Noah helped himself to a cup of black coffee. Polly put the last of the delivery of vegetables away, then grabbed a cup of coffee himself. Ramos was already pulling out a couple of flats of eggs in preparation for the customers, which were sure to start coming in shortly. 
Still, there was no sign of Max. It worried Noah. It wasn't a big deal. He was only a few minutes late. Do you have a phone number for Max? Noah asked suddenly. Yes, I have everyone's numbers. It's on the forms I get you to fill out when you start work, El said. Could you call him? Noah asked. He had a weird feeling about this. Noah, he'll be here, El said. He's just a little late. Noah went to the back door and looked out. He didn't see anyone. As long as Max came directly from the men's shelter, he would be going through the side streets. Noah wandered to the corner and had a look. Noah, we need to get started. There are customers coming in. Elle called from the doorway, her breath making a small fog in the air before dissipating. It was dark in the back alleys and side streets. The street lights were few and far between. Noah didn't like it. He looked and was just about to give up when he thought he saw someone leaning on a fence. Grabbing his phone, Noah put on the flashlight option and shone it toward the figure. Max? Noah quickened his steps. What are you doing? Just catching my breath, Max grimaced. He was holding his side and Noah realized there was blood on his brother's face. Noah ran the last few steps. What happened? Could you not shine that in my face? Max squinted. I got jumped by a couple of guys with a baseball bat and steel-toed boots. Noah swore. Can you make it to the diner? Sure, Max said. Give me a hand, will you? Noah carefully brought Max's arm around his shoulders and then put his own arm around Max to help support him. A little lower, Max's breath hitched. Noah complied and Max let out a hiss of pain. Higher? Max nodded. Noah moved his hand up higher on Max's ribs. Break a rib? Cracked a couple, I'm thinking. If anyone would know about broken bones, Max would. How many bones have you broken now? Thirteen? Max let out a short laugh as they walked. You're behind the times. It's seventeen broken bones, four dislocations, forty-two stitches, twelve staples, and one pin. You've got to slow down. Your body isn't going to last if you keep this up, Noah said. They turned the corner, almost there. I'm starting to feel old. My bones are becoming more accurate for rain and snow than the weather, man, Max stumbled. Hey, just a few more steps to go, then you can sit. Noah eyed his brother under street lamp. Bleeding nose, split lip, pale and in obvious pain. I'm calling for an ambulance. Max shook his head. No, I'm, I'm good. I just need a rest and then I'll be fine. You're not good. You're barely upright, Noah replied angrily. I'm not going to the hospital. I let my insurance lapse. Max sighed as he admitted that particular fact. He knew Noah wasn't going to like it. You what? Noah said sharply. Really, Max? What made you think that was a good idea? I put the money in the fund for the kids, Max explained. I wasn't planning on doing anything dangerous, and I'm in really good health. Not doing anything dangerous? You live in a shelter! Noah gritted his teeth. I'll pay for the hospital bills for you, and I'm getting your health insurance back. Noah, you don't need to do that, Max insisted. I don't need a hospital. They had reached the kitchen door, and Noah let Max in. Polly, give us a hand here. Polly quickly set down his knife and helped to support Max on the other side. Ramos shook his head and said something. They grabbed my cell phone and what cash I had on me, Max said to the cook. Fortunately, they weren't interested in my ID. The door to the restaurant swung open and Elle entered. Have you guys seen Noah? I did. Max tried to smile, but it came out as a grimace. Max? Elle stared in shock. I got mugged. Can I sit down? he asked. Ramos grabbed a stool and brought it over. Max gratefully sat and hugged his ribs. This is exactly what I was worried about with you living in a men's shelter, Noah said. It happened on the way to work. Not at the shelter, Max protested. I think I cracked a couple of ribs. That's the worst. Are you absolutely sure they're not busted? Noah asked. He folded his arms and stared down at Max. I know what a broken rib feels like, Max said grimly. I'm pretty sure nothing is broken, just badly bruised. You look like you've lost a battle with a car, El said. I feel like I've lost a battle with a car, Max replied with a half laugh. Noah sighed. When are you going to get a normal place to stay? It doesn't have to be great, just somewhere. I'll pay for it. No, Max said stubbornly. Should we call an ambulance? 
Elle grabbed a towel and wet it. She held it out for Max to clean your face. Thanks. Max gingerly wiped at the blood. I don't need to go to the hospital. They'll do a bunch of x-rays, tell me nothing is broken, that I've got some cracked ribs and to ice my face. They'll recommend pain, meds, and rest. Not a big deal. You look bad, Elf said with a shudder. She tried not to focus on the blood on his face. It looks worse than it is, Max replied. I'm okay. Did you black out? Noah asked. I don't know, Max grimaced. I may have. Which means you probably have a concussion, so you're not working today, Noah said. Elle, is there anywhere we can put him so he can lay down? There's the apartment upstairs, Elle looked at Max doubtfully. As long as he can make it up the steps. Give me a few minutes, Max sighed. I'll make it upstairs. I got this. Elle was beginning to think Max was full of bravado and not much else at the moment. She looked to Noah, who was grimly staring at his brother. We'll probably end up carrying him part of the way, Noah said flatly. Polly set down the first aid kit. Your hand's bleeding. What? Max looked at his hand. Huh, you're right. Polly rolled his eyes and popped open the kit. You guys see to the customers and I'll bandage up our dish monkey. Hey, was I just insulted or complimented? Max asked. Take it however you want. Polly checked out his hand. You got a headache? I got it in the head. It's kind of expected, Max said dryly. Are you dizzy? Polly asked as he wound gauze around the palm. Do you feel nausea? No, and no. I'm fine, Max lied. Noah could tell from the way he was wincing at the light. You're not fine, Noah stated firmly. He had ignored Polly's comment about looking after customers. Right now, looking after his brother was much more important. Max sighed. You worry too much. You always did. You're like one of those mother hens. Thanks a lot. Noel shook his head and folded his arms, watching as Polly bandaged up Max's hand. You're off dishwashing duty with that hand, Elf said. I can't have it getting infected. Hey, I need to work. Give me an hour and a glove and I'll be fine, Max protested. Polly, I need a bit of rolled up gauze, about half an inch worth. Noah snorted. Max, you're not going to be fine in an hour. You still have a job, but you're not working today, Elf stated resolutely. I'll grab the key for the apartment. Elle left, and Polly closed the first aid kit after handing a square of gauze to Max. Okay, tell us how you really feel. I'm fine, Max insisted. He wiggled the tooth, which came out. Max winced and put the gauze in its place. Max, are you serious? Noah shook his head. You're not fine. You need a dentist. Can't afford one right now, Max said around the gauze. It's just one tooth. I got all the rest. Raise the shirt, Polly said. Why? Max asked. So I can see how bad the damage is. You said they used a bat? Polly questioned. And steel-toed boots, Noah added. That's what he said in the alley. Show me the ribs. Polly crossed his arms and steadily stared down at Max. Max sighed. Fine. Noah bit off a curse when Max showed them the bruising. I'm taking you to hospital. Polly looked. Most of the bruising is at the ribs, not the abdomen. That's good. It means it's less likely that there's internal bleeding. See? Polly says I'm okay. Max winced as Polly gently poked him. Nothing's broken. Nothing's shifting, Polly said. Thanks, Max rasped. Elle gasped and dropped the key as she saw the bruising across Max's torso. She put her hands to her mouth. Max lowered his shirt. Polly stuck up a couple of fingers. How many? Two, Max rolled his eyes. What day is it? Tuesday. The date? Polly persisted. November 20th, Max muttered. Do we have a flashlight? Polly asked. Elle grabbed a key from the floor. I thought there was one by the first aid kit. Noah offered his phone. There's a flashlight app. Why do you need a flashlight? Max questioned. I'm okay. Polly shone the flashlight from the phone in his eyes and Max tried to turn his head. Hold still. That's bright, Max complained. I think he has a concussion. It just looks like a lot of bruising and cracked ribs. Polly handed Noah back his phone. You can go to the hospital and rack up a bill, but unless he starts vomiting or the headache gets worse, I'd probably just make him lie down. And where did you get your medical degree? Not to be rude, but this is my brother. Noah looked at Max. 
Holly shrugged. I used to bounce at a fight club before it got shut down. He's your brother. You do what you think is best. Probably end up bringing him to the hospital later anyways. I'm not going to the hospital, Max sighed. Look, if you want, I'll rest for a while. El, could you get the door to the apartment open? Noah looked at Polly. Help me drag him upstairs? Sure thing. Polly put Max's arm over his shoulder, and with Noah's help, they gently helped him to stand. Elle led the way to the apartment upstairs. She'd grown up there, and her parents still lived there in the cramped but homey space. It was slow going, especially on the stairs, which weren't wide enough to accommodate all three men at the same time. Finally, they managed to get to the second-floor apartment and reached the couch where Max collapsed onto it in some relief. "'Thought you said you were fine,' Polly commented. "'Maybe I need a little rest?' Max rasped, holding his ribs. He stretched out on the couch, closing his eyes. Someone should stay with him. Aurora hasn't shown up yet. Is there someone you could call to sit with him? We're going to be slammed downstairs with only three people running the restaurant, Elle worried. What about your brother Michael? Could he come? I'll find someone. Why don't you and Polly get started downstairs, and as soon as I can get someone to look after Max, I'll come down. Noah thought about who he could call. Michael would get in serious trouble from their dad if he was caught here. Noah didn't want to alarm his mom. If you need anything, let us know. Elle looked at Max one more time. Are you certain you don't need to go to the hospital? I'm good, Max waved a hand at her, not even opening his eyes. Elle shook her head and grabbed a blanket from her parents' room, draping it over Max. He starts throwing up, or if the headache gets worse, he goes to the hospital, Polly said as he headed out the door. We'll be right downstairs. Elle gave them both a worried look before following Polly. Noah took out his phone and dialed the number. He hoped he wasn't overstepping their friendship by asking her to do this. Hi, Beth. I have a favor to ask. Twenty minutes later, Noah answered the knock at the door. Max had swallowed a couple of pain pills and was now sleeping. Noah let Beth in. I'm sorry about this, but I wasn't sure who else might be able to keep an eye on him. Noah grimaced. If Al wasn't in such a spot with being short-staffed, I'd look after him myself. It's fine. I'll sit with him. Bethany took off her coat, draping it over a chair. I brought a book to read. I have my phone on me, so if anything happens, you can just call me and I'll be right up. I plan on looking on, on him during my breaks anyways, Noah explained. Go. We'll be okay. Beth took off her boots. You're going to have to explain to me why you are working a restaurant, though. But that can wait until later. Max is working at the restaurant, Noah sighed. I'm following him around, trying to repair our relationship. He wasn't talking to me, so I decided to be a pain in his neck and got a job where he worked. This is still over the class action lawsuit and the diabetic drug, isn't it? She asked. It's because Max can't find a better job since he was thrown out of Ramsley Pharma. How do you know about that? Noah wondered. Bethany sighed. Mr. Ramsley and my father discussed it at great length. They disagreed on the need to alienate Max. It was one of the few things our fathers ever argued about. It's torn our family apart, Noah remarked as he looked at the sleeping Max. Go, Bethany put a hand on his arm. I'll make sure that he's okay. Noah covered her hand with his. Thank you, Beth. I really appreciate this. She gave him one of her small smiles, and with a last look at Max, Noah went back downstairs to help at the restaurant. They were busy with all staff pulling double duties. Noah quickly got on his apron and took over his section of the restaurant. "'How is Max doing?' Elle asked as she grabbed the coffee pot. "'Sleeping,' Noah quickly tallied a bill. "'I've got Bethany looking after him.' "'Bethany? The friend that you've been dating?' Elle asked. "'We're not dating,' Noah said automatically. He mentally kicked himself afterward. He guessed they were dating. You'd better figure out what you're doing before you end up not married to her. Elle rolled her eyes and went to serve some customers. She was intensely curious about this Bethany woman. Right now, Noah's girlfriend was upstairs in her parents' apartment. She decided she would have to take one of her breaks and meet her. She wondered if her curiosity was unhealthy. After all, Noah wasn't her boyfriend. He could date whoever he liked. Elle eyed Noah and felt a flutter of attraction. She didn't want him dating whomever he liked. Elle wondered just how serious they really were.
She wondered what it would be like to kiss him. She tried to push thoughts out of her head, yet the idea persisted. She liked Noah. More than she should, considering the circumstances. How many other men would have followed their brother into a job that they were clearly overqualified for? How many others would have persisted when their brother wanted them to leave? He treated all the customers well. He tried, even in circumstances he wasn't comfortable with. He was smart. He was easy to talk to. He was attractive and made her insides do funny things. She was falling in love with a man who was dating another woman. Well, like Aurora said, he wasn't married yet. Elle closed her eyes. That was a thought that would get her into trouble. She wasn't a woman who stole a man away from another woman. She wished her mamma was home so she could talk to her about the whole business. Maybe she should give her a call tonight. She needed some advice. First, Elle would meet the competition. Bethany looked up from her book as Max sighed and tried to adjust his position on the couch. He grimaced and put a hand to his head. "'You might be more comfortable on the bed,' she observed. He cracked an eye open and looked at her. "'Who are you?' "'Bethany Searson.' She put her bookmark in between the pages to mark her place. "'Would you like some water?' "'Not really,' Max looked at her. "'You grew up.' Bethany couldn't help but smile with a little amusement at his remark. People do that. I just remember you as this kid at the beach house, Max said. Bethany didn't remember Max or any beach house. She didn't remember much of her childhood. What was I like? A brat? Max frowned. I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't have said that. No, I'd rather you were honest. She didn't feel insulted in the least. It's still not a nice thing to say. Max was a little ashamed of his comment of her. I'm sure I wasn't a real treat that summer anyways. I had a broken collarbone and I've never been a fan of sitting still. Bethany's brow puckered as she tried to remember, but there was nothing there. I'm afraid I don't remember. Well, we can pretend that we're meeting now, Max offered. Hi, I'm Max and I'm not normally this rude. She took his hand in greeting. Bethany pleased to meet you. So you're dating my brother, Max raised an eyebrow. He's been kind enough to escort me to some events, Bethany said. We're getting to know each other. What do you think of him? He was curious. Bethany thought for a moment. I like him. Noah is kind and he's very generous to me. Generous? That's an odd thing to say. Max winced. Sorry, I'm being a bit rude again. I think what I mean to say is that he's been very generous with his time. Most men, in my experience, expect a certain type of dating with me. Dinner, the ballet, a musical, she tried to explain. I've asked Noah for something a little different. He's taken me to a football game. I've never been to one, and he was very patient explaining the rules, what everything meant. He's willing to do other activities with me without any judgment. You don't look like a football type of girl, Max said. Bethany smiled a little. I don't know what type of girl I am. Everyone treats me like I'm made of glass and about to break. It's nice to have someone who's simply being my friend and willing to share new experiences with me. What did you think of your first football game? he asked curiously. It was very confusing, she confided. But I'd like to go to another. We're going to try curling this week. Watching curling? Max thought he'd rather watch paint dry. No, we're going to play it at the local club, she said. Noah curls? Max frowned. He never thought his brother would do that. It wasn't exactly an exciting sport, in his opinion. No, it's going to be a first experience for both of us. She set down her book. Would you like to go lay on the bed? It would probably be more comfortable for you. I'm probably going to need a hand getting up, Max grimaced. I'm stronger than I look. Bethany took the blanket off him and helped him to sit up. Max sat for a moment with his eyes closed. Dizzy? A little, he rasped. Mostly the ribs just hurt. What happened? she asked. I got mugged. Did you report it to the police? Bethany questioned. It's not a big deal. They just got a little cash in my phone, Max shrugged. What if they steal from someone else? she softly inquired. Hopefully that someone can hit harder than I can. Max took a deep breath. 
Okay, let's give this a try. Together they managed to get him up on his feet. After a few moments to adjust, Max put his arm around Bethany and let her lead him into the bedroom. He gratefully sat on the bed. Noah called you to watch me? He was needed in the restaurant and didn't want you to be alone, she explained. I'm glad to do it. Are you two getting serious? he inquired. We're friends, Bethany gently said. I like your brother, but we're just getting to know each other right now. Max frowned. He had a feeling that there was some sparks between El and Noah. He hoped Bethany wouldn't be hurt if Noah ended the relationship. She seemed very nice. Why don't you lay down? Bethany asked. Max nodded and let her help him. He closed his eyes as she pulled the blanket over him. Thanks. You're welcome. She fiddled with the blinds and the room dimmed a little. Max appreciated that. It would make it easier to sleep. He listened to her go back to the living area. Bethany Searson had grown up to become one beautiful, classy lady. A lady who wanted to experience football games and curling, he mused sleepily. He wondered if he should tag along, just to see how Noah coped with the experience. It might be interesting. Bethany settled down with her book again. Max would probably sleep for a while. He hadn't seemed to be especially pleased when she said that she and Noah were friends and getting to know each other. She mildly wondered why. Then again, maybe the obvious headache had something to do with his frown. The door to the apartment opened and Bethany turned to see a very pretty woman come in. Hi, how is he? Sleeping. He's in the bedroom now. I thought it would be more comfortable. Bethany studied the dark beauty for a moment. She really was very lovely. Oh, good. El peeked in on Max, who was snoring softly. Thank you for watching him. It's no problem, Bethany said. He's mostly slept. You must be El. I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. El flushed a little. I'm El. Noah and Max are currently working for me. Bethany smiled and held out her hand in greeting. Bethany Searson. El shook her hand. So, you and Noah... There was a slight edge to Elle's question, Bethany thought. She wondered if Elle might have a liking for the middle Ramsley brother. Yes, he's a wonderful man. He is, Elle agreed. She looked at the classy blonde before her. Suddenly she felt like there was no way these two could be just friends. Elle didn't like the way that made her feel like she was sizing up the competition. There were definitely some very interesting undercurrents going on here, Bethany decided. Suddenly, she wondered what Noah thought of Elle. If you need anything, let me know. Elle held out a laminated sheet, her pretext for meeting Noah's girlfriend complete. I brought a menu. Lunch is on me. Just call down what you'd like, and I'll get Noah to bring it up. Thank you. I'll do that. Bethany appreciated the offer. It was nice to meet you. Yes, it was good to meet you, too. Elle gave her a smile that she didn't quite feel, and left the apartment. She paused on the stairs. Bethany was almost achingly beautiful. She was graceful with Dancer's long, lean body. Any man would be drawn to her. There was something about her, Elle thought, like she almost knew Elle's feelings for Noah, which was silly since they had just met. Elle barely could sort out her own feelings for Noah, no matter her worry about falling for him, but she did know that she felt fiercely jealous now that she'd met his girlfriend. Bethany was definitely going to be hard to go against if Elle did decide to pursue Noah. Elle returned to the restaurant and tried her best not to keep glancing at Noah. It was hard to keep her attention on her job, and she found herself making a few mistakes which were very out of character for her. She really did not need to be infatuated with this man, and yet she was. Noah brought up lunch for Bethany and Max. A simple salad with chicken for Beth. No wonder she was so lean, Elle thought. Elle was the type of woman who liked to eat food, especially food that wasn't particularly good for her, but she worked out at a gym to combat her bad eating habits. It was funny because she was the dietitian. Since she'd been working at the restaurant, she hadn't bothered with the gym as she'd been walking off everything that she ate. Elle watched the clock and was surprised that Noah didn't overstay his break, checking up on his brother and talking to his girlfriend. Correction, the girl he wasn't dating, or so he said. She frowned. He really needed to make up his mind on that. She managed to get through the rest of the shift without incident, except for the moment where she and Noah passed each other through the kitchen door as she brushed up against him. He sent her nerves sizzling and her stomach bottoming out. 
They both ignored the kissing bow over their heads, and thankfully no one else seemed to have noticed. El wasn't sure she could take a kiss from Noah right now. She was too on edge around him. She had this absurd notion that a kiss from him would be the stuff of fantasies. She wasn't sure she could deal with that if he was dating Bethany. At the end of the night, Noah went to check on Max again. Elle lingered in the restaurant, doing a little extra cleaning that really didn't need to be done. Ramos went home, and she was surprised to find Polly and Aurora talking in the alley behind the kitchen when she went to put out the garbage. Aurora kissed Polly on the cheek, giving him a saucy grin, and then sashayed away down the sidewalk. Polly watched her go. "'She's trouble,' Elle warned. She knew they were both adults. Yet she liked Polly and didn't want him to go through any disappointment when Aurora inevitably left again. "'I know,' Polly shrugged. "'Still, it's like a moth to the flame.' An apt analogy, since they both knew he'd likely get burned. "'Good luck with that.' "'Thanks.' Polly leaned against the alley wall. "'What about you in the middle, Ramsley brother?' "'He's got a non-girlfriend.' Al put the garbage in the bin and locked the lid. I guess that probably makes him off limits. I wants what I wants, El, Polly said quietly, even when it's not good for us. El nodded. That's very true. What are you going to do about it? he asked. You going to let the non-girlfriend win? It's not a competition, El smiled. Well, you need anything, you let me know, Polly offered. Thanks, I will. Elle wrapped her coat around herself a little tighter. Now get home before you freeze out here. Yes, boss. Polly grinned cheekily and left the alley to make his way down the street. Elle watched him go for a moment, then decided to find out how Max was. He was her employee, so she had a right to know, she reasoned. It wasn't because she wanted to see Noah again. Not at all, she lied to herself as she climbed the stairs and let herself in, knocking on the door. She found them in the bedroom, talking to Max, who was sitting on the edge of the bed. Noah, Beth said sternly, we agreed. I am not made of glass. I can help you bring him down to the car. Noah sighed. I would just feel better if I grabbed Polly a moment. Too late, Ellen interjected. He left. Noah looked displeased and eyed his brother. I'm not dizzy any more. I'm sure I can make it down some stairs, Max said. Why? El asked. He can stay here. I thought I'd take him home with me, Noah said. Let him stay. Then he doesn't have to go down the stairs. The heat is on, the water is on. I can bring up a few groceries from the restaurant tomorrow, or we can just cook something and bring it up again, El offered. It would probably be better for him if he just rested rather than moving him. Hey, I'm here, Max looked at them. I can hear you. El ignored him. Noah, you can stay overnight in the other bedroom. It's not a big deal. I can leave the key on the kitchen table. Are you sure? Noah asked. Bethany regarded the obviously pained Max. It would probably be better for you if you just stayed here. I'm sure, El said in response to Noah. She was glad she could do this for them. Noah looked at Max. What would you prefer? Come to my place or stay here? And don't give me any of that brave I'm fine stuff because we know it's not true. Truthfully, Max sighed. I'd rather just go back to sleep. Fine, then we'll stay the night, Noah said. Thanks, El. You're welcome, El responded. Have a good night. Sleep, Max. Thanks, he gave her a lopsided smile. El went to the kitchen. She took the apartment key off her key ring and set it on the table. Thank you for doing this, El. Bethany followed her. It will help if you can just sleep and heal. El nodded. She wished Bethany wasn't so gracious. How has he been? He's not dizzy any more and the headache is less, Bethany said. His ribs still hurt a lot. The pain is making him tired. Well, hopefully he gets a good night's sleep then, El forced a smile. Good night, Bethany. Good night, El, she responded in kind and walked El to the door. El hoped she wasn't staying the night with the two brothers. It really was none of her business, yet El lingered in her car and was rewarded when both Bethany and Noah came down the stairs, talking. Noah walked Bethany to her car. They paused, and Noah opened her door. Elle decided that the brothers had definitely been raised to be gentlemen. Bethany listened as Noah talked a moment, then she laid a hand on his arm. Elle's stomach clenched. She watched as Beth leaned up and gave Noah a kiss on the cheek. Then she got in her car, with Noah shutting the door. 
Not exactly a kiss goodnight, Elle thought. She didn't know quite what to make of it, as she watched Bethany drive away. Part of her was glad she had stayed because it solidified Noah's claim of them not exactly dating. Another part of her was disappointed that she was reduced to spying. Elle sighed and watched Noah go back up to the apartment. He was going to sleep in her old bed. Elle pushed away the thought and started her car. She really was a sad case. Maybe she should call her mama for advice. Then again, she knew her mama would likely tell her to go and get what she wanted. She'd always been that type of woman. Seize the day and all that. Elle drove home and debated the wisdom of trying to win Noah. After all, what had Polly said? Was she going to let the non-girlfriend win? Chapter 8 How was Max this morning? Elle asked as she prepared some breakfast for herself. He's better. He insisted he was ready to go back to work, and I told him maybe tomorrow. Noah sipped from a cup of coffee. I gave him my phone and told him to make some calls for his charity fund today instead. That should keep him busy. I'll check on him at breaks. Think he can be left alone today? Elle munched on her egg and toast. She loved breakfast. It was one of her favorite meals. I think so, Noah said. It's scary to think that something like this happens so close to the diner. Elle frowned. We should report it to the police, Noah scowled. <laughs> what would they do? Polly asked as he put on his white apron. Unless Mox got a really good look at them, they ain't going to be able to do much. Did he see them? Elle asked. Noah shook his head. He said it was too dark in the alley. They have his phone, though. Maybe we can trace it with that lost phone app or something. Polly laughed. That phone's been sold by now. Better just report it stolen to his self-service so Max don't get some thousand-dollar bill from the new owner. Noah decided he'd better get Max to do that during his first break if he was awake. Thanks for the advice. Polly nodded and started chopping vegetables for the morning omelets. Aurora came in, barely on time, sipping a coffee. How is brother? she asked. Better, Noah replied. Good. Aurora leaned against the counter. He need mace, taser, and brass knuckles. Fair fight, lose fight. Fight mean and win. Are those even legal? Noah questioned it. What has legal to do with it? She cocked her head to the side. A lot if you get stopped by the police, Elle said wryly, finishing her toast. Let's open and get the hungries fed. Noah waited another day before he would let Max work a half day. Max insisted he was fine and looked like he was healing pretty well, but Noah didn't like it. He insisted Max have a stool to sit and take extra breaks. Elle agreed, and that any time he needed to call it a night during the shift, he was okay to do so. Max shrugged off both their concerns, grabbing a rubber glove for his hand and kept working despite the pain from his ribs. He also insisted on going back to the shelter for fear of losing his spot. Noah wasn't impressed. He gave Max a key to his condo with a reminder that the door was always open, but he didn't have much hope that his brother would take him up on the offer. Max was stubborn. The diner remained busy during the holidays, with the bazaar and other events drawing in customers. Finally, at the end of a busy night, Noah was helping El close up. He was looking forward to a good night's sleep. Tomorrow, he was going to finish going through his third of the list of potential donors with Beth. He resolved to find out how Max was doing for donations to the fund so he could conspire with Michael to make sure Max didn't lose. Noah was deep in thought over how they might pull it off without Max's knowledge while he helped to clean up the kitchen with Elle. Elle grabbed a large pan of roast and pushed to open the freezer with her hip on the latch. Before I forget, can you grab the other pan and hand it to me? Noah grabbed the second pan of sliced roast and followed her into the freezer. The door clicked shut. Don't let the door shut! El called over her shoulder as she wrestled with putting the heavy pan on the shelf. It gets stuck. Noah looked at the door. Too late. What? El shoved the pan the rest of the way. Ouch! Noah watched as she popped her bruised finger into her mouth. The door is shut. I could have used that bit of information before I stepped into the freezer. Put that on this shelf here. She pointed and then sidled past him to try to open the door. On her fourth try, he interrupted. Maybe if you push it like this. Elle sighed. Noah, I've worked here most of my life. I know how to get the door open. Fine. Noah backed away and watched as she tried again. Numerous tries later, she let him have his turn. 
Is anyone still here? Did Ramos leave? She asked, watching him push on the door. They're gone, Noah grunted as he tried to force the handle. What's wrong with this thing? It gets stuck, El said patiently. She was starting to shiver. She had a short-sleeved blouse on, so she rubbed her arms trying to warm them up. No kidding, he muttered. Do you have your cell phone on you? No. You? El asked. It's in the car, Noah said grimly. El blew out an exasperated breath. If we stay in here all night, we'll get frostbite. Noah backed up and critically eyed the door. Maybe we can unscrew the lock or take the hinges off. Do you have a screwdriver? El raised an eyebrow. No, but that doesn't mean there isn't something in here that will work. Noah looked around the freezer. See any knives or something similar? El cast an eye over everything, but all she saw was food and containers. How she wished her parents would get that door fixed. Maybe this. Noah grabbed an empty pan and winced at how cold it was in his hands. He tried to finagle the corner edge into the screw, but it was too thick. He put the pan back on the shelf and prowled around, looking. How about this? El grabbed a long piece of tin. She didn't know why it was there, but if it worked, she'd happily keep it in the freezer always. Noah tried it with similar results. El, does anyone come in here and check the place at night? Is there an alarm or something that might go off if we change the temperature in here? No. El shook her head. There's no alarm for the freezer. No one will be here until morning shift when I'm supposed to open. Polly has an extra key, but he won't be here until five to unload the delivery truck. Noah checked his watch. Seven hours from now. Seven cold hours from now, El thought. She shivered some more. There's got to be something, Noah began again, thoroughly going through each pan, every shelf, even checking under them. El shifted from foot to foot. Her toes were starting to go numb. She wished she had worn thicker socks. Maybe we could put something in front of the vents to block the cold air from coming in a little? No, it might cause the fans to overheat, and then we'd have a fire in a confined space. I'd rather not die of smoke inhalation before the fire department gets here, Noah said as he crouched and ran a hand under his shelf. Nothing. I'm going to die in a freezer, Al looked up. Is this really the plan? No one is going to die, Noah said dryly. There is a way out. We just need to think it through. They both stood and shivered for a while. Well, I'm still thinking, he said. Could you think faster? El asked. Noah took off his apron, pulled out the pad of paper and pen, and then put it on El's head, tying the strings on her chin. What are you doing? She raised an eyebrow. Studies have shown that a significant amount of heat loss comes from the head, he said. Do you get one too? No, you're not wearing your apron, so only one of us gets the fancy hat. I'd rather not have the fancy hat. El was unamused. Noah shrugged. Too bad. It's like woman first for the lifeboats. You get the hat first. That doesn't even make sense. We're not on a ship. Noah picked up the pen and eyed it thoughtfully. Can I have your shoe? Why my shoe? Why not use yours? You're wearing pumps with a slight heel which will be more solid than the sneakers I'm wearing, Noah said. I warn you, though, I doubt this will work. Elle groaned and gave him a shoe. She put her socked foot on top of her other foot and tried to balance. I feel like an idiot. Noah smiled, but wisely chose not to comment. He knelt in front of the door and tried to wedge the pen under the pin that held the door in the hinge. Using the shoe, he knocked the pen, working at the pin. Is it doing anything? Elle asked. She hopped over to get a better look. It's moving. Noah was surprised. He thought the pen would have broken long before this. Then it did. It actually shattered spectacularly, a shard embedding itself in his hand. Noah dropped the shoe and carefully pulled the piece of plastic out of his palm, dripping blood. That doesn't look too good. Elle had a tissue in her pocket and pressed it against Noah's hand to staunch the bleeding. Can you use something else? If I use the lip of that empty pan, I might move it a half inch. It doesn't remove the pen, nor it doesn't move the other two pins. Noah sighed. You should put your shoe back on. El quickly did. Even in those few minutes when he had been using it, the heat had completely seeped out. Her teeth were chattering. Here, Noah gently took her into his arms. You'll be warmer. Grateful, she snuggled as close as she could. He was warm. 
Thank you. Noah rested his chin on her head, still thinking. He could feel a thought tickling at the back of his mind. I'm missing something. Elle kept quiet and prayed that he would think of it. She could think of no solution to get them out of their current predicament. Plus, she was enjoying the feeling of being in his arms and hearing his heart beat in her ear. He felt solid and warm. The longer she stood in his embrace, the more her nerves danced and butterflies flitted across her stomach. This was unacceptable, she sternly told herself. She was his temporary boss. He'd be leaving soon. She couldn't fall for a guy who was dating another woman even if he said they were just friends. Why couldn't she have feelings for the brother who was available? Life was not fair. He was smart. He cared about his brother. He could be kind when dealing with the elderly patrons. He was honest about money. Sure, he was a little abrupt, and sometimes needed a firm hand to guide him, but what man didn't? He was also extremely handsome. He smelled good, too. Elle burrowed her cold nose into his chest. Elle, just how cold is this freezer? he asked. He had such a nice voice, deep enough to send a shiver through her. Or maybe that was just the cold. The health board makes us keep the freezer temperature at zero degrees Fahrenheit. That is cold, he said in her ear. He shifted just a little, and Elle felt like they were as close together as possible. Good news is, as long as there's no wind chill, we probably won't get hypothermia. Probably? Elle asked. Not ruling out the frostbite, Noah rubbed her back. Can we adjust the temperature from inside? No, the control is outside on the wall. Any ideas of how to keep warm? She could see her breath. A few. When he didn't elaborate, she looked up. He was so close. You look ridiculous in that apron, he grinned. She ripped it off her head and stomped as far away as she could in the tiny enclosed space. You're the one who put it on me. I'm sorry, he chuckled. He gently turned her around and lifted her chin so that she could look at him. You're beautiful, El, with or without the apron. She rolled her eyes. Seriously, you have to know how gorgeous you are, he insisted. You think so? El asked. She wondered why he was dating that Bethany woman rather than her. I do think so. Noah slipped a hand into her hair and bent down to kiss her. It gave her enough time to protest if she wanted to. He knew this was a bad idea, but he couldn't seem to stop himself. But Elle didn't want him to stop. She wanted to know just what it felt like, what he tasted like, if he could make her heart sing. She rose up on her toes to meet him. It was better than she ever could have expected. He might be the most arrogant, stubborn, annoying man that she had ever met, but oh, could he kiss! Her insets felt like liquid, and she wondered if it wasn't hot in the freezer because he was making her feel very, very warm. It was almost electrifying. Her heart sang. She didn't know how long they kissed, or when their hands all strayed, but suddenly he lifted his head and blinked like coming out of a fog. My watch! What? she breathed shakily, leaning against him. He abruptly let her go and nearly tore her off his Rolodex. Elle swayed and caught her balance, looking at him disbelievingly as he set down the watch carefully on its side, then grabbed the empty pan and smashed it. Noah! she cried out and jumped back, alarmed. Sifting through the pieces, he grabbed a small gear, and with the remaining metal handle of the pen, fashioned a crude screwdriver which slotted perfectly into the screw head of the door latch. Twisting, Noah worked on their escape. Elle leaned back against the cold shelf, hugging herself. Here she had been lost in the moment, feeling the entire world tilt, listening to her heart and her entire body sing. In the meanwhile, his sciency little brain had been picking away at the problem of their escape. Men. What a fabulous set of kisses it had been. Her lips were still humming. She'd never, ever been kissed like that. Why did it have to be him? Gorgeous, kind, smart, already had a girlfriend cheating him. Elle closed her eyes and sighed. She had two choices. She could never kiss him again, and when he left, send him on his way. Or she could fight for him with everything she had to make him hers and make him forget that he had ever dated this Bethany woman. Elle had always been a fighter. She watched as Noah dismantled the latch, laying the parts on the floor. Soon enough, he had the door open. He grinned at her, and she could feel her heart skip a beat. He was so handsome. He was hers. He just didn't know it yet, she decided. 
Sorry, Bethany. She gratefully left the freezer and could feel the difference in temperature immediately. She rubbed her arms and watched as Noah shut the freezer door, stuffing a rag in the hole left where the latch used to be. We'll have to call someone to get that repaired, Noah said. Elle ignored his comment. She also ignored the voice in her head that said that this could all get very messy very fast. Instead, she did what she wanted to do. She stepped right up to him, threaded her hands into his hair, and pulled his head down for a kiss. What a kiss it was! Followed by some more explosive kisses. She didn't know whose idea it was for her to be lifted onto the counter, but sitting on it brought her up to a much better height to kiss him. Plus, she could wrap her legs around his waist. It definitely was a good idea. She murmured her agreement against his lips when she suddenly heard the door click shut and footsteps halt. Whoa! Startled, they broke apart to see Polly looking at them with an amused eyebrow raised. You might want to sanitize that counter when you're finished, he drawled before heading into the kitchen. Noah ran a hand through his hair and turned away, catching his breath. Elle dropped down from the counter, leaning against it. A moment later, Polly came back, holding his wallet. He shot Elle a smirk and left, whistling. "'I think I should go,' Noah said. "'Okay,' Elle said softly. She smiled dreamily as she watched him leave. He didn't even spare a backwards glance. Oh, he was unquestionably hers. Noah was not looking forward to this morning at the diner. Every time he thought of the kiss between him and Elle, he wondered where it would have ended, if it would even have ended. Elle was like a flame. She was desirable, sexy, gorgeous. She was funny and bold. She was smart, and he liked talking to her. He even liked her silly Christmas traditions. He could very easily fall in love with her. He was afraid he was halfway there, which was not the plan. As much as he wanted Elle, he was dating Beth. There was no choice in all of this. His father would not be open to his dumping Beth to date Elle and still be allowed to see Max. He was making so much progress with his brother, and he didn't want to throw that away. He also didn't feel good about just dumping Beth. She'd become a friend. She was sweet, and he enjoyed exploring new things with her. If it wasn't for Elle, he might have seen a future for them. Except he didn't feel even a tiny bit for Beth what he felt for Elle. He couldn't imagine kissing Beth the way that he and Elle had kissed. He was just going to have to get through working for Elle until Christmas, and then afterward he would never see her again. He knew that his father wanted him to marry Beth at some point. David hadn't been quiet about that fact, and like Michael had said, he would keep pushing to get what he wanted. Noah didn't see how he could refuse him without putting his career in the toilet. L was going to be the one that got away. Noah felt a little sick at the thought, but there was nothing he could do about it. Having in Max in his life, his career and not hurting Beth, all outweighed loving L. Loving L. Noah ran a hand over his face. He needed to stop thinking like this. He wasn't allowed to love her. He entered the diner, grabbing his apron. As he wrapped it around his waist, he looked at the Christmas tree with all its decorations. Nothing was coordinated. It was mismatched, slightly off-kilter, but bright and colorful. It was a lot like L. Noah silently told his brain to shut up. He could hear voices in the kitchen, so he went to find out what was going on this morning. L was going through another cooking lesson with Max, discussing how to cook French toast. Noah leaned in the doorway and watched them. Max paying attention but deliberately asking silly questions while L gracefully flipped the food with a spatula. Would he be willing to trade his career, Beth and Max, for her? That was a dangerous thought, one which he resolutely pushed away. He abruptly stood and went back into the restaurant. He set about pulling chairs off of tables and getting ready for customers. He was halfway through when L came out. Coffee? She set a mug on the counter while drinking from her own. Thanks. Noah continued to pull chairs. Are we going to talk about last night? L asked curiously. Noah paused. They did need to talk about it. He came over to the counter, leaning against it, and watched L. Last night cannot happen again. I'm sorry, L. I take full responsibility over my actions, and I acted on some emotions that I shouldn't have. It wasn't right, nor was it fair to you. L was stunned. Why? I'm dating Beth, he explained. The friend that you said you weren't dating? 
El was starting to get a little angry. Noah didn't appreciate her tone. It's complicated. You say that a lot, El put down her coffee a little forcefully. I think that's your excuse when you just don't want to explain things. Maybe it is, Noah allowed. However, I'm not going to cheat on Beth, so there'll be no repeats of yesterday. You didn't even want to date her, and now you're worried about cheating on her? El threw her hands in the air. I wonder why I'm getting mixed signals here. I'm sorry. It seemed the only reasonable thing to say at the moment, a frustrated Noah thought. He should never have kissed El, but not knowing had been eating him up inside. Now he knew what it was like and hated that he wouldn't be kissing her again. Truth be told, he just hadn't been thinking. Why don't you dump her? El suddenly asked. Dump her and date me. Noah swallowed thickly. She had no idea how much he would suddenly like to do just that. He wanted to just ignore the consequences and keep kissing Elle, keep learning about her, keep falling in love with her. It wasn't possible, he reminded himself sternly. Hey, when do you want— Max stopped as he entered the restaurant, looking at the pair at them. Am I interrupting something? No, Noah flatly denied. Yes, Elle said emphatically. Polly came behind Max. <laughs> Not what I interrupted. That was some heavy stuff last night. Shut up, Polly, Noah warned. Elle narrowed her eyes. Okay, I think I'm going back to the kitchen, Max decided. Normally he'd be right in there, rubbing in whatever chaos was happening, but he liked Elle and wanted her to have a chance at his brother. He decided to help Noah out a little. Polly, we should talk. In the kitchen. Sure thing, Polly grinned as he grabbed the dessert plates from under the counter. Noah waited until they left before quietly speaking again. I'm not going to dump Beth. Noah, my mom always told me that I should wait for the man who made my heart sing. A man who I could talk to, respect, and who made me feel things that no other man could. Elle reached out, touching his arm. That man is you. Tell me why you want to stay with a woman that you're only friends with when you could be with me. As much as it hurt to do it. Noah gently took her hand, removing it from his arm. I'm sorry, Elle. That's not a reason, Elle insisted. And don't tell me it's complicated. It was complicated. He didn't want to hurt Beth. He loved his brother. He loved his work as a scientist. His father was blackmailing him, and he would need to accept that some day he would have to marry Beth as his father desired. I can see by your face that she's not what you want. Elle moved closer to him. Why are you doing this? Noah stepped back. Elle? Whatever he was about to say was lost as a customer poked their head in the door. Are you open? Yes, Noah responded in relief. He really wanted to just avoid this conversation altogether. There was little he could say without hurting Elle. There was no way he was going to tell her the truth. He barely believed it himself. How would she take it if he told her he was being blackmailed into marriage by his own father? It sounded like something out of a bad film or a book set a hundred years or more ago. She would just get upset and think that he was lying to her. No, Elle replied. Look at the sign on the door. It's five after six, the man complained, looking at his watch. Aurora pushed past the customer into the restaurant, flipping the sign before going to get her apron. We open. You're late, Elle said angrily. Again. I have something I have to do, Aurora said, unconcerned about Elle's mood. You have a job to do, Elle growled at the waitress. She pointed a finger at Noah. This discussion is not over. Noah sighed and grabbed a menu for the customer. He didn't know what else he could say to Elle. He gratefully pushed the problem aside to deal with later. Right now, he had work to do. It was a busy morning, and so break was a little late before he and Max were caught up enough to take it. They both lingered in the alley. Elle's not a happy camper, Max remarked lightly. Don't start. I'm assuming Polly told you? Hey, I like Al. If you want to start something with her, it's all cool by me, Max said. I think you guys would make a good couple. We're not going to make a good couple, because I'm dating Beth, Noah sighed. Max frowned as he remembered Noah's conundrum. And you can't break up with Beth because of Dad. Exactly. Does Dad have any actual evidence? Max asked. "'Pictures of me getting the test from the guy who was later kicked out of school for cheating,' Noah shrugged. "'Yes, I could deny it and say it was just a report or something that I was having him look over, but we all know no one's going to believe that.' 
and he has a copy of the test answers, plus probably a copy of my answers, which would happen to match. At least, that's what he says he has. Isn't there some way to fix the test? You could go to the university and ask to retake it. Or if you got a zero on it, would you have flunked the course? Max questioned. If you get this taken care of, then he has nothing to hold over your head. I looked into it. It seems if you're a student, they're far more lenient than if you're a graduate. Noah grimaced. I'd be made an example of. My entire degree would be gone. Like I said, I'll never practice in the field again if it becomes common knowledge. That sucks, Max said angrily. It does, Noah agreed. I'm stuck. Do you ever think that you would want to do something other than science? Max asked. I've done a lot of different jobs since quitting the family business, and I've enjoyed learning new things. I love what I do, Noah felt a little hollow inside. It was an impossible choice. I can't imagine doing other work. What I do makes a difference. It's part of who I am. Well, whatever you decide, I'm here for you, Max offered. Stay with Beth, stay a scientist, keep his relationship with his mom and Michael and Max, lose Elle. Choose Elle and he would lose his career, hurt Beth, lose his relationship with his mom and Michael, still get to see Max. There was nothing to decide, he reflected. The choice had been made for him. He would simply have to forget about Elle after Christmas. Until then, he would have to do everything he could not to fall in love with her any further. The stupid kissing bow did not help. Right after he and Elle passed under it as he was coming out of the kitchen and she was going in. Of course, the elder patrons noticed and wouldn't let it go. He bust Elle on the cheek and kept working, much to Thelma, Gladys, and Dominic's disappointment. Noah clamped down on his own emotions. He was going to be disappointing a few people in the future, and he didn't like the feeling. Elle grabbed his elbow and headed out a side exit into the alley. What was that about? I have customers, Noah stated calmly. And they expected a kiss, Noah, not some peck on the cheek. L folded her arms. I don't want to kiss you, he said. L flinched. She went to walk past him into the diner, but he grabbed her arm, preventing her from leaving. L, I don't want to kiss you, because if I do, I won't want to stop. Noah put his other arm in her way, leaning against the building. That's why. Then don't stop, L breathed as she turned to face him. Her hands crept up to cradle his face. He leaned his forehead against hers and closed his eyes. He took a regretful breath of her sweet perfume. I think it's more like, don't start. Noah, her voice came out a plea. You're not in love with her. Why are you doing this? He straightened up and released her. We need to go back to work. What I needed is an answer. A real answer, she insisted. Why not us? I don't have an answer for you, he sighed. It's not good enough. Elle leaned back against the wall. I need an answer. I'm sorry, Noah said. For a moment he was tempted to tell her why. To tell her what a jerk his father was and how he wished things would be different. Yet he could barely believe it himself. Why would she? I'm going back to work. El nodded and Noah left her there in the alley. As he waited on the tables, he thought about the whole situation. The biggest thing was his career. He knew that his father did not make idle threats. He always carried out what he said he would do. He would lose his career and never be a scientist again. He would be sued by his father. Maybe he should just sell everything and put in Max's funds for the kids. Wouldn't that just make their dad flip? He wouldn't be able to touch Noah's assets if Noah gave them away before the trial. He could declare bankruptcy. He wondered what he would do for a living. He wouldn't be able to be a scientist. He wouldn't be able to teach. He would have a ruined reputation. He supposed there had to be some sort of job that he could do, something that would use his skills while still allowing him to enjoy his work. He just didn't know what. On his last break with Max, he leaned against the alley wall and thought about his choices. "'You're pretty deep in thought,' Max remarked. Noah nodded. His life had reached a point where he needed to be sure he was making the right decisions. "'What would you do?' "'I did it,' Max shrugged, even without the girl.' I chose to sink my career and leave. Noah sighed. Look, it comes down to what do you want more, Max asked. You can't have everything, so you need to choose. Take Dad out of the equation. Take Beth out of the equation. Do you want your career, or do you want Elle? I need to think about this, he said. 
You've done nothing but think about this, Max said in frustration. Some of us don't make snap decisions, Noah shot back. It was true. Max had always gone with his gut, while Noah needed time to think everything through from nearly every angle. Max sighed. You wait long enough, and the decision's going to be made for you. Noah gritted his teeth and deliberately changed the subject. How are the ribs? Fine, Max said as he went into the kitchen. Noah stared up the cloudy sky. It was cold, and a couple of snowflakes drifted down to join the snow on the ground. He was about to go in when Polly and Aurora came out, arguing. I found the ticket. There's no use denying that you're going to up and leave again, Polly said in disgust. You don't just buy a ticket and not use it. I have tickets. So what? Aurora put her hands on her hips. What business of yours? What business of mine? Polly repeated incredulously. I thought something was going on between us, Aurora. That makes you my business. Is nothing, she tried to dismiss it. It's a plane ticket to the Ukraine, he practically yelled. It's not nothing. How long are you going? Is that always where you go? When will you be back? Are you even coming back? I didn't see any return ticket. Three, maybe five day, Aurora shrugged. I'm not sure when I come back. I buy a ticket back there. Why do you even go, he asked. You said you don't talk to your family. Is something I have to do. She folded her arms and looked at the ground. Well, that's real clear. Polly threw his hands in the air. Let me know when you can be bothered to tell me. Aurora watched him angrily stride back into the kitchen. She bit her lip and hugged herself. Hey, Noah said gently. Polly likes you. Maybe you should tell him whatever is going on. Like you tell El what is going on? Aurora asked with a little snap in her voice. Take own advice. You're right, Noah sighed. I probably should just tell her. I'm not sure she'll believe me. I'm hoping to work something out. When, she questioned, when fix for El? Tonight, Noah decided. He was tired of waiting for his father to pull more strings. Tonight he would confront him and figure this out. Aurora gave him a nod and headed back into the kitchen. Noah stayed out for a moment longer to collect his thoughts. He would go confront his dad at the house tonight. Usually his mother played bridge this evening, so it would be easier to find the old man alone. Everyone was quiet among the staff for the rest of the day. They all did their work diligently and didn't talk much. During the last break, Noah went out to sit in his car. He didn't want to talk to anyone, especially Max or Elle. They would just badger him, and he wasn't ready to try to work this out with them. First, he needed to talk to Dad on his terms and try to get this all straightened out. He had to believe that he could make it work, that he could extricate himself from this mess and limit the damage. He wanted to believe that L and he might have a future. Noah's phone rang, and he automatically answered it. Hello? I see you haven't bought the ring yet. I thought I was very clear about that. David's voice purred in his ear. Noah closed his eyes and ran a hand through his hair. He should have let the call go to voicemail. He didn't want to do this over the phone. We didn't specify a deadline. I want to know that you've bought a ring by tomorrow evening. She's a size five, David said mildly. Don't disappoint me, Noah. What happens if I do disappoint you? Noah looked up at the ceiling of the car as he asked the important question. He was starting to get a headache. Suddenly, he wondered if the cause of all the migraines Mike always had weren't because of the stress of dealing with their father. What if I just say no to the whole thing? What if I let you do your worst and just walk? David sighed. I hoped it wouldn't come to this, but I think you'll reconsider. I don't think so, Noah said tiredly. I'm done with this, Dad. Go ahead. You know what? I'll call the university myself. They can pull my degrees. I don't want to live with this over my head anymore. I'm done. David chuckled. You're not done. You're just having a temper tantrum. I'm finished, Dad. Good luck and goodbye. I'm through with you. Noah felt good about the idea. He could have a future with Elle, which he desperately wanted. He knew he'd made the right decision by walking away. He could imagine a bright future full of days with her, and he felt very good about it. He decided to bluff a little to push his father back. I'll let everyone know that you're blackmailing me with the recordings I've been taking with my phone when I talk to you. 
There was a momentary pause. Clever. I like to think so, Noah said coldly, with some satisfaction. Maybe he could salvage his career after all with that bit of inspiration. Maybe he could still be a scientist and have L. Fine. You walk away. You get another job. Maybe you get the girl from the restaurant. She seems into you. David's voice was still mild, something which sent a fissure of fear down Noah's spine. However, maybe it's not something you will do. Why wouldn't I? Noah asked. He knew he was going to regret asking, but he had to. Michael. What about Michael? He gritted his teeth. Are you ready to ruin him along with yourself? David asked softly. Dad, this is Michael you're talking about. You're firstborn, the one you raised to take over your own position. You're not going to do anything to ruin his career, Noah reasoned. He writes journals. He has some very interesting entries. You remember that rumor going around about him and his secretary? David asked. Dad, don't do this, Noah said. He closed his eyes and rubbed his forehead. You're making me, Noah, David replied calmly. If it gets out that their affair is real, he's going to have some very serious questions to answer. Men have affairs with their secretaries all the time. Noah wasn't certain Michael and Anne were involved. If it was true, then they had been amazingly discreet. It doesn't hurt their careers. It does when the secretary was seventeen when she was hired, David practically crooned. He's ten years her senior. She was a child. When had she started being Michael's secretary? It seemed like she had always been there. Noah felt a moment of panic and took a deep breath. That doesn't mean they were having an affair back then. David laughed. Are you naive, Noah? She was highly unqualified. No work experience. Fresh out of high school, she wore inappropriate clothing to the office. Everyone lifted an eye when she became his secretary, but we all stayed quiet. However, with those journal entries, he's put himself in a bad spot. He hired her because he wanted her. He's been with her since day one. He can be charged with being a sex offender. He can be disbarred. Do jail time. Even if she doesn't press charges? Noah wasn't sure how this would work. Surely someone would have to press charges. Let's say Anne doesn't want to press charges. Maybe the statute of limitations is over. I don't know. I'm not the lawyer. He may even keep his law degree, but now it's worthless because it's been splashed all over the newspapers that Michael Ramsley, heir apparent to the Ramsley pharmaceutical empire, has been with an underage teenage girl. Sure, it happened years ago, but we fire him and Anne because we can't take on that kind of press at the company. He never works another day in his life as a lawyer. I don't know what type of job he could get as a suspected sexual offender. David went in for the kill. Are you ready to be the destroyer of your brother's life, Noah? Noah closed his eyes and leaned his forehead against the steering wheel. Why would you do this? We're your kids. And I know what's best for each of you if you just do what I say, David growled. Now go out and buy that ring. Noah listened as the phone call ended. He wondered if it mattered if it were true or not. He was certain that Michael wasn't that stupid. Michael wouldn't have started anything with a 17-year-old Anne. Could David be bluffing? Noah called Anne. He waited until she picked up. Hello? Anne, it's Noah. Random question. How old were you when you started with the company? He asked. Seventeen. I lied and said I was eighteen, but it hardly matters. I was only a month away from my birthday, she replied. Why? What's going on? Nothing. Thanks. Noah hung up. He knew where Michael's journals were, but he didn't want to invade his brother's privacy. He probably should have just asked Anne if there was any truth to the rumors. But would she lie to protect Michael? What was the truth? Did the truth even matter if his father really did put the affair on the eyes of the press? The tabloids would run with it, and Michael would truly be ruined. The whole thing was a mess. The only thing he could think of to do was to buy the ring. He was going to end up marrying Beth, he thought with some despair. 
It was a good thing there was less than a week left of his time at the restaurant. He wasn't sure if he shouldn't just quit. He didn't want to see Elle. He didn't want to torment himself with something that he couldn't have. But if he quit now, Max would be suspicious and demand answers that Noah didn't want to give. Noah took a deep breath. He was just going to have to suck it up for one more week. Then it would be Christmas, and he would never see her again. He ignored the pain deep in his heart and pulled out his keys. He locked the car as he got out and took the route along the alley for the last portion of his shift. Aurora was standing there, huddled in her coat against the cold. "'You look like funeral,' she observed wryly. "'I tried to sort things out, and it didn't go so well.' Noah gave a dry, humorless laugh. "'Actually, it went very badly. "'I have no choices open to me, Aurora. "'If you have a choice, you should take it.' He didn't wait for her response, but went into the kitchen and shrugged out of his coat. A moment later, Aurora shoved her coat at him and marched over to Polly. "'I have son,' she stated baldly. "'In old country. He's sick as baby.' I work for expensive medicines, doctor's hospital. I visit when I can to bring him money for him. Now he healthy. Scans good. I do all paperwork for government, and he come here. I have ticket to bring him here. Why didn't you just say something? Polly asked incredulously. He tried to absorb her sudden confession. Men no want woman with kid, she shrugged. What were you going to do when he came here? Hide him? Polly shook his head at her reasoning. I not know, she exploded. I scared. I full-time mother for first time. Maybe I not date. So, you're going to stop dating me? he asked. Why, you want to date me? She looked at him like he was a bit crazy. I say I have son. No man want another man's son. You think maybe I should decide if that's what I want? I like to choose rather than you choosing for me. Polly crossed his arms and glared down at her. How old is this kid? Twelve. She poked him in the chest when she saw his reaction. Ha! See, he not little boy. Make difference. What makes a difference is that you never told me. All these years we've been on and off, but you never said a word about this. Polly sighed. I not want you leave. Aurora lifted a shoulder with a shrug, not really wanting to admit the fact. I'm not leaving. He put his hands on her shoulders and frowned. You bring this kid home, you're not going to have him live in that crack house, are you? Aurora rolled her eyes. Is not crack house. It looks like one, Polly grimaced. Look, Ivan's moving out at the end of the week. You and the boy can come live with me. He'd have his own bedroom that way. Really? Aurora asked, surprised and hopeful. Yeah, Polly said. What's this kid's name? Aurora gave him an enthusiastic hug. Peter. Well, at least the kid's got a decent name, Polly hugged her back. Max gave Noah a nudge and said quietly, See, you could have that with Al. I think we should get back to work, Noah replied dryly. He didn't want to talk about it. There was nothing to discuss. He'd been backed into a corner with no way out any more. Noah went out to the restaurant to finish the night. One more week, and he would never see Al again, he reminded himself. Chapter 9 Michael's phone pinged where it sat on his desk. His eyes automatically looked at it. Normally he would ignore it, but the number that flitted across the screen was Noah's. He unlocked his cell phone to find a video message. That was very unlike his brother. Michael frowned as he opened it. Okay, Michael, Max grinned, clearly visible on the screen. I'm still mad at you and not talking to you, but you have to see this. I stole Noah's phone, and I need to spread the joy to someone who will understand. It's just too good not to share. Oh, and by Noah's calculations, you owe us a steak dinner at Lafrito's for not making as much money for my fund as we each did. Michael wasn't worried about Lafrito's. He'd lost on purpose. He watched as the video changed from looking at Max to a blur of an industrial kitchen. Then it went through a door to a restaurant area. There were various customers there, and a lot of Christmas decorations. It was a bit overdone, in Michael's opinion, but it really wasn't his business. He frowned as he wondered what Max was up to. Then he saw Noah. Michael's jaw dropped. His brother was dressed as an elf. "'Max, I will kill you,' Noah threatened as he caught sight of the phone. "'Just one for posterity,' Max said jovially before Noah took the phone out of his hand and the video ended. Michael stared at his phone. 
The screen asked him if he wanted to replay the message. Anne knocked on the door and poked in her head. The director's meeting is about to start. I'm going to miss it, Michael said faintly. Pardon? Anne frowned. She immediately became concerned because Michael never missed a meeting. He knew he wasn't going to hear a word of the business meeting. It wasn't like he absolutely had to attend every single one, and Max had ruined the entire afternoon for work. I'm not going. Anne stepped into the room and shut the door behind her. He didn't look like he had one of his migraines. She approached his desk, worried. Is something wrong? Michael shook his head. There were no words for what he had just watched. He stood up and gave her the phone. He watched the screen in disbelief beside her as she replayed the video. Anne put a hand to her mouth as she spotted Noah. Oh, my. Michael couldn't help the twitch at his mouth. Exactly. She looked up at him, her eyes dancing with amusement. He chuckled, then gave up and smiled and shook his head. Green tights, Anne managed to say through her hand, her shoulders shaking. And bells. Michael noted with a snort. I heard bells when he moved. Anne burst out laughing. Oh, goodness, I missed that. Can we watch it again? Michael grinned and tapped the screen. Noah wasn't speaking to Max. His brother was always a, been a bit of a wizard with changing things on his phone. He knew that Max had taken a video or pictures and sent them to someone, but he'd managed to delete whoever he'd sent them to before Noah had wrestled his phone back. He hoped it wasn't to someone that Noah wouldn't want seeing him on the elf costume. Who was he kidding? He didn't want anyone to see him as an elf. It was humiliating to wear the costume. Fortunately, it came with a pair of shorts, so he didn't feel like those ballet dancers who were showing off a little much for Noah's comfort. Noah tried not to scowl at the customers. El had put up a poll for the patrons to vote on who was the best elf. She was trying to spread some Christmas cheer. Noah wondered if these elderly folks who insisted on voting weren't a little perverse. They had him in the lead for sexy legs. Noah felt this can be construed as harassment in a court of law, but since he was only going to be here for a week, he didn't really care. He would care even less if Max weren't happily pointing out the fact to him when he could. Part of his mood was heavy diamond ring he was carrying around. It loomed in his coat pocket like a lifetime prison sentence. He shouldn't feel this way about Beth. She was a good friend. She didn't deserve his feelings of resentment. She was blameless in all this, a pawn in his father's game. He'd bought the ring without really thinking, just putting down his gold card and letting the clerk grab something in the right size. He knew if he'd been shopping for Elle, he would have put a lot more thought into it. He also was going to miss Elle like crazy. Somewhere in buying a ring, he knew he'd rather be marrying her. He was about to lose out on the love of his life. He hoped Michael appreciated the effort. Not that Noah would ever tell him about his sacrifice on his brother's behalf. He didn't want Michael feeling guilty for something that wasn't in his control. Noah didn't blame his brother. He blamed his father. Noah tried to be pleasant. He forced himself to smile. He avoided Elle as much as possible. Noah knew he was hurting her, but it would hurt her a lot more if he let her on and left her in the end. He told himself that he would be glad to be done. It was his last shift at the diner, and then the holidays would be here. Afterward, he would return to his regular life. He looked around the cheery kitchen with all its Christmas splendor and felt a moment of sadness. He was going to miss the overdone, even cheesiness of it all. He suspected Beth would have much more understated taste in Christmas decorations. At the end of the night, after cleaning up, Elle pulled out the apple cider and the staff gathered around. They would have a couple of days off for the holidays before returning to work. Elle's parents were due to arrive home for Christmas, and she had assured Max that they would want to keep him on hand for as long as he would be able to spare his time away from his other seasonal job with the demolition company. Tonight is Noah's last night with us, Elle passed out cups of apple cider to the staff. I'd like to propose a toast to the elf that was voted as having the sexiest legs by our patrons. Thanks, Noah said dryly. It's an honor. I didn't think you were going to last this long in the restaurant industry, but I'm glad you proved me wrong, Elle said. You've done really well. Max extended a hand to his brother. And I appreciate you sticking with it and being the stubborn guy you are. Everything is good between us. I knew it was, but I appreciate you saying it. Noah shook Max's hand. Ramos said something and grinned. What? Noah asked. 
He says if you get bored of your other job, you can always come back. Holly put an arm around Aurora. Come and visit sometime, okay? Aurora asked. I will, Noah lied. He would miss them all. You've all been really amazing, and I really do thank you for everything you've done for me. You taught me a lot. Cheers to that, Polly smiled, and they all clinked the mugs before having a drink. This is good, Max remarked. But it's better with this. Polly reached under the counter and set a bottle of whiskey down. Pour me one, Noah offered his mug. They all lined up their mugs for a splash in their cider, which Polly happily did. It is better, Al conceded. She turned up the Christmas music on the radio. Thank you, everyone, for making this a wonderful Christmas season for the restaurant and all our customers. You did a great job. They talked about their holiday plans. Ramos had Christmas for twenty going on, and they all agreed he was very brave. Aurora and Polly would be celebrating together. Max would be spending Christmas with Elle's family, and would bother Noah at some point over the holidays. Noah was going to his parents. They chatted amicably until eventually Ramos had to go. Max gave Noah his new phone number and a hug. You need anything? You let me know. <laughs> Same to you, Noah replied. My door is always open for you. Max gave him a goofy grin and left. Elle had gone to grab more cider, and Noah took the moment to try to commit the place to memory. He should get going. His cell phone rang. Noah looked at the screen to see that it was his father. He thought about declining the call for a moment, but it would just delay the inevitable. He put the phone to his ear. What? Tonight's the night. Pardon? Noah's breath hitched in his throat. You've got the ring? Now go declare your undying love and get the girl, David said. Not tonight, Noah said firmly. I'm busy. I don't think I heard you correctly, David said sharply. Tomorrow night. I'll do it then. Noah hung up. Noah looked at Aurora and Polly, dancing in each other's arms to the cheesy Christmas music. He wanted to memorize this moment and just ignore his father. "'Who's that?' El asked as she set the jug on the counter. "'Another cup?' "'No, thanks.' Noah set down his mug. The magic was gone, soured by his father. "'El, I want to thank you for all your help with Max. I really appreciate you letting me work here to repair our relationship.' This sounds like goodbye, Elle said. It is. Noah wasn't going to lie about this. It wouldn't be fair to Elle to lie. What if I don't want it to be? Elle questioned. I let you dodge me for the past week, but I'm tired of letting you just avoid this. I deserve better. She did deserve better. Noah held out a hand. He was going to regret this, but he wanted to prolong the moment. Can I have this dance? Elle hesitated a moment, but put her hand in his. This doesn't get you out of an explanation. There was no explanation that was going to satisfy Elle, he instinctively knew. Noah gently took her in his arms, and they began to sway to the music. He held her close and breathed in her perfume. He was glad that she chose not to talk. He didn't have any answers for her. When the song ended, Noah cradled her face in his hands, gave her a single kiss, and did the hardest thing he ever had to do. He walked away. Noah felt trepidation as he waited for Beth. He had the ring in his pocket and a deadline looming over his head. He knew his dad had someone watching and reporting back to him. It wasn't a pleasant feeling. He wasn't sure about his chances of success. Somehow, he knew that failure really wasn't an option. He couldn't do the usual professions of love. First, he wasn't in love with her, and he was pretty sure Beth would see through that sort of lie. He was going to have to handle this delicately, and that wasn't a quality he really had. They were out doing something as mundane as Christmas shopping. She was at the till, finishing paying for a purchase that would be a present for her mother. Noah supposed he had better get on his shopping for the Searson family. He would also need to get Beth a gift. He really didn't know what she would prefer. He fingered an ornament as Bethany came up to him, threading her arm through his. Noah gave her an absent smile, and they began walking along the shops. "'You've been on edge all evening,' Bethany remarked. "'Is something going on?' "'Beth, you've enjoyed our time together, right?' he asked. "'Yes,' she gave him a confused smile, wondering what he was going to say. "'I've been thinking that we should move our relationship to something a little more permanent,' Noah said. "'You mean like boyfriend and girlfriend?' Bethany asked. She tilted her head to look at him. Honestly, Noah, 
I was wondering all night if you were going to break off a friendship. Noah looked at her in confusion. Break off our friendship? Yes. It seems like there's something going on between you and L. Bethany pressed gently. If that's the case, you need to let me know. There's nothing going on between L and I, Noah stated firmly. It was probably the biggest lie he had told so far. In fact, I was actually going to propose to you. Pardon? She looked a little shocked. If you agreed that we would be friends and get to know each other. We have been getting to know each other. Noah ran a hand through his hair. He knew he was messing this up, bungling the whole proposal. I feel comfortable with you. We have a good time together. We are friends, and I think we could have a good future together. Bethany drew her brows together in a perplexed frown. Doesn't that seem a little fast? What's fast for some people could be fine for us, Noah forced a smile. If we know what we want, then why shouldn't we act on it? Is this what you want? she inquired. Yes, Noah lied firmly. He pulled out the ring box. It was now or never. He got down on one knee. Bethany, would you do me the honor of becoming my wife? She gave him a searching look, and for a moment Noah thought she was going to decline him. A fissure of panic laced itself down his spine. This was for Michael, he reminded himself. Please, Beth, he asked. She gave a slow nod. Yes. He smiled in relief and slid the ring onto her finger. It was a perfect fit. It was also large and a little gaudy. She looked at it in surprise. If you don't like it, we can go and pick something out together. No, Bethany said. It's what you picked out for me, and I'm honored to wear it. Noah felt a prick of guilt that since he hadn't actually really given the ring any thought other than to buy it. He embraced Beth and gave her a kiss. It was pleasant, but not much else. I have one request, though. She straightened his tie and looked at him. Anything, Noah promised. He was just happy that she had said yes. It meant that he wouldn't have to argue with Dad about this. I'd like a long engagement, Bethany requested. I'd like that, too, Noah said truthfully. He hoped his dad would back off and allow them that. He gave her another kiss before carrying her packages so that they could get her Christmas shopping done. He asked her advice on what to get her parents and brother so that most of his shopping would get done, too. Noah took a breath. He was engaged. He should have felt happy. He hoped Beth felt happy as much as she was able. Noah smiled down at her and listened as she discussed what interested her mom and dad for hobbies and ideas of what he could get them. Noah firmly shoved the thought of Elle out of his head. She had no place in his life any more. Chapter 10 Classical music floated through the air as waiters dispersed wine and liquor. White Christmas lights twinkled over gold and white tulle. Tables invited people to sit. Open spaces invited them to mingle or dance as the moment called for it. L made her way through the crowd. She usually enjoyed the annual hospital fundraiser. This year she had come with a particular goal in mind. She had dressed carefully for it. Her hair floated down her back in waves, swept to the side with a single small red rose that matched her hot red dress that clung to every curve. She felt sexy and confident. Her mama had helped her with encouraging advice over the phone to go after what she wanted. She was on the hunt. The Ramsley family owned this hospital, and she had learned that Noah was going to be here tonight from a colleague. She was going to knock his socks off. If he thought things were over, he was sadly mistaken. She wasn't about to take no for an answer. Not tonight. Elle smiled at the people she knew, slowly moving through the mass of people. She was in no hurry. She wanted to spot Noah first because she knew that seeing him in a tux would stop the world from rotating for a moment, and she would need a little time to just drink in the sight of him. Elle! Bethany Searson came forward from the crowd to greet her. She was stunning. Her dancer's figure was encased in a white satin sheath with blue flower embroidery. The back of the dress scooped down in a sexy sophistication. It's nice to see you. Hello, Bethany. Elle smiled tightly. She had known that Bethany was going to be here as Noah's date. She just hadn't expected to run into her. You look very beautiful. 
Bethany seemed surprised by the compliment. You look rather lovely yourself. Elle hadn't been going for lovely. She'd been aiming for sexy goddess when she picked out the red dress. Now, next to Bethany's classic elegance, she felt cheap and tawdry. The red dress was overstated, even for a Christmas fundraiser where no one else was wearing the color. Elle felt awkward. She'd gone from predatory and confident to feeling ashamed of her outfit in two seconds, thanks to Bethany. She didn't really know what to say to the woman beside her. What did one say to the woman who had the man you loved? "'How do you support the hospital?' Bethany asked, groping for small talk to cover the awkward moment. "'I'm a dietitian. I work for the hospital,' El said. All employees of certain status had been offered tickets. It was obvious Bethany had been invited in hopes that she would donate to the hospital's finances. Bethany's brow puckered just a little. "'I thought you were a waitress.' "'I'm just filling in for my parents while they're away on vacation. "'They own the restaurant,' El replied. "'Did you want to say hi to Noah? "'He's talking with his father near the stage,' "'Bethany motioned in their direction. "'I believe David said he was going to make some sort of announcement.' "'No, thank you,' El said quickly. "'I'll just go get myself a drink from the bar.' "'Okay. Have a good night, then,' Bethany said politely. "'El nodded and retreated to the bar. "'She felt like a heel.' Bethany was a perfectly nice woman. She eyed the bartender. I'd like something strong, and I'd like it fast. A woman sighed beside her. She was blonde and athletic, with an understated gold dress that shimmered slightly. Same for me, only make mine a strawberry daiquiri with extra vodka. Man trouble? El asked dryly. More like the lack of a particular man, that is the trouble. She extended her hand. Hi, man. El... She shook Anne's hand. I have the same issue. He's here with someone else. Anne gave a sympathetic smile. Mine's here with me, only he's not mine. How does that even work? Elle raised an eyebrow as she accepted a drink from the bartender. I'm his secretary. Anne sipped her daiquiri. I follow him around nearly every day, making his life easier. You two aren't. Elle left the sentence hanging. Far from her to judge, since she was trying to steal someone else's boyfriend. <laughs> no, I wish, Anne snorted. Eighteen years, and I've been his secretary, and the man is a monk. That has to be tough, Elle sympathized. She decided she was just regrouping. Once she had some liquid courage, she would find Noah and make certain he didn't turn her down this time. Anne gave a dry laugh. I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm confiding in you. It must be because you're not one of them. Not one of them? El was a little confused, dragging her attention back to the woman beside her. One of them. Anne motioned to the crowd. The woman with their perfect posture, their designer brands, their airbrushed perfection, the small smile in place and head nodding. Those perfect paragons of society. One of them. Oh, El said softly. Anne was right. She wasn't one of them, and until tonight had never once wanted to be. It wasn't that she wanted to be one of them, she just wanted to have one of their men, and at the moment that seemed impossible to bridge the chasm between the two worlds. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be insulting. If it's any consolation, I'm not one of them either. Anne rubbed her temple with a couple of fingers. She gestured to a group of people near the stage. My boss is just arguing with his father, and that means the rest of the night is going to be a very tense and silent. Not very party-like. Elle looked, and her breath was taken away. There was Noah, so handsome. She felt like the bottom had dropped out of her stomach, and it was hard to breathe for a moment. He was all that she wanted, and he'd never felt so far away. He was talking to two other men, both obviously related to him. His father and a brother, maybe? Could that be David and Michael Ramsley? Noah looked angry. Their father looked like he was gloating. Michael looked calm. "'You're Michael's secretary,' El guessed. "'She certainly hoped so, otherwise this was going to get even worse.' "'Yes,' Anne looked at her a little more intently. "'You must be El, the waitress from the diner.' El looked at her startled. "'How did you know?' "'I overhear things. All good secretaries do.' Anne shook her head and watched Michael talk. "'He's furious. See the tick by his jaw?' El looked, and there it was the tell-tale tick from Michael. If Anne hadn't said anything, she would never have known. 
Now with Noah, anyone could see that he was angry, the way he was emphatically talking in low voice to the two men. What are they talking about? No idea, but if David is happy, it can't be good, Anne said darkly. It was obvious that Anne had a deep dislike for the senior Mr. Ramsley. L swallowed thickly as Bethany approached the group and took Noah's arm. Immediately, all the men cut off the discussion they had been having. Noah leaned in and said something in her ear. Bethany looked at Noah, a little startled, while David leaned forward and greeted Bethany, welcoming her. L downed the rest of her drink. Oh, Anne looked at her in sympathy. It's Noah, isn't it? The one you love? L had a bitter laugh. I had this grand plan to come in here, all sexy, and steal him away. Then I ran into Bethany, who greeted me like a lady, so I slunk away to the bar here. Pathetic, isn't it? No, Anne said softly. We can't always help what our hearts feel. Elle gave her new friend a sad smile. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you are enjoying this evening as much as I am. David Ramsley had taken the stage and was smiling at the crowd who paused to listen expectantly. I have a special announcement to make. I know that we're all here for the fundraising, but this is a personal announcement that I'm so happy about I just can't hold it in. I'd like to welcome Bethany Searson into our family. She and my son Noah have just become engaged. Congratulations, Bethany and Noah. David smiled and clapped. The crowd quickly followed suit. L dropped her empty glass and it shattered across the floor. She felt like the world had shattered too. She was not going to cry, she told herself. She didn't cry when she broke her arm playing ball hockey. She didn't cry when she failed music class. She didn't cry when Tommy Dielson had punched her in second grade. She would not cry now, even as a tear fell and she dragged in a much-needed breath. Her eyes locked onto Noah, who helped Bethany onto the stage. The couple walked forward to receive handshakes from David. Noah turned and looked over the crowd, and he stilled as he caught sight of her. Al knew that he saw her. They stared for what seemed like an eternity before David was putting the microphone in Noah's hand and Elle couldn't take it anymore. She didn't want to hear what he had to say. She couldn't stand here while people congratulated him on what had to be the biggest mistake of his life. It certainly was the biggest mistake of hers. Elle? Aunt Stan? Are you going to be okay? Elle turned and walked blindly through the crowd. She needed to get out of here. She pushed past people elbowing as necessary. Elle, here! Anne was tugging on her arm. There's a side exit. It will be quicker. El knew there was a side exit. This was her hospital. She worked here. Why had she forgotten about it? Maybe it was just because she couldn't see. She wiped her face furiously and followed Anne. There was a ladies' restroom nearby, and she automatically went to it. Once inside, she tore the stupid rose out of her hair and kicked off the high heels that were killing her feet. She looked in the mirror, and for the first time in her life, she wished she was tall, blonde, and named Bethany Searson. Elle, who never cried, sat on the floor and bawled. It hurt so much, she thought miserably. Anne sat down beside her and rubbed her back. Wisely, she said nothing. Finally, the tears dried up, and Elle was exhausted. Her nose was stuffed, and she knew she didn't look good. Elle got up and wet some paper towels for her to wash her face with. Afterward, they sat, leaning against the wall, in silence. Anne's phone chirped. She ignored it and slipped off her heels. Thank you, Elle croaked. Her throat felt like sandpaper. What are you going to do? Anne asked politely. What else can I do? Either I accept it, or do my best to break it up, so Noah will choose me instead. Elle had a watery hiccup. Elle, he's engaged, Anne said. He asked Bethany to marry him. I think you need to accept it. I love him, Elle said simply. What else am I supposed to do? <laughs> You're asking the wrong girl, Anne stated dryly. Her phone chirped again. You might as well look at it. Elle sighed and picked up her phone. It was a text from Michael wondering where she was. She set it back down. Aren't you going to answer that? Elle asked. Let him wonder, Anne shrugged. Maybe it will do him some good. Her phone rang. There's a nice little bar near here that I really enjoy. Would you like to go? asked Anne. Who is it? Elle gestured at the phone. It's Michael. 
He's frustrated and probably wants to leave early. Anne sighed. You know him that well? Questioned Al. Eighteen years and I'm in love with the man. I know him, Anne stated dryly. Do you think it's just them? That these Ramsley brothers have something wrong with them? That they can't figure it out that the best person is right in front of their noses? Wondered Al. Oh, he's oblivious, Anne agreed. Have you ever just told him? Al looked at Anne, curious. No, Anne laughed. That's about the only thing I haven't done. Maybe you should. Al got up and grabbed her shoes. What are you going to do? asked Anne, a little alarmed. I'm going to tell Noah that I love him. Elf shrugged. I might need a ride to that bar afterward. L. Anne felt bad for her new friend. Are you sure this is a good idea? No, but it's the only one I've got. She grimaced at her reflection in the mirror. She finger-combed her hair. Maybe you should wait until after the fundraiser. Catch him at another time when it's not so public, Anne suggested. She got to her feet and warily watched Elle. Nope, I've got courage right now. Elle rummaged in her clutch for mascara and lipstick. Or I will after we visit the bar they've set up in the ballroom. I don't think this is such a fabulous idea, Anne warned. It could go horribly wrong. Yes, it could, Elle waved the mascara wand. It could go wonderfully right, though. I doubt it. They just announced their engagement. Anne sighed and looked at her own reflection. She took out a lip gloss. I would rethink this, L. I I only lose my dignity. At least when I'm old and alone, I won't regret that I never tried. L said firmly. She capped the lipstick. I have to try. The things that are worth having are always the hardest to try for. Well, when you've crashed and burned, I'll be ready to hit McGrady's bar. You're invited, Al said. Thanks. Al straightened her shoulders. Let's grab some liquid courage so I can tell the love of my life that he's making the biggest mistake of his life. She marched out of the washroom with Anne in her wake. Fortunately, she spied Noah straight away by the doors talking to Michael. Al walked straight up to him before she could lose her nerve. Al, I... Whatever Noah had been about to say was lost as Al reached up, threading her fingers through his hair plastering herself to him and drew his head down for a searing kiss. Anne shared an uncomfortable look with Michael. Elle broke off the kiss. I love you. Noah stared down at her. I love you, Elle repeated. Don't you have anything to say? L, I... Noah began, but broke off when he saw Bethany approach. Beth, we need to talk. Noah, Michael warned, think about this. I have... Noah gave a sad smile. El, I'm very sorry, but I'm engaged to Bethany. If you'll please excuse us. He pulled Bethany's arm, linking it with his, and walked down the hall with her. Bethany looked at El in consternation before engaging in quiet conversation with Noah as they walked away. El felt like she was going to be sick. Anne, would you please look after El? Michael held out a set of keys to Anne, who took them. I'm going to see if I can sort out this mess. Do you think you can? Anne asked quietly. I don't know, Michael frowned. I'm sorry we had to meet like this, Elle. Elle nodded numbly. She watched Michael go down the hall. She let Anne lead her away. They were right. He is reserved and quiet. Too serious. Michael? Anne smiled sadly. Yes, he's very quiet and capable. He does have a good sense of humor. It just rarely surfaces anymore. Sometimes I think he would be a much happier man if he didn't work it with his father. Shall we hit McGrady's? Elle shook her head miserably. I'm sorry. I just want to go home, if that's okay with you. Elle wrapped an arm around her. That's fine, Elle. You love her, Bethany stated in her calm and quiet way as they walked away from the others. She decided to be the friend that he desperately needed in this moment. She loves you. It's not hard, Noah. Noah sighed. It's complicated. No, it isn't. Besides, don't you need me to agree to marrying you? Bethany took the ring off and held it out to him. Take it back. Beth, Noah sighed. Please, just put the ring back on. We're supposed to be friends, Beth admonished. As your friend, I'm not going to let you make this mistake. You are not a mistake, Noah protested, taking her hands in his. Then tell me what is going on, Bethany insisted. I know that everyone wants to treat me like porcelain because of my condition, but I'm perfectly intelligent and able to handle whatever it is. 
I'd like to know as well, Michael approached the couple. Michael, this doesn't involve you, Noah grimaced. He really was lying far too much. I'm not leaving until I understand what is going on, Michael said grimly. He loves Elle, and she loves him. Normally, they would be the ones getting engaged, but for some reason that he won't explain, he wants to marry me. Bethany pulled her hands out of his and held the ring out to him. Either take the ring back, or explain. If we're friends like you keep saying we are, then you owe me the truth. Noah ran a frustrated hand through his hair. It's complicated. You already said that. Bethany took his other hand and put the ring in it. I don't love you, Noah. Please don't think that you're going to hurt my feelings by breaking things off. It's not about that, Noah sighed. Goodbye, Noah. Bethany turned away and couldn't get much more than five steps before Noah called after her. Peth, wait. Noah threw his hands up in the air. He threatened you, Michael. He said that you would ruin my career and yours. Who? Bethany asked. How can you threaten my career? A concerned Michael questioned. He has nothing on me. I made absolutely certain of that. Something about the journals, Noah explained. He said there were journals and he could make it look bad for you and Anne. Who? Bethany asked again. She looked from brother to brother, confused. Our father, Michael said in disgust. He threatened to get you fired, Miss Gondok, since Anne is in your employ. I don't know if it's true, but he said it could affect your status as a lawyer. Noah said in frustration, I'm trying to protect you. I should have stopped him when he fired Max. Michael was furious. This ends now. Why would your father threaten you? Bethany was confused. He's a narcissistic, power-hungry manipulator, Michael bit out. It's part of what he does. How are you going to stop him? Noah couldn't see any solution. He has my test. He has copies of your journals. If I don't do as he says, we're both finished in our professions. I have something on him, Michael said. You're going to blackmail him? Noah said slowly. He didn't know that Michael could do such a thing. Are you sure? He can't keep doing this to us, Michael vowed. I'll make him end this. Whatever you have, is it big enough to make him stop? Noah asked. Michael gave a short nod. Consider yourself free to do what you want, Noah. Don't listen to the old man anymore. Marry who you want. Your career is safe. Michael, are you certain? Noah asked. Very. Michael nodded. I'd appreciate it if you stayed on as director of the laboratories. Noah nodded. I don't know how it's possible, but if you can do it, thank you. Consider it done, Michael said firmly. Beth, I am so beyond sorry. Noah looked down at her. Bethany smiled. Don't be. If I were you, I'd get a different ring for Elle. That one is hideous. Noah gave her a hug. Thank you. Candy, a new ring, flowers... Get down on one knee, and the first words out of your mouth had better be, I love you, Bethany advised. I've watched a lot of Hallmark movies. I'll remember that, Noah laughed. He grinned. Are you sure you're okay? Noah, go! She gave him a little push. Michael and Bethany watched as he left. I wonder where he's going to find a jeweler at this time of night. It's Christmas. Someone's bound to be open, Michael said. Are you going to be okay? I'm fine. I won't deny that I had a twinge of disappointment, but I don't love him, Bethany sighed. Sometimes she wondered if she would ever love anyone. And Elle is a really wonderful person. Thank you for being so understanding about all of this. He was grateful that she was. Bethany shrugged. Maybe someday I'll inspire someone to love me that much. She certainly hoped so. After curious Bethany had all her questions answered... Michael made certain that she got a hired car to go home in before searching out his father. David was laughing with his cronies, accepting accolades on his son's impending nuptials. He came up behind his father and leaned forward, saying quietly but determinedly, We need to talk. Now. David turned to face his eldest and raised an eyebrow. I'm afraid I'm busy. Michael narrowed his eyes. Janna? Andrew? Molson? Shall I continue? David froze for a second before a smile grew wider. Are we going to do this now? What is their mother's name? Michael asked softly with an edge. Margot, isn't it? We really are. David gave a laugh. 
If you'll excuse me, gentlemen, my son needs my attention. Michael spared an insincere smile for the group of men before clamping a hand on his father's shoulder and steering him to an empty room. David shook off Michael's hand as the door closed behind them. What is this all about, Michael? You threatened Noah, Anne, and I, he said sharply. I should have done this a long time ago when you pulled the rug out from under Max. You did nothing then, and you'll do nothing now, David scoffed. All I did was give Noah a push to marry a family friend. And if you think I came on to Anne, she's a lying little climber. Michael went still. You what? She didn't tell you? David gave a short laugh. I'm surprised she didn't go crying to you, trying to get your sympathy and protection. She'd been trying to get in your pants since the day she was hired. You really need to stop talking. Michael was quietly intense. You also are going to stop blackmailing Noah. Or what? You think you're going to threaten me? David sneered. You don't have the balls. I have pictures. I have school reports. And I know it didn't end with just Margaret. There was Glenna, Susan, Marjorie. Shall I continue? Michael grimly said. This would devastate Mom. Which is why you'll never say anything. You're too soft, David growled. Wrong. You can destroy my career. I'm independently wealthy. I don't care if I never practice law again or enter a boardroom. You could try to get Noah to fall into place, but Bethany finds that she doesn't want to marry him, and you can't control her, Michael explained. It's your career that's on the line here. What about dear Anne? David said softly, striking like a snake. She has such lovely long legs. I thought about her a time or two when she was throwing herself at me. What happens to her career when I spill it to the press that you've been having an affair with her the entire time she's worked here? From day one, when she was just seventeen years old. I don't know how you're going to like being called a pervert, but she's going to have her career destroyed right along yours. The press will eat the whole thing up. Michael gritted his teeth as he chose not to reply to the remarks that David had made. It was wiser not to play to David's games. You're going to announce your retirement within the month. You will retire by the end of this year. I'm not going to ask you to reconcile with Max. I'd rather you to be out of his life. You will let Mom see him whenever she likes. You will not threaten or blackmail Noah, Anne, or Max ever again. You agree to these terms, or everyone knows what a philanderer you are. They'll know about your extra families and our half-siblings. Do I make myself clear? You won't do it, David scoffed. You can have a year in the power seat, or you can get kicked out by the board the day after I leak your disgrace and all its glory to the press, Michael said softly with resolve. It's your choice. And if I make good on my threats first? He asked, narrowing his eyes as he tried to judge Michael's commitment to the course of action he was proposing. Then we all go down in flames. Michael's voice was steel. Maybe we deserve it. David stared at his oldest. Then he burst out laughing. I think you really mean it. Every word, Michael promised. He grinned. I always knew you were like me deep down. Announce your retirement, Michael said flatly. Sure, sure, whatever you say, son. David clapped him on the back. I raised one right. You make me proud, Michael. You're not soft like the other two. You're going to be just like me. I can leave the company in good hands. Michael turned away from him leaving the room and David's laughter behind. He made it to the parking lot before he remembered that he'd given the keys of his car to Anne. Elle was glad that she had opted to go straight home. She didn't think going to the bar was going to be a good idea in her current state. Not that she wouldn't go to the bar with Anne another time. She rather liked Michael's secretary. Anne had brought her to the Beamer, and Elle looked at the car in surprise. It was luxurious. I guess the family has money to burn. You didn't know, Anne said dryly. Sort of. More that I really didn't care. Elle sighed as she got in. She felt numb. She didn't think that she would ever find another one like Noah. She'd done everything she could, and it hadn't turned out like the fairy tale ending that was promised to all the little girls growing up in America. Her mother had been wrong about finding the one that made your heart sing. She had no more tears, so she just leaned her head against the window, watching the people in the city go about their business. The streets looked so festive and jolly for the holidays. It used to be her favorite time of the year. It wasn't anymore. She wished her mom was home already. 
The two days she would have to wait for her parents to be at the airport seemed like forever now. It would be wonderful to just hug her and be sad together. Her mama would sympathize and feed her all the chocolate they could afford. She was a good woman. I need chocolate, Elle said miserably, and ice cream. Shall we do a trip to the convenience store? Anne suggested. I could use something, too. Maybe those peanut butter cup things. Mmm, Elle agreed. Those are good. They must have made quite a sight. Two exquisitely dressed women were eating the junk food at a convenience store. Fortunately, the clerk decided not to comment as they spent a small fortune on whatever caught their fancy. Anne and Elle each carted a set of bags up to her apartment. Elle offered comfortable clothes, and Anne gratefully accepted. They both settled on the couch in tees and pajama pants, spoons in hand, to dig out into the ice cream. "'Why do we love men again?' asked Elle. Anne looked cookies and cream off her spoon. "'Because we have a weak spot that goes all gooey when the right one looks our way. If we could just turn it off, it would be easier.' Elle sighed. "'Easier, but not necessarily as nice. It was wonderful while it lasted.' "'Don't cry,' Anne warned. If you start, I'll start, and I'm not pretty when I cry. I've surprised I've held out this long. Usually just pictures of sad kittens start me bawling. Elle gave a watery smile. I usually never cry. The power of a man, Anne muttered and popped another spoonful of ice cream into her mouth. To make a woman cry. I have wine, Elle said. We should have wine. That would pair well with the ice cream, Anne agreed as she sprinkled some chocolate candies onto her pint. Elle got up and went to the kitchen. She pulled two wine glasses out of her cupboard, and there was a knock at the door. Elle set down the glasses and opened the door. She looked at Noah and shut the door. Go away. Who is it? Anne hung over the back of the couch, trying to see. Elle, could I just please talk to you? Noah called through the door. You had your chance to talk to me. You blew it! Elle folded her arms and glared at the door. Something about how you were engaged? I'm not any more, Noah replied. Elle felt a flutter of hope go through her chest. Why, I thought Bethany was perfect for you. I don't want perfect. I want you, Noah sighed. Could you open the door? Elle sniffed. She could feel another tear coming, and she wiped her eyes furiously. I don't think you know what you want. You didn't earlier. It was complicated. It always is with you, Elle said wearily. It's not complicated anymore. Elle, please open the door. I want to talk to you. Noah leaned against the wall and waited. I need to talk to you. I don't know what you could have to say that I would want to hear. Elle folded her arms, hugging herself. You seemed pretty clear back at the hospital that I wasn't your choice. I love you. I would like to explain what happened. Mostly, I just want you to know that I love you and I'm not going anywhere until we've talked. Noah replied patiently. You know I'm stubborn. I worked for over a month just to get Max to talk to me again. I'll stay outside your door for an entire year if that's what it takes, because I love you and I want to be with you. Elle sniffed and wiped her eyes again. Did you hear me, Elle? I love you. Noah quickly stood up straight as Elle opened the door. I love your quirky Christmas traditions. I want to meet your parents. I'd like us eventually to be like those old couples at the diner, arguing over desserts concerned about cholesterol because we love each other. Say it again, she demanded. He smiled. I love you. Elle launched herself into his arms, hugging him. You're not marrying Bethany? No, he hugged her back. I was thinking if you'd like to, we could get married instead. What? Elle drew back in surprise. He sheepishly produced a ring. I thought it might be a good Christmas gift since you liked the holiday so much, he said uncertainly. Please say yes. Yes! Al kissed him and then held out her hand so that he could put the ring on. This does not get you out of explaining anything. I promise to tell you everything. Noah grinned as he slid the ring on her finger. He kissed her again. Anne cleared her throat. I think I'll be going. Elle gave her a little wave and kept kissing Noah. Anne stepped into the hall and closed the door after her. She looked down at her ice cream. She still had the spoon. She had also left her heels inside. Well, it wasn't like they went with the pajamas anyway. She scooped another dollop of cookies and cream into her mouth and padded down the hall. Bear frit and ice cream in the beamer. Good thing Michael would never know.
Chapter 11 Noah whistled as he came into Ramsley Pharma late in the morning after Boxing Day. Life was good. He went to see his brother first and found Anne in the outer office. Anne, I want to say thank you for staying with Al yesterday. Noah went directly to her. She says you were a real friend to her. You have a hickey on your neck, Anne remarked without looking up. What? Noah slapped a hand to his neck. Where? Anne looked up with a twinkle in her eye. I'm kidding. I like Al. Noah grinned. He was one lucky man. How's Michael's schedule? Does he have a moment that I can talk to him? He's got twenty minutes or so before the next meeting. Anne looked through the glass wall at Michael, concerned for him. He seems a little off today. Well, maybe my news will cheer him up, Noah said. I hope so. Anne smiled and grabbed a group of files. Agreed. Noah knocked on Michael's door before he entered the office, closing the door behind him. How did it go? Is Dad going to back off? If I ever become like our father, you will tell me, won't you? Michael sat on the edge of the window frame, looking out over the city. Michael, you're nothing like our old man, Noah said. He sat down in Michael's office chair because it was nearer to his brother. Did he try to get inside your head? His brother grimaced. When isn't he? Don't let him. Easy to say, tough to do, Michael fiddled with a pen. Your job is secure with the company. You'll have to take on the head of the laboratory's position, but you knew that was coming anyways. Is he going to be quiet about my marrying Al? Noah wanted to know. He had no intention of introducing her to David if the man was going to be rude to her. He will welcome her into this family with open arms, Michael said grimly. If you even want to continue to talk to him, which I think is optional for you at this point. How did you do it? He was ready to destroy me and you with that ultimatum. Noah couldn't believe it. It must be something huge that you blackmailed him with. It was, Michael said woodenly, still looking out the window. I think the worst part is where he smiled and said I was just like him after all. Hey! Noah stood up and put a hand on Michael's shoulder, giving it a squeeze. You hated blackmailing him. Dad actually likes to pull strings. He's the master puppeteer of all his manipulations. He enjoys that sort of stuff. You don't. You're nothing like him. Thank you. Michael gave Noah a tight smile. You know, I was finally able to get an independent lab to verify the diabetic drug should have failed in clinical trials. You didn't use that to blackmail Dad with? Noah had tried to replicate some of the chemistries of the drug without success. We could help out Max with this. Give him his old job back if he wants it. No, Michael sighed heavily. I could only do it in a third-rate lab out of Peru. No better labs will touch it. They're afraid of Ramsley Pharma, and I can't blame them. The results will never stand up in court. If it's not the drug results, then what did you use? Noah wondered. Something far more personal. As I've said before, it's better that you don't know. If it manages to go sideways, then hopefully I'm the only one Dad comes for. Michael watched Anne in the outer office for a moment. Truth was, he wasn't going to be the only one affected if David went rogue. Well, if you need any help with anything, let me know. I owe you, offered Noah. I'm your brother. You owe me nothing, Michael responded. He tossed the pen on his desk. Good news is, Dad has agreed to retire in the next year. Hopefully that means he won't be interfering in our lives so much. You got him to agree to retire? Noah asked in disbelief. He could just not believe it. He thought the old man would never leave the company. It was his life. Whatever dirt Michael had on David, it had to be earth-shattering. Barely, Michael lifted a shoulder and a shrug. He is nearly eighty, after all. Michael, are you sure you're okay with this? Noah asked. No, Michael said softly. I'm not okay with it. I just don't see any other alternative. I'm sorry, Noah said. Michael nodded, tired. He had another headache coming on. You should take Mom to see Max. She misses him. Do you think Dad would allow it? Noah scowled. He doesn't have a choice, Michael said grimly. Just don't be blatant about it. The less he knows, the better. What about you? Noah asked. When are you going to see Max? I don't know. Maybe when I forgive myself for not supporting him like I should have? Michael sighed. I'll pay for the steak dinner for you two. I lost the bet and I'll do that, but I think it's best if it's just you and Max right now. 
He'll forgive you. He's our brother. Noah put a hand on Michael's shoulder. Eventually, you'll forgive yourself, too. Michael nodded, but remained silent. Noah gave Michael a hug. Hey, I know we don't really say it, but I do love you. You're not my favorite brother since Max is, but you're a close second. Michael smiled at Noah's teasing and gave him a small shove. Get out of here. Go see your girl or something. Thanks, Michael, Noah said before he left the office. After he left, Anne came into the office with a glass of water and a couple of pain medication pills from her purse. She set them on the desk. I don't know how you pulled it off, Michael, but your brother and Elle are very happy. Thank you for looking after Elle last night. Michael took the pills, swung them down with some water. And thank you for looking after me. You're welcome. Anne gave him a smile and took the glass when he was finished. I've got the presentation portfolios already. Michael nodded. He knew that David was likely just making things up about Anne, trying to get Michael to be too furious to think clearly during their argument the other night, but part of him wondered at what the truth was. He stopped Anne just as she was about to exit the office. Anne? Yes, she paused, her hand on the handle of the door. Has my father ever made unwanted advances to you? Michael said evenly as he watched her carefully. He could tell that he had coughed her off guard before expression shuddered and she thought of what she should say. He has. Anne closed her eyes and took a deep breath. It was a long time ago. I rebuffed him and did my best to avoid him. Why didn't you tell me? He walked up to her so he could see her face clearly. Anne sighed and looked up at him. He's your father. I didn't want to make things difficult for you, and I was young and wasn't quite sure what he meant. Don't lie to me, Anne, my uncle quietly warned. Okay, so I knew what he wanted. He was pretty explicit. Anne shrugged. I still didn't want to involve you. You should have. I'm your boss. I'm here to help you with things like that, Michael said. Now what is the real reason you didn't tell me? Anne sighed, and she confessed. He made me feel cheap, like I was hanging myself out for anyone with a pulse. I was ashamed. You've nothing to be ashamed of. The telltale tick was back at Michael's jaw. He won't be doing it again. Anne put a hand on his arm. Please don't do anything, Michael. It happened a long time ago. He hasn't bothered me since, and I just tried to do my best to avoid him. Anne, Michael was starting to say, but she interrupted him. Please, Anne pleaded. I don't want to make any trouble for you. It's in the past, and I'd rather just forget about it. It's not any trouble. If anyone ever says or does anything to make you feel uncomfortable again, let me know, Michael said. Anne could see that she wasn't going to convince him to let it drop. Okay. Michael gave her a nod and headed out to the boardroom. One year. One year and his father would be retired from the company. Perhaps things would change for the better then. Hey, look who missed us, Polly said in greeting, and Noah gave him a nod as he came into the kitchen of the restaurant. Have you got a minute? Noah leaned on the counter, watching Max. Nope, I'm working, Max said, dumping some soap into the wash water. Well, that's too bad, because I brought a special visitor today for you, Noah grinned. What? Max dropped the pot back into the sudsy water and wiped his hands on a towel. Who? Go and see, Noah motioned to the restaurant. Elle is having coffee with her. Max shot Noah a confused look, but went into the restaurant. He saw Elle near the back, talking to an elegantly dressed woman. Mom? Rachel Ramsley looked up from examining Elle's ring. She stood with tears in her eyes and opened her arms for Max to give her a hug, which he gladly did. Maxwell Arthur Ramsley, where have you been for the past three years? Here and there. He rubbed her back and wiped a tear from his own eye. I missed you. Noah said he had a late Christmas surprise for me, and I thought it was the lovely woman right here who's going to be my daughter-in-law. Then you walked in the door. Rachel sniffed and backed up, patting Max on the cheek. I'm just so pleased. Thank you, Noah. Noah grinned as he sat down beside Elle and took her hand. I thought we should do better than the regular bottle of wine this year. Max, why don't you take a break and catch up with Mrs. Ramsley, Elle said. Oh, call me Rachel, she offered. She took a tissue and wiped her eyes delicately before sitting down. You're going to be part of our family. 
Max pulled out a chair and sat. This was your secret weapon, wasn't it? Mom always is, Noah smiled. She's the best. I figured if she couldn't get us talking again, no one could. I'm just glad I didn't have to use her. Thanks, Max said dryly. I'd start not talking to you again, but it's still holiday season, so I figure I'll give you a pass on this one. Good, Noah replied happily. You could use a haircut. Rachel gave Max's hair a little tug. Although you're the only one with curls. You were such a beautiful baby. Elle, you should see the pictures I have of these two boys. You should, Noah grinned. No, Max shook his head. Not the baby pictures. You're just jealous because Mom didn't cut your hair until you were two. Noah smiled a little maliciously. People started asking if he was a girl. Rachel sighed regretfully. I had to take him to the barber. Then I really do want to see the photos, Elle smiled. Max groaned. Maxwell, what happened? Rachel demanded. Where is your tooth? Max put a hand to his jaw, remembering the tooth that had gotten knocked out recently. With an impish look, he said... Noah did it. Oh, I did not, Noah stated emphatically. Elle laughed. She could just imagine how their children would be if these two were anything to go by. She held Noah's hand a little tighter, happy to have her ring and her wonderful fiancé for Christmas. Stay tuned for an epilogue and a sneak peek at the next Ramsley Brothers book. Epilogue one and a half years later. Elle stared at the screen. Two? Yep. Here's baby A and here is baby B, the technician said, outlining each of the babies on the screen with her finger. No. Elle tried to deny what she was seeing. I came in because the doctor was concerned that I was maybe a little big, and we were worried it might be a big baby. The last scan showed one baby. One baby boy. Well, that's two baby boys now. One of them must have been hiding behind his brother during the last exam. It happens on rare occasions, the technician smiled. Congratulations. Two, Elle repeated. Two boys. Twins, she confirmed. Elle dragged in a deep breath. She was going to have to switch around the entire nursery. Two babies. At once. They were going to need to buy more of everything. The technician gave her a paper towel to wipe the gel off her abdomen. She didn't know how Noah was going to take it. They were already arguing about names for one boy. Elle adjusted her clothing, which wasn't easy since she was outgrowing the maternity wear that she bought only a few weeks ago. Two. That's right, the technician repeated tolerantly. Elle swallowed. I can do this. Of course you can, she agreed. Elle nodded and received her printout of the babies. Her babies. She felt love blossom in her heart and knew that they would figure it out. It would just be busier. She wiped away a tear. Hey, it's okay. You'll be fine. The technician grabbed a tissue for Elle. Thanks. It is okay. Elle gave her a brilliant smile. My husband is going to be shocked, but we'll be so grateful as long as they are healthy. Everything looks good, she confirmed. Good. Elle thanked her and drove to the restaurant. She was ravenously hungry after her appointment. No wonder she was eating for three. She brought in the groceries her mama had requested, giving her a kiss and showing off the scan. Elle's parents were so excited about the coming grandchildren, and she smiled through their hugs. She ordered breakfast and spotted Max with a lovely-looking red head. She decided to join them. Uh-oh, incoming. Max stood as she waded over, a stream of language following Elle as she told him in Spanish about the second baby. Max looked a little shocked and repeated the word, too, before he hugged her. "'This is all your fault,' Elle switched to English as she sat down in Max's chair and rubbed her stomach. "'Hi, I'm Elle.' Paget, the redhead introduced herself politely. "'Nice to meet you.' Two, Is the doctor sure? Wouldn't they have found that out before now?' Max asked as he purloined another chair from a table and sat down. They say the heartbeats were synced together, and he was hiding behind his brother during the first ultrasound. I'm going to be fat, she eyed Paget and turned to Max. She's very pretty. Max grinned. Yes, she is. You said his brother? Two boys? Don't remind me. One was all it was supposed to be. Elle wagged a finger under Max's nose. Is she the reason you haven't been here recently? How long have you been dating her? Um, I'm right here. 
Paget weakly waved a hand. Max took Paget's hand in his. She is the reason I've been a bit busy to come by lately. Um, Max, how do you two know each other? Paget asked carefully. Hell is my sister-in-law, Max explained. She married my brother. Okay, I have to ask. Paget pointed to Elle's midsection. How is the baby Max's fault? Elle laughed. He introduced me to his brother, Noah. Those are my first nephews in there, Max grinned and gestured to Elle's midsection. And don't tell your brother. I just found out. Elle gave him a poke with a finger. The owner's wife came with three plates of food. She set one in front of each of them. Elle smiled at her. Thank you, Mama. Mama told her to make sure she ate it all. She needed it for the babies. Elle agreed, and Mama went back to help with the customers. Elle salted her eggs. Max used to work here during the winters. His brother Noah would come in to bother him, and Max introduced us. Noah has a bad habit of following me around, which is funny, because he's older than I am, Max said as he speared some home fries. He was worried about you, Elle said as she sipped some coffee. Worried about you? Paget questioned Max. It was nothing to worry about. I was fine. Max gave Elle a look like he wished she wasn't saying so much. You were living on the streets. You still are. Elle shook her head. You're crazy. No one I have a spare room that you could use. Paget stopped eating. What? Living on the streets? Max looked uncomfortable and Elle dropped her fork as she realized the error of what she had said. You haven't told her. Haven't told me what? Paget's voice may have been a little sharp. We've just started dating, Max set down his cup of coffee. It hadn't come up just yet. Tell me what? Paget repeated sweetly, looking at Max, who looked daggers at Elle, who kept shifting her gaze between the two of them. Elle sighed. She didn't want to be the one to tell her, but obviously she'd put her foot in it. He's homeless, honey. Excuse me? Paget stared at her in disbelief. Max used to come here all the time when he was looking for work. We have a jobs board at the back. Anyhow, his brother would come in and check up on him. My parents own the place, which is how I met Noah. Elle was sympathetic. It was obviously a shock to the poor woman. Max is homeless. I thought he would have told you. You're the first girl he's brought here. Paget looked at Max in stunned silence. I was going to tell you. Just not quite yet. He gave Elle a tight look and reached for Paget's hand, which she pulled away. Paget. I think I need a moment, she looked at Elle. How much was the breakfast? It's covered, Elle replied. She felt so bad for having said anything. I'm buying, Max said at the same time. Paget fumbled for her purse. Excuse me. Paget, you don't need to go. I can explain. Max rose to his feet as Paget did. Paget walked away and Max gave Elle a frustrated look before chasing after her. Elle sat and watched, feeling bad. Max really should have told the poor girl. Noah came up behind her and dropped a kiss on top of her head. He sat down and snitched a piece of her toast. I just got hugged and kissed by your parents. Is everything okay? How'd it go with the scan? L changed the subject to Max instead. I was just having breakfast with your brother. Did he mention anything about having a girlfriend? No, not to me. Noah munched on the toast. L. L sighed. I think I may have caused Max a bit of trouble. He hadn't told this girl about his living situation, and I let the cat out of the bag. L. Noah's voice gained a bit of warning to it as he laid a hand on her protruding stomach. As much as I love my brother, I could care less about his dating life at the moment. The doctor was worried about the size of the baby. Now tell me what's going on. Well, there was a bit of a surprise. L put her hand over his. What sort of surprise? Is he okay? Noah asked worriedly. He's okay. He's perfect, Elle smiled. Then what's the surprise? He questioned on a sigh of relief. He's not alone, she said. Noah frowned. What is that supposed to mean? Elle leaned over to give him a kiss. Two boys. Twins. Noah blinked as the thought sunk in. Two? Two, Elle grinned and took a bite of toast. Two. Noah looked at her in wonder. Two boys. She nodded happily. We are never going to be able to agree on names now, Noah grinned. 
he leaned forward to give her a kiss, which Elle enthusiastically returned. If you enjoyed No One Else's Story and A Ring for Christmas, book one of the Ramsley Brothers series, then continue the magic with Max and Paget's story in The Reverse Cinderella, book two of the Ramsley Brothers series. Here's a sneak peek at The Reverse Cinderella. Here's the honest truth. Max sighed in frustration. I want to watch sunsets and sunrises with you. I want to hold your hand every day when I get a chance to. I want to marry you some day soon, and watch the most amazing, gorgeous, talented woman I know come up the aisle to me. I want to surprise you with gifts and romantic evenings. I want to grow old with you and end up in some little retirement community in Florida, discussing how badly our dentures fit, and if the grass was cut low enough, or whether we should buy some of those plastic lawn flamingo ornament things. That's what's honest, Paget. Paget bit her lip. She wanted all of those things, too. She wiped away a tear and made a decision. Maybe it was all the wine she drank tonight. She might regret it, or it might be the best one of her life. 